start, so yeah, really fun. This was absolutely amazing. I really enjoyed the speed of my car. When you're going around that circle at a thousand k's to spin, and it's just, it's nuts. It's nuts, but it's really fun. Really fun. It's really competitive, it's quick, it's fast paced. Um, everything I love. Yeah. You can find out more over 22racingseries.com. Check out our socials. And you can get directly into the game right now over at pavilionhub.com where we have some special access, PAX Online events running, where you can win prize money. Jim Dark Magic is the wizard of Acquisitions Incorporated. He is first and foremost, I would say, a stage magician. He's a performer. So the spells that he has um, tend not to be very useful. Not great for the rest of the party, um, just because I can't help a lot. I don't do a lot of damage. Um, but I can, I can make people invisible. I can make showers of sparks. There's a lot of exciting crowd thrilling spells that Jim can do. One of the things about Idle Champions is that all the characters have unique equipment. And so it was really important to go through Jim and think about what his the unique things are, right? So he's got his wand holster and his twin wands. Um, he's got his uh, skull brooch, the, the cloak. So all the little pieces of Jim that, um, that you like are in there. And then now they've got stats and little stories and stuff. With Idle Champions, it was interesting because the characters in Idle Champions are designed to um, work together in teams. So, you know, Rosie has a buff for all younger women who are in the party, right? There's these little things that help the rest of the group. And I wanted them to make sure that they understood that Jim did not help anyone else. <laughs> so his abilities had to be things that would make him better, um, maybe even at the cost of the party. I made sure that Jim's ultimate would be completely useless, but incredibly flashy. I think it does a tiny bit of damage. It's mostly just sparks and showers of fire. It's fun to pretend to have that confidence. The new and improved <laughs> Jim Dark Magic played by Mike Krahulik. <laughs> like this, the last show at West where I came out in that costume, like that was, I was so nervous. You know, to come out in a wig and everything and makeup and a, like a leather, leather pants. Um, but Jim has confidence, right? Like he would be able to do that. And so it's fun to, to pretend to be someone who has that, who can do that.
Hello, PAX Online, and welcome to this very special edition of Niantic Office Hours. Um, I am your host. My name is Kit. I look after HR and operations for Niantic in EMEA. And we have an incredible lineup today to talk you through different journeys into the game industry. So I'm going to hand it over to our speakers in just a second to introduce themselves. But to just set the stage, today we're going to be hopefully persuading you of all the different routes you can take to move into games. I think once you're participating as a consumer and you're super excited about it, but you don't necessarily have an obvious way in, games can seem like a bit of a black box. So what I hope you leave today with is a great sense of how our three different panelists have taken really different routes in and learn a bit about all the different options available to you. So today we're going to be chatting to Trinidad, our head of DNI globally, Laura, our senior game designer working on Pokemon Go, and Daphne, our technical lead manager on Pokemon Go. We've brought the big guns. So um, I'm going to start handing it over to all of you to tell the audience a little bit more about yourself. Trinidad, do you want to kick us off? Tell us about your role, where you started as well. Hi, everybody. Um, I am the head of diversity and inclusion at Niantic. And it started way back when in uh, big data tech. And uh, I have a passion for people. I have a passion for empowering people with information to help them change and, and empower them with the tools that they need to move not only our business forward, but also making sure that it's an equitable place equitable place for all people and honestly this has been one of the best careers paths that I could have ever taken and I didn't get to the game industry by the conventional way which was like going to school or or just having parents in the industry or knowing people I knew nobody and Honestly, I didn't even know what Niantic was when I started. I mean, not when I started, but when I interviewed, I was like, Niantic, Niantic, it sounds familiar. And when I Googled it, and I was like, Pokemon Go? Oh, yes, yes, let me go for it, you know? And I didn't know anybody in the company. I did the conventional route of applying online through um, the regular sources that we use to uh, search for, for jobs. So I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. I'm addicted now. I love the game industry. I love the people, how eccentric we are sometimes and how demanding we are, but then also how creative we are and how much we, we are just passionate about uh, creating games that can impact people. So I'm here. Thank you. Laura? Yeah, so I probably have a, a bit of a winding path into the games industry. It, it really started for me when I was a kid playing video games with my brother growing up. Like that, that passion for games was always there and part of my life. But I actually thought I was going to grow up to be a 3D animator. Uh, so I went to school to study art. So I have a traditional art degree as well as a certificate in 3D animation. Um, while I was going through that journey, uh, the university I was at, University of Utah, started a graduate program where they were going to um, focus on video games and they're like hey you're doing this awesome art stuff and we know you love video games will you come be a part of the first uh, cohort for this graduate program and I was like sounds great I don't 100% know what I'm doing with my life because I'm a kid in college <laughs> so I would love to uh, so I ended up going to the grad program and I got really lucky that the program teaches game design uh, to all the students in that particular program. So I went through the program and I still at that point thought I was going to be a 3D animator. My first job in the games industry was actually as an intern uh, in animation for Disney at their video game studios. Uh, but then while I was there, uh, they came over and reached out to me because they knew I was really passionate about video games and that um, I was a woman working in the industry. And they asked if I could take a look at some of the mini games they were trying to make that were going to be a bit more female focused uh, for Disney Infinity. And uh, the first game design meeting I went to, I was like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. I've spent seven plus years studying <laughs> to be an animator and in a single meeting. I realized that I need to make a pretty big career change. Uh, so over the course of that, um, and a couple of really awesome opportunities and support from friends in the industry, I was able to switch to becoming a game designer instead. Uh, and then eventually that led me to my current role where I am a senior game designer here at Niantic working on Pokemon Go. Daphne, you wanna share your awesome story? 
Yeah, um, similar to you, Laura, I also grew up playing games with my brothers and like, I, it's so funny because I never considered myself a gamer. I always considered them gamers, but not me, even though I played alongside them all the time. Um, and so it took me a long time to like embrace that as like a part of my identity. Um, now no one can tell me nothing. I'm definitely a gamer, <laughs> but back then I did not feel this way. Um, but yeah, my, my route into games was actually probably more like the most like traditional CS, right? Um, in the sense that I got a bachelor's degree in computer science and then I got a master's in computer science. Um, and I actually got into games a little later in my career, uh, indirectly through doing like more framework C kind of work. And so, um, you know, multiple positions that I had before Niantic, I was actually like, writing code that supported developers who built games as opposed to being the person who was building the games. Um, and that's what ended up leading me here. And so, you know, prior to this job, I was actually working at Apple. And so I was working on what's called the foundation framework. It's basically for anybody who's uh, worked in Xcode, when you open up a new Xcode project and you see import foundation, that was my team. Um, and so like, millions of developers were using my code every day. Um, and then prior to that, I was working at a startup that was um, building an SDK that at the time was like revolutionary, but you know, now is kind of laughable, but they were essentially just trying to get, um, they got Objective-C to run natively on Android phones. And so like our prime customers at that point were like game developers. And so we were still, we were in the industry, but tangential. And so Niantic was a really interesting move for me because it was um, a very intentional choice to be like, I wanna be, at, I wanna be at the front of it this time. I wanna be at a, at a different part of the stack. I wanna actually be like making stuff that people can actually see and interact with and play with um, and not necessarily be like the Wally behind scenes, which is what I used to call myself. Um, and so it's been really awesome working on Pigo and uh, being able to just like, you know, make so many players happy. Like that's just, it's really awesome. Awesome, thank you. I think one really interesting common thread for, for all of you is that you'd interacted as players, like however you kind of define yourselves in terms of gamers, casual, hardcore, whatever, you all had that relationship with games, but none of you went straight in. And I'm curious as to, before you were a part of this industry, how much of a sense of it did you have? I.e., what were your, what was kind of your knowledge around the roles available to you? What it was like as a, as a culture? Daphne, what was your kind of, um, what did you anticipate before you were actually a part of the industry? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I was nervous. Just, you know, games is an interesting, like, subset of tech because it's, like, partially a subset, but also partially kind of its own thing, right? It's, it's, um, it's weird. They form almost this little Venn diagram, right? And so, um, you know, I mean, I'll be blunt. Like, the, the media around being a woman in games and being a black and queer woman in games is not great. It's just not. And so like, um, you know, it's, it's a little nerve wracking to, to step into this and, and feel like you're putting yourself out on the chopping block every day. Um, but you know, it, it ends up being completely worthwhile. At least it has been for me. And like through this experience, I wouldn't have met any of you and y'all are absolutely lovely. So like there are so many wonderful people in the industry that, I mean, I've dealt, uh, we can, that's a whole other panel. I've, I've dealt with my share of difficult developers in my lifetime, <laughs> trust. But like, it's been really awesome, particularly at Niantic, to be able to work with people who are not only so incredibly smart, but also super sweet. And I just, I, I haven't had to, I almost feel like I've been shielded from just a lot of the uh, craziness that we see out in the media all the time. So yeah, that was kind of my impression going in. Well, I'm glad that Niantic has defied your expectations, of course. Um, Trinidad, what about you? Your role isn't such an obvious, like you're not a game designer or a developer, 
but you're really integral to how Niantic functions um, and how we all kind of work towards this more inclusive and more kind of representative future. Um, tell us a bit about your understanding of the industry before you were a part of it. Um, just to piggy off, piggyback off of what Daphne said, I mean, the game industry definitely has a bad rep. Like, and I don't know if it's a bad rep. I think for a long time, it was, it is what it was. And um, I, I hear stories, horror stories about like booth babes in the back, back in the day and, and just like at conferences and different things like that. And I'm just like, ooh, okay. So coming in, I know uh, Niantic is one of those companies that's a, a hybrid because it, we have a platform and then we also create games. So it was a mixture of tech and gaming and it wasn't your traditional studio. Uh, so coming in, I wanted to defy everything that Daphne said. You know, I don't, I don't want our people to have that negative experience of, of coming to Niantic and saying, oh, it's just like everywhere else. I want people to come to Niantic and, and say, oh, this is a breath of fresh air. Like it's, yes, we still have crunch times. Yes, we still have uh, a high, we are asking for a lot of work. We want you to produce, that's, that's just normal. But at the same time, we have a community, we're a family, we trust each other, we value each other, we respect each other. And that's why we're able to um, build such a great team of people who, who love and, and really go above and beyond for our games. Oh, I feel a little like warm and fuzzy now. Um, Laura, um, how about you? What was your kind of understanding of the different roles, the culture, the industry? Sure. So when I uh, was growing up, which was several moons ago, we won't say how long ago, um, games were an amazing thing. I was a huge gamer. It was definitely like my defining hobby. But at that point in time, there weren't things like dev blogs. There weren't amazing conferences like PAX where you could see developers and game makers talk. So it was sort of this like void, right? I knew video games existed and I loved them and I played them, but I had no real concept of where they came from other than I assumed somebody somewhere <laughs> was probably making them. Uh, you know, and it really honestly wasn't until I got to grad school and we started looking at all the options of the games industry and all the different roles from art to tech to, you know, game design like I do to all the support roles, which it's pretty expansive. Um, it wasn't until we started having those conversations that I was like, oh, wait, this might be a viable career path. This, this might be a real industry to look into. Um, and my parents have thankfully always been super supportive. But I know when I was like, I'm going to work in games, they were like, oh, uh, okay, is that a is that a job? Is that, do they pay you to do that right? So um, thankfully, uh, they are now reassured that it is a viable career path. But you know, it, it just was so unknown at the time, which is part of why I think doing panels like this is really great, because I want everyone to know that there are paths into the games industry, that this is a real job, that they pay us to do this awesome work, and that like, um, you know, as Trindan and Daphne touched on, like for a long time, the industry has been pretty small and pretty close to who was going to be a part of it. And I think it's been really great to work with women and people of different backgrounds and diversity in the industry because I think the more voices in the industry the better the industry is becoming uh, so I think doing panels like this and seeing other panels and talking to other people in the industry is so important to just see how the industry is growing and then what steps we need to take to keep it growing from here. I have something to add to what Laura said you mentioned something about the different roles and types and I want to remind everybody who's watching that you can be in HR, you can be in marketing, you can be in legal, you can, you can be in facilities, you could be in finance, you can be in ops. Like I just, just some of the different pathways. It's like, it's like any other company you need to function and you need to be able to have all the different functions to move forward. And, and so don't limit yourself. If you are passionate about game design, yes. If you're passionate about software engineering, yes. But also know that if you not, if you don't know what your niche is yet, that this is your opportunity. I would also add to, um, cause uh, Trinidad, you touched on, on like crunch time. And I think it's particularly important to highlight that like, um, one thing I find really interesting about Niantic and, and Pokemon Go in particular, having worked and led the team, like, uh, 
at a management level, we have several managers, so many who have are like vets in the industry of, you know, with ranging years of experience who have dealt with such like horrific crunch <laughs> experiences at past game companies that like, in some ways, they, it's like they brought their their trauma with them and but like in the sense that they never want to relive that again and they never want to put their employees or the org through that again and so like it's it's interesting i i wanted to highlight that particular point because i feel like um crunch is considered a norm in the industry in a lot of ways and it's been really interesting to see how like so many Niantics have like fought back against this. <laughs> like they're just so adamant about it not being a thing here. Um, and anytime there's even a hint towards it, people start to get a little antsy and they're like, uh, 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 no, we don't like this. We don't like this at all, you know, um, which is highly unusual when you consider just like the reputation of a lot of other companies. 100%. Um, and I think it's also a testament definitely to you two who are actually involved in Pokemon Go as well of the culture that you've both created so a little bit of props there um so the the other thing that I'm mindful of for people who are watching this particularly if they're, they're not in the industry already sometimes it is hard to know what leap you want to make and of course how to make that leap but I think that process of identifying like what is the thing that truly energizes you what do you really want to get up in the morning and do um is hard and each of you have done it so um i would love to hear um maybe starting with you laura because you had your light bulb moment in that meeting which i'm so jealous of i wish that my career came to me that easily um i would love to know a little bit about how you thought about what is the thing i really want to do and how you then pivoted that into working into games sure so yeah like like i said earlier i did i was in that meeting and um, I don't, the meeting could have been going for five minutes before I was like, oh, this is, this is the thing I'm supposed to be doing. Um, and, you know, I, I did have to take some time to reflect because I had spent so long training to become a professional 3D animator that this, the sudden decision to depart from that career path that I've worked so hard on uh, was a pretty big one. But I, I can be fairly stubborn. So once I, I realized game design was where my true passion was going to be, I made the commitment that I was going to start working towards that goal. Thankfully, at the internship I was at, they, they were supportive of that and they helped me start working on game design while I was there. Uh, and then I started keeping an eye on all possible roles that might be coming up at the industry that was in the area I was in at the time, which was Salt Lake. Um, and I got very fortunate that uh, EA opened up a three month contract role. Uh, and honestly, like one of the biggest things I can say for anyone who's looking to get into the industry and thinks this might be their path is start reaching out to folks in the industry, like whether it's connecting with folks on social media or on professional social media sites. Like, uh, so what happened is this role opened up at EA and a friend had applied for it and they actually moved him to a different role at the company and reopened the three month contract. Uh, and then when it reopened, I applied and they looked at my resume and they're like, well, <laughs> she's an animator. Why, why would we talk to her? And it was because my buddy Josh was actually like, trust me, she has an incredible potential to be an amazing game designer. Just bring her in, bring her in, have her do the game design test. And you'll see, like, I know her resume doesn't match up, but just, just take the half an hour to talk to her. I promise she will show you what she has. And had Josh not been willing to, you know, speak up for me and vouch for me when my resume didn't necessarily 100% align for what they were looking at, I never would have gotten the opportunity to get into the game design field. You know, so having that connection, having that friend in the industry really made all the difference in that moment. So networking is invaluable when it comes to the game industry. It's, it, a lot of it is about who you know. And if you're new and trying to get into the industry and you're nervous about reaching out, this has got to be the most <laughs> relaxed, chill group of people in any industry I've ever met. Folks are almost always happy to chat with people who are trying to get into the industry, students, people who are interested in making a big career shift, because we've all been there, right? We've all needed help from somebody else in the industry. We all needed one, just one person to accept <laughs> when you reach out. So don't, don't be scared to reach out to folks in the industry and start getting to know them. I am definitely going to pick up that thread a little later with everyone else about um, networking, the role that's played. I think sometimes it's viewed as this thing of like, oh, you just know this person and then they get you this job. And actually, it's the culmination of doing loads of hard work. So the thing that matters to you 
and the thing that feels um, good in terms of just your integrity is also the thing that turns into you getting a job through having good relationships. It's not just like my mate who works for EA. Yeah, okay, uh, I think that's a good point with what I was saying where uh, my friend got me the interview. Had I shown up and not been prepared? Uh, they would have been like, nope, we were right. This isn't a good fit for you. But I studied so much between the time he told me of the opportunity and going in. Like I read every possible game design book I could get my hands on and, and just did a ton of research. So making sure you're prepared for when those op those opportunities arise is super key. Right. You worked for it and you earned it and you happen to have that connection through doing that work and everything else. Okay, cool. Um, Trinidad, let's talk about you because you obviously prior to working in DNI, you were a program manager. And um, I think it's super interesting that you did, you pivoted into your passion and um, you did that in game. So tell us a bit about how you went through that process of reflection and how you kind of consciously moved yourself into the role you wanted. So uh, I worked in DNI prior to being a product manager. So um, when we got acquired, like I worked for EMC and then when we got acquired by Dell, I kind of saw the writing on the wall and I was like, ooh, I should probably get a job somewhere where they can't fire me. And, <laughs> and so I, too, Laura, networked and had friends in high and low places and uh, they, some of them were managers and they're like, hey, we have this product manager role. We know that this is not your, I was a program manager at the time in DNI, and they're like, we think that you can do it. Are you willing to take the challenge? And so that meant me moving cross country. So I moved from Boston to Santa Clara, California, and I worked on our data protection. Um, I worked on hardware and software and it was our bread and butter. And I loved it in the beginning until I realized I was like, I'm not really passionate about data protection. I, I mean, I know we need it, but I mean, I'm not changing the world. And at that time I was like the lead of every ERG you can imagine in Santa Clara. I mean, I had, I had a team and we were like, we had like a, a you know, and the, like a leadership team, but like I was like, <laughs> Black, black ERG, Asian ERG, LGBT, like every ERG I had a lead on because they all knew that I was coming from the DNI space and they're like, oh my God, oh my God, so great you're here. Yes, help us. And so it was fun. Um, but I just found that I was still doing, that was my passion. Like I would do my work and then I would focus on developing the people around me. And uh, so I had a moment where I was like, when was the last time I was genuinely happy with my work? Because at that time, work for me was, it was almost like I'd get it done quickly just so that I could um, focus on what I love. And so I think at this time, I took time to really reflect and I was like, when was the last time? And I was talking to my mom and she was like, when you were doing DNI, you don't remember? You were just like, you were up all hours of the night and you didn't care. And, and I was like, wow, like, you're right. So from that moment on, I, I only applied to DNI roles. Like I made a very specific decision to not apply. And I was getting hit up for product everywhere, like Google, thank you, you know, Facebook, because they need product managers. And also they need women of color in product management, you know? And so uh, it was like a shoe in, but at the same time, I felt like that was a distraction because yes, I love Google. Yes, I love these big companies, but I pa I'm passionate about diversity and inclusion. And if you're not going to accept me in that role, then I can't help you. And so long story short, I literally just applied to DNI roles and that's how I arrived at Niantic. Okay, awesome. We are going to um, talk a little bit more um, in a couple of minutes about exactly how Trinidad got her job at Niantic, uh, which is a great story, one of my favorites. Uh, but we, before we do that, Daphne, tell us how did you go, you went from working in Apple to working in Niantic, how did you kind of consciously reflect on what you wanted out of that transition and make it a reality for yourself? Yeah, that's a great question. I um, I had up until just before working at Niantic, I had spent my whole career, you know, working in what, working lower in the stack, and so I was always 
you know, building the stuff that devs needed to do the work that they did that users actually interacted with, um, which was great because it just like was a very interesting vantage point. I got to see up into what like developers needed higher up in the stack, but I also was low enough to see into like the stacks, the part of the stacks below me. So like, you know, into the actual OS or like I worked with drivers at some point, like I was, I was doing, um, you know, I, I, the work that I did kind of ran the gamut. And so like, as much as I loved my work at Apple and, and really did feel like the contributions I was making were real contributions, I, had a hard time, I found a frustration with having a hard time explaining to people like what exactly I did. And like, you know, I would be like, oh, I worked on foundation. And people are like, oh, okay, that's cool. And I'm like, no, no, you don't, you don't understand. <laughs> like, I'm like, the reason why you have a rainbow flag emoji is because I wrote that code. <laughs> like, the reason why you have like a female professional like surfer who can be black is because I wrote the logic for that. Like, that's, that, that's what I need. And they're like, oh, wow. And I'm like, yeah. So when I say I worked on foundation, it's not, you know, <laughs> but it's like, I I loved being able to to um you know work at that level and be able to to support devs at that level but I wanted to switch into a role that was a lot more user facing where my work was a lot more obvious and it's like I could point to this thing and be like yeah here this it is in the game you can see it very clearly <laughs> and so um i was really excited about that transition but i would add really quickly to like um since we were talking about like career switches and kind of that like moment when you realize um i so i had mentioned earlier that i took a more like traditional cs route into games but what i did not mention is i took a very like weird route into cs which was like I actually went to school, went to my undergrad in New York thinking that I was going to study fashion journalism. And so like, that was, that was where I was. <laughs> I was 18. I moved to New York City. I went to Barnard and I was like, I'm going to work for Vogue and this is going to be my life. And like, it did not work out that way. But um, it was just kind of funny because it feels like CS found me in a lot of ways. And so, um, you know, like, Tr Trinidad was talking about just kind of like you should you have that anecdote of you know being willing to put so many hours into DNI and like I I kind of knew how much I loved programming when I took like a solo trip to Germany once but had CS homework and ended up spending I was only there for 24 hours and I literally spent the whole day at a Starbucks working on building like a network like a, a local client and server and i just like had so much fun just like with my headphones on i was like i'm in munich like what am i doing but it was just like the best time ever so i it when we talk about like making these career switches um i think oftentimes people get tripped up on this idea of like find your passion because like it just feels like this very overwhelming thing to do but i what i've you know turn that into for myself is just like find your joy like find where you have fun find those moments that interest you the most where you're just like dang i could do this all day or like even if it's not all day it's like i could i would prefer to do this over doing this other thing and like pay attention to when you have those clues you know sorry struggling to unmute myself there you know what's crazy i also started in fashion journalism so the main takeaway is that if you want to work for Niantic, be a fashion journalist for a short amount of time and then just scoot right over and we will welcome you. Um, <laughs> but uh, let's talk about actual strategy. So um, I think this is the part that, and actually I was having a conversation with a friend the other day who's looking to kind of pivot a little bit in terms of her industry. And the big thing is like, how do I express all of this experience that I have, which I can see how there is a relationship there with the role I want. And I have obviously these interests in the role I want, but I look at the job description and I'm not like an obvious fit for it, but I think I'd be great. Um, how 
would you approach that, Daphne, or how did you approach that? Um, obviously, like there are kind of obvious parallels for you and your role, but I think it'd be great for the audience to hear some tips on that um, kind of application process and the tailoring of all of that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'll be really blunt. Like when I came to Niantic and expressed interest in a game dev role, I had never worked on Unity, like not at least definitely not in a production sense. Um, the little bit that I'd, I had done on Unity prior was just like game jams on my own time. It wasn't, and it wasn't even super extensive. Um, and so like, you know, the, the team had to know what they were getting <laughs> and bringing me on board because um, we're definitely a Unity shop. Um, and it was really nerve wracking at first. It It was hard to, you know, it was hard for me to justify even to myself that I deserved it because of that. And I feel like that's really where it starts. Um, I was really lucky because like, and I know you mentioned, we'll talk about networking later, but like I had known somebody who was at Niantic already and like they were able to put in a good word for me. But like on top of that, I think there also comes a point in your career where your resume just kind of starts to speak for itself in the sense that like, you know, and, and I think Niantic is really good about this, but other companies do this as well, where it's just like, you know, maybe you don't have the exact qualities that they're looking for in the list, but they trust that you're capable of doing the work because you have a history of doing great work elsewhere. And so like, Niantic was able to, to, to look at my history of doing great work elsewhere and be like, okay, you don't know this one tool, but you're a programmer, you can pick it up. That's what programmers do, they learn new tools. So like, we have full faith in your ability to learn new tools. And I was really appreciative of that. I remember like, um, you know, when I first, first started at Niantic, like we had a internal hackathon and I wanted to do it because it was a good opportunity for me to like do a bit of a crash course in Unity. And I remember like, I, you know, it was using this like parts of our platform that were, you know, really awesome, but also very new. Um, and I was experimenting, but a lot of it was also me just like learning how to like set up a Unity project and start from the basics. And so after the hackathon, you know, they wanted us to like present these projects to the whole company. And <laughs> like my, it just was very easy and for me to see very early on that like the quality of what I produced was like so much lower than like what everybody else had cranked out. And I was also a one man team versus like these other teams that were like three or four people or they were working on something pre-existing. And I, I remember right before that, you know, it was a all hands meeting. I was on the phone with my parents 20 minutes beforehand in the lobby of the ferry building sobbing because I was like, my coworkers are going to think I'm stupid. They're going to think I don't deserve this job. Like, I, I, they're gonna wanna fire me. Like I, my project looks so dumb. <laughs> and my parents were like, no, like you just have to like, just, just present it and you're gonna be fine. And I was like, everyone is gonna think I'm so stupid. <laughs> and so I, I remember like, you know, I put a smile on my face and I presented the hell out of that thing. And I was just like, okay, I'm just gonna stand by it. And I actually got so much wonderful, like, it was just a great reception. And actually Laura reached out to me and was like, hey, your idea sounds really cool. If you ever want to flesh it out more, like come talk to me. I can like give you some game design tips. And I was like, this is amazing. So anyway, long story short, like you don't necessarily have to have the exact skills to be good at the job. <laughs> I actually really quick want to, um, you know, having been on the other side of Daphne's story, everyone was blown away by what she was presenting. Everyone was so impressed and thought it was so awesome. I think that's actually a really good lesson for this industry is um, imposter syndrome is real. It's, it's a real thing. A lot of folks, uh, regardless of the role or the level at which they're in their role, especially when you're starting a new job, feeling like, did I trick them into hiring me? Why am I here? I don't know what I'm doing. Like everyone was blown away by what Daphne had done. So knowing that that was so scary and you were so worried about it, it's so crazy because on the other side, we were like, 
Daphne knows what she's doing. She's amazing, right? So like, just know that those those moments of insecurity and fear, they're real, but like, just push through them. And yeah, no one, no one else would have ever guessed, Daphne, that you were nervous. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it's a really good lesson that like, just keep pushing forward. And like, one way or another, as long as you're doing your best, it'll probably work out. Aww. Um, it makes my heart break a tiny bit, but I also love that lesson. And I try and look out for people that I have worked with who have just backed themselves and they've kind of got what they asked for. And it was almost as simple as that. And I'm like, if I do that, but I also work really hard and just deliver great work, like it, it does kind of come together. Um, Trinidad, I think the time, just a little bit conscious of time, and I want to talk about networking, but I also really want to talk about your story of kind of how you got into Niantic. I also think it's really important to note that you did apply, right? And so talk us through, like, what was your strategy um, and how did you demonstrate fit with the role? I can make it short and sweet. Like, I applied on a website and I got a call back and my first conversation was with one of our recruiters her name is An um angie and is her name angie do you mean angela sorry yeah I'm <laughs> I'm angela. Angela. she is one of my favorite humans Talk why did i say angie though anyways it's it's <laughs> i'm not a morning person anyways long story short i was just talking to her late last night actually uh, angela is amazing and in our first conversation she was like wow I can hear your passion, like you, you light up, like, because she asked me, you know, how have my interviews been? And I was like, yeah, I just had a product manager interview. And I think my tone was like, you know, pretty low. She's like, when you start talking about d &I, you just lit up like, like a light bulb. And um, so just talking to her, going through the process, I met some of the wonderful people that work at Niantic on my panel. And, um, I was surprised when I got to the end where I had to meet with the CEO and that was where I needed all this preparation. You know, I needed to have a PowerPoint and show my six month plan. And I, I mean, I literally prayed over it. I went to every single person that I love and know that I respect and said, Hey, can you take a look at this? Can I present it to you? Can I show you? I practiced and, um, and even my mentors, I sent them a rough draft. I was like, hey, can y'all see this? And, and my, my, uh, my ex, one of my ex bosses was like, this is way too long. She's like, you need to cut this down to five slides. <laughs> I was like, what? And that was, I mean, honestly, that was good advice, like understanding our, like how we are at Niantic. So, you know, cut it down. And uh, so my diagram, which was, you know, lovely, which was like, you know, diversity, inclusion, equity, and then, you know, Niantic circle, and there's a heart in the middle, which is, you know, pointing to it, you know, like all of our different, I took the mission and I, you know, put it in like a, a diagram and then I put a heart and that was diversity, equity, inclusion. I said, this should be the heart of Niantic. And in my one-on-one um, -on -one with John, I said, and honestly, if you're not ready to do the work, don't hire me. Uh, if you are not interested in actually seeing systemic blockers broken and changed, then you, I'm not the per person for you. And that was one of the best things I ever said and did because, you know, we talk about imposter syndrome and yeah, that tries to sneak in, but I was authentically myself from day one and I have been able to continue to be that because of being authentically myself during all of the interviews and, 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 you know, not, not code switching, which is so easy to do when you're used to doing it, especially in corporate America. Um, so yeah. And, and I will say this, like to, to forward and to go move forward into networking, like doing my research of going on Twitter and, and befriending people, going on LinkedIn, befriending people, going on Facebook, like, and asking questions from people who are, were in my network on what I should do, because I've never been in this industry before. That's what held me up. Like they lifted me as I was trying to climb. And I can't tell you how invaluable invaluable or how valuable no valuable sorry how valuable it is to network even now like now in my position as D dni uh, i have external partnerships and i've 
been able to have, like, I have a village in the game industry. There's so many people that I, like, I went to GDC. I met so many people that I'm like, oh my gosh, yeah, we're going to be friends forever, you know, and then going to, to PAX, going to these consumers, E3, and, and just the energy, the people are excited. And when you find people who are become, they become your village, you don't want to get rid of them. And like I said, I'm addicted. I'm not going anywhere. Like, you know, if Niantic fires me, I'm going to find another game industry job. <laughs> like I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> Niantic has no plans to fire Trinidad. <laughs> Clear that one up to my knowledge. Um, so Laura, let's talk about networking with you then, because you mentioned it right at the beginning. And imagine like if someone is wanting to get into game design now, where should they go? Who should they be talking to? Like what events should be, they be showing up at? Yeah, I would definitely encourage anyone who, who is interested in game design to look at a couple of options. There's the more traditional route, which I went, which was going to an academic program, uh, but that's not the best fit for everyone. I think another really valid route is to be learning and studying and building game design or building games uh, on your own as well. That's also super valid. I think the, the key piece between those two is starting to reach out to folks, whether I think Trinidad mentioned a few things, whether it's on Twitter or LinkedIn or going to local game jams or going to local um, meetups for the games industry. There's a lot of different groups in the games industry to get together often once a month. And we're all doing it digitally right now, obviously, but eventually we'll return to doing it in person. Uh, going to conferences and uh, attending conferences related to the games industry is another great way. Just any place you think there might be folks who make games, it, start looking for those opportunities and start attending. And like I was mentioning earlier, if you're intimidated to approach somebody at one of those events, don't be. We're all, at the end of the day, mostly just a big group of nerds who love video games, right? We're just really passionate about what we do, but it's a lot of people who are just very thoughtful and kind and are excited to talk to people who are excited. And I can say for those of you who might be in the industry already, like whether you're mid to senior level, the best thing you can do is mentor somebody. So if somebody reach out and they're looking for advice, there's nothing more reinvigorating for your career than talking to somebody who's brand new or is trying to break into the industry. You know, if you're having a rough time, if you've been working really long on a project, mentoring somebody who's brand new and has fresh eyes and is just so excited to take on the industry, it just makes everything so much better. So honestly, like the senior folks in the industry who are mentoring or who helping people who reach out are getting just as much back in trade. So please, that's my biggest thing is just, just reach out reach out and try to connect with a few folks and the industry's busy. So don't be upset if it takes folks a while to get back to you, but it's okay to reach out again after a couple of weeks and be like, Hey, I'm just checking in again, seeing if you had a chance to get back. Thanks. You know, like follow up is really important in this industry too. Awesome. Okay. And our final few minutes, Daphne, from an engineering point of view, where should people be going, whether it's for networking or finding job opportunities in the industry? Um, honestly, I don't have that much more to add on top of what Laura said. Like, I, I think everything that you would do if you were interested in, in trying to learn more about game design, as Laura put it, like, you would do the same for engineering. You would, like, build your own games. If that's the route that you want to take, you would read whatever books you can, if that is what works better for you. Um, as Laura put it, lots of meetups, lots of game jams. Like there's, there are plenty of, of opportunities to go out and, and meet people and just reach out to them. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, Laura put it so well, so I feel like I can't, <laughs> I can't, I can't add. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, Trinidad, keep me honest on this, but I think we're pretty much at time. We are, okay. Well, thank you everyone so much for joining and thank you to our wonderful panelists, it's been, I say it's been lovely to catch up with you. I catch up with you anyway, but it's been especially lovely to catch up with you and hear from you right now. Um, if you are interested in getting into games, um, do check out our careers site. I believe it is careers.nianticlabs.com um, where you can see all of our openings across all of our locations globally. Um, and you are perfectly welcome to reach out to any of us as well if you want any kind of tips or advice. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn because I am and really boring and not very much on Twitter. Uh, my name is Kit Gilbert. Uh, let's go through the group as well and, and tell people where they can find you. Trinidad, where should people follow you or reach out to you? Um, I am on 
LinkedIn as well, first name, last name, Trinidad Hermina. But I'm also on Twitter uh, at This Is Trini and on Discord at This Is Trini, Twitch. You could find me at This Is Trini pretty much anywhere. Uh, and This Is Trini is just This Is T R I N I. Awesome. Laura, how about you? I am also on LinkedIn. Uh, full name is Laura Warner. So if you just search for that, it should bring up my profile. Uh, and then you can also find me on Twitter. I am at uh, Laura WQF. So that's L A U R A W Q F. Cool. And Daphne. Um, also on LinkedIn, Daphne LaRose. Um, and I um, actually don't use Twitter to. I just find Twitter so incredibly overwhelming, but um, I'm definitely on Instagram. So you can find me at life is sweet. Good. I use that handle for everything. That's very inspiring. I wish I had slightly more imaginative handles now. Um, well, thank you so much, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed um, this panel and that is it from us. Thank you. Bye. We announced Broken Roads at PAX Australia in 2019 and we're excited now that almost a year later, we're able to bring you an update on what we've been doing here at PAX Online. Broken Roads is a narrative-driven RPG bringing exploration, strategic turn-based combat 
and meaningful philosophical choices to an all-new Australian post-apocalyptic setting. We've spent a lot of time recreating areas of Western Australia as accurately as possible. Buildings, towns, landmarks, and many of the game's various locations are all authentic. And we're really happy to bring post-apoc back to Australia, all in the beautiful hand-painted style that the art team have produced. One area of the game we focused on extensively is the moral compass, our unique take on alignment and morality. We wanted to make a move away from the light side, dark side binary, that good and evil split you see so often in video games, and come up with a system that far better captures the nuance and complexity of the moral quandaries one could face in a desolated world. We wanted something that incentivized and rewarded consistent character role playing without restricting players, and the moral compass is the result. Together with four origin stories, a classless character building system and a wide range of skills and talents on offer, Broken Roads presents a unique blend of traditional, old-school role-playing with some truly original mechanics. The game is in development for PC, PS4, Switch and Xbox and is due for launch in late 2021. Community and media reaction so far has been overwhelmingly positive and we can't wait for you to experience the content-rich, densely crafted world we're creating. From all of us at Drop Bear Bites, thanks for taking the time to check out Broken Roads. Liam Baker here at PAX West 2018, thanks to Child's Play. I've always liked video games, and Liam would first just watch myself play video games. He'd always be by my side. As he got older, Liam started overtaking my skills. At first, Liam would like, let me try, Dad, let me try, and then I just let Liam do it because Liam, that became his passion. At six months old, I was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis, and since then, I've been going to the hospital five times a year for 14 day stays uh, every year. In the beginning of the hospital stays, there was like nothing to do, and it was really like boring and stuff. And then, as I got older, uh, child's play came into the picture. I definitely don't know where I'd be now without having video games to play. For somebody who is stuck in this like environment of just all these people just walking by outside, being able to like participate in everyday normal life, it helps provide me a sense like I'm still connected to the outside world. As he's gotten older, it just seems like he's been spending more time in the hospital and um, it also affects his overall mental health as well. Um, Having the games available to Liam while he's in the hospital, it's so beneficial to Liam's overall health. It helps him get through the days. 
Child's Play started in 2003. There was a newspaper article that really kind of got Mike and Jerry of Penny Arcade fired up uh, that said video games are murder simulators that are just teaching kids and, and people how to be horrible. And so they decided that they would show the world that gamers can be good people. They knew that they were good people. They knew hundreds of gamers, thousands of gamers that were also good people. And so they issued a challenge end of November, it was like November 24th, that said, we've got this wish list of toys put together for Seattle Children's. Buy a toy, send it to us, we'll deliver it. In two weeks, they raised about a quarter million dollars worth of toys. And um, from that point went, oh, this was kind of a stunt we were doing, and this was a huge impact. We need to continue this. Then quickly in the next year, um, you know, registered the charity, made it an official charity, reached out to a whole bunch of other hospitals, got more other hospitals on board, and Child's Play was a, was a thing. Hi everyone, this is Parkasaurus, and it is one of the Indie Showcase winners for PAX, which we are very happy to be part of. Uh, Wash Bear is made by a two-person team called Wash Bear Studio, and one of those people is me. I'm Chris. Hi. The game itself is a uh, dinosaur tycoon simulation, where you obviously take care of your dinos and expand your park. So let me give you a quick look into the game. Uh, we could do a customized game, but let's go to the world map instead. And I'm going to do one of the missions, which is Toronto, and let's start that up. I have a quick look. And the first quest pops up, I know appeal. And this is our park. This is the one we're starting with. So this is where we're going to have to do the quest. So the first thing... Uh, we need to get 500 dino appeal, have four dinosaurs, and unlock two science. Okay, so various ways we can do all this. The first thing I'm going to do is see what the quest gave me. So I have a hat, and hats can go in your dinos, or your employees, uh, and I have an ankylosaurus. So I'm going to hire some people to help me first. I'm going to go to the office, and go to resumes, I'm going to get a vet. I'm going to hire a janitor, looks pretty good, and a scientist, because I will want some science, and a security. And I'm going to, you know what, I'm going to move this over here, because I want to build my exhibit where this all is. Let's build an exhibit. Um, I'm going to use some concrete walls first. So these are cheaper, they're pretty strong. Uh, the only catch is guests can't see through them to see the dinos, which is okay. I guess we'll add some other fences. And I'm going to make it just this big for now. And why don't I add some wood fence. And these will allow the guests to see in. So I'll just add some path here. Uh, and you know what, let's drop our egg while we're at it. 
if I fill this up with grass, most of this is already grass, so let me fill the rest with grass. Uh, there. So, this exhibit now I can click anywhere on the wall or on the ground and it'll pull up the exhibit pane. And there's a lot of interesting information here. And we're trying to get the taiga biome. So, you can see we have to add some ruggedness and some wetness. So, let's go ahead and add water. And you can see it's transforming. And there we go. We just got over to the rainforest. But we need to get up to Taiga, so we want to want to add some some ruggedness. I'm going to do that with the train tool. Add a mountain here. There we go. Now, let's hatch our dino. No, let's make a perfect exhibit. So now you can see here we need some bushes, uh, some trees, and some rocks. So I'm going to go ahead and add those. Okay, you can see the meters filling up. I want some bushes that are meant for grass tiles. And you can see biodiversity is filling up. And I want to finish it off with some rocks. So granite. Perfect. Biome looks pretty good. Let's hatch our dino. There we go. This is Olive, our first dino. And people are going to start watching all of. Pretty cool. And got to get some donation boxes for them to give money. Uh, there's a lot more to do. We have to get food and door on the exhibit so the vets can inspect the dino. And yeah, there's lots, lots, lots to do. So, but I just want to give you a sneak peek into how this game works. And there you go. Uh, yeah, so I hope you enjoyed this, and if you have a chance, check out Parksaurus. You can get it on Steam currently. Um, yeah. Alright, thanks.
challenge you to a swap at showdown. We announced Broken Roads at PAX Australia in 2019 and we're excited now that almost a year later, we're able to bring you an update on what we've been doing here at PAX Online. Broken Roads is a narrative-driven RPG bringing exploration, strategic turn-based combat and meaningful philosophical choices to an all-new Australian post-apocalyptic setting. We've spent a lot of time recreating areas of Western Australia as accurately as possible Buildings, towns, landmarks, and many of the game's various locations are all authentic. And we're really happy to bring post apoc back to Australia, all in the beautiful hand-painted style that the art team have produced. One area of the game we focused on extensively is the moral compass, our unique take on alignment and morality. We wanted to make a move away from the light side, dark side binary, that good and evil split you see so often in video games, and come up with a system that far better captures the nuance and complexity of the moral quandaries one could face in a desolated world. 
We wanted something that incentivized and rewarded consistent character role-playing without restricting players, and the moral compass is the result. Together with four origin stories, a classless character building system, and a wide range of skills and talents on offer, Broken Roads presents a unique blend of traditional, old-school role-playing with some truly original mechanics. The game is in development for PC, PS4, Switch and Xbox and is due for launch in late 2021. Community and media reaction so far has been overwhelmingly positive and we can't wait for you to experience the content-rich, densely crafted world we're creating. From all of us at Drop Bear Bites, thanks for taking the time to check out Broken Roads. Baker here at PAX West 2018 thanks to Child's Play. I've always liked video games and Liam would first just watch myself play video games. He would always be by my side. As he got older, Liam started overtaking my skills. At first Liam would like, let me try dad, let me try. And then I just let Liam do it because Liam, that became his passion. At six months old, I was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis, and since then, I've been going to the hospital five times a year for 14 day stays uh, every year. In the beginning of the hospital stays, there was like nothing to do, and it was really like boring and stuff. And then, as I got older, uh, child's play came into the picture. I definitely don't know where I'd be now without having video games to play. For somebody who is stuck in this like environment of just all these people just walking by outside being able to like participate in everyday normal life, it helps provide me a sense like I'm still connected to the outside world. As he's gotten older, it just seems like he's been spending more time in the hospital and um, it also affects his overall mental health as well. Um, Having the games available to Liam while he's in the hospital, it's so beneficial to Liam's overall health. It helps him get through the days. Child's Play started in 2003. There was a Hello, everybody, and welcome to the ABCs of community building. So in this panel, we are breaking down the basics of building a community with intention, uh, because whether you know it or not, if you are creating content or entertainment, you are probably forming a community already. Uh, the combined five of us that you see on the screen have a broad range of experience for different types of communities. I'm Lisa Penrose. I am your moderator, and I am currently the brand manager for a publishing platform called Dungeon Masters Guild, uh, and I've been building communities for everything from, gosh, feminist magazines to salad restaurant companies uh, for the last 10 years. Uh, let's go ahead and meet our panelists. Hey, I'm Tanya DePress. Um, you've seen me on Rebels Waterdeep, and uh, I manage and create a community, I Need Diverse Games, 
and you know our community is inclusive and welcoming and we try to do that and do our best and you can find me everywhere on the internet as a cypher tier hello i'm latia de Keys, also on rivals of waterdeep but um for the last seven months i have been the one of the one of the community managers of the D, &D adventurers league which is the organized play program that kind of walks alongside the hardcover books um and um fostering my own community on twitter at latia jackies awesome hi i'm rachel um rachel billings i also go by ray on most places on the internet ray um for the last two years i've been the community manager for the small independent board game publishing company Resonum. Um, yeah, you might know us from like Monarch or Mechanica or more recently we published or we kickstarted a game called Surrealist Dinner Party. So you might have seen that floating around Kickstarter. Hi, I'm Brennan Noonan. I was previously the brand manager for Starling Games, which is a tabletop gaming company. Um, I now have my own studio, which is called Quillsilver Studio that provides a range of services um, for tabletop game companies and designers, including brand management. Um, a lot of my communities are on Kickstarter. I've run over 40 Kickstarter campaigns, so I've managed a lot of backers on there. Double digits. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, we have quite a breadth of combined experience here, so I'm really excited. Is everyone ready to discuss some ABCs? Sure. Yes. All right. Yeah. So if you think I wasn't going to make this a cutesy acronym, you are mistaken. Uh, we have some literal ABCs that we are going through. Uh, the A stands for authenticity. So when you imagine the stereotypical community manager, a lot of people think you've got to be like super effervescent, super bubbly, very extroverted. Uh, but being a good community builder is really about being true to yourself, identifying your values, and kind of figuring out and recognizing what those bring to how you specifically build community. Community. So panelists, tell me, why is authenticity important? Um, and what are some scenarios where one's instinct might not be to be authentic when you really should lean into it? Um, does anyone want to start us off? Otherwise, I'm just going to call on somebody. <laughs> no, no, teacher, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Latia. Um, authenticity, it's very important for people to see who you really are so that they know that it's okay for them to also be themselves. Um, I am a very introverted person um, normally and a lot of introverted people think that maybe they can't be a part of the community or to be a part of the community, they have to be that, like you said, effervescent or bubbly extroverted personality, but there's just as much a place for the quiet ones in every community as there is for the, for the loud ones. So it's really important for people to kind of see everybody as they are um, to kind of give that good example of just how diverse and widespread communities can be. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Rachel. Yeah. I'll kind of second that. Um, I find that um, being a community manager is like the most rewarding when you build a community that you would want to be a part of. And I find that that's easiest when you lead by example, like a community where if you were on the other side, you would feel comfortable there. And I completely echo Latia in that I am very introverted. I don't feel like I fit that stereotypical, like bubbly community manager. At least I like, sometimes I try on stream, but like in real life and that maybe comes into like being true to yourself and understanding your like limits and like what type of community manager you are um, when you might see examples that might be hard for you to follow. Um, so yeah, leading by example, I think will lead to the type of community that you want or the type of community you'd want to be in yourself. Yeah. Um, does anyone have any examples that you can think to of a time like maybe a brand didn't really ring authentic and you saw it affect their community? Oh, so many. Um, <laughs> Tanya, well, you want to start us off? <laughs> sure. Uh, well, when I think of brand, I, I usually think of like bigger brands, not so much people. Mm -hmm. um, a recent example, and this isn't related to like individuals, but Ikea misused African-American vernacular English, A-A-V-E. And I got that in my email and I was just like, this doesn't fit you because- For Ikea? Ikea. They were like, we should <laughs> oh, have boy. a kiki. And I was like, a what? Oh, uh, oh, and, and like, I even tried to define it in the email and I'm like, you, you're a Swedish company that makes furniture. This does not fit you at all. Why are you doing this? And, you know, also just when, when people are, they present one way, like if they're very on 
a lot of the times. And then when you get to know them as a person, you see that it's not them. So like, I mean, I know most of you and I'm pretty sure the person you talk to on Twitch, on a panel, in person, I'm the same grumpy person. I didn't know if we could cuss. Um, <laughs> you know, that you're getting, you know, whether I, like, I'm not effervescent. Bubbly is never going to be an adjective someone uses to describe me. And, you know, there's a lot of times where I've met people, they either work for brands. And yes, I know there's a difference between doing your job and the person that you are, but it's like ramped up so much that when you meet them, you're like, oh, this is so not who you actually are. And now it's a little weird because I feel like I'm getting a pu for public consumption version. And it makes you wonder if that's what you do, especially if your brand is you. Because mm -hmm. most of us are independent creators. So we are our brands as much as I hate saying that word about myself. Yeah. Yeah. Brenna, uh, yeah. It's, it's, it's totally true. And I just, like for me, I honestly think it would be so exhausting to feel like I have to be on all the time to like fit that kind of bubbly stereotypical mold um, I can definitely push it like a little bit like if I'm in an interview or something um, you know I may ratchet it up a little or something um, but like I've never really that's like such a common trope you know of like the newscaster or something and as soon as the cameras start rolling they have like a whole different demeanor um like mm -hmm. I've never really been attracted to that kind of like disconnect um between yourself and like the community that you're speaking to um so it's kind of like partly being true to myself but also I don't know is, is that laziness like not wanting to put that much effort into like having a persona <laughs> um so this is a question for all of you, a little exercise that we can do. Um, I'm wondering, what would you say are your top three personal values? And then how do you think those inform your style of community building? Hmm. There's homework, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, since I opened my mouth, I'll go first. Um, for me, it's inclusion being welcoming and um, true to true to who I am and therefore bringing that to the community. You know, I can't, I can't be a hypocrite and be one way in regards of how I act and how I manage. And also I can't be a dictator about it. You know, anything that I've done has been with like mod and admin feedback. I can't just make a decision with one exception, I know I was exceptionally grumpy that day, and just go do things with no checking in with anything else. So, you know, like collaboration, authenticity, and inclusion. Um, so actually, when I was first um, thinking about the ABCs, I actually used your brand, your personal brand, Tanya, as one of my examples oh, for different values. And uh, that actually rings really true to the three that I chose. They're a little bit different. But I said inclusivity, um, bold, uh, and um, sort of like that paladin mindset. Uh, I feel like you're sort of a protector for others as well. I try um, to be. Yeah. I don't always make it, but I try to be. <laughs> Uh, Latia, I saw you raise your finger. Yes, um, I wanted to um, kind of piggyback off of co collaboration because it is one of my values. As one of three community managers for Adventurers League, um, we talk about everything. And uh, we try to look at things from kind of like outside, like out, 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 outside or opposite viewpoints when we're trying to make a decision about something. Um, so I definitely consider collaboration one of my values. Also empathy um, for me, because you never know what the person on the other side of the screen or the phone is going through. So when you're trying to resolve issues, you always want to um, keep in mind that you're only, you may only be getting, you know, 25% of the actual story that someone is complaining about or, you know, going through, you know, they're complaining to you about something, but what's really going on that kind of made this spill over into the community. Um, and as always, inclusivity. Um, I'm such a stickler for it, especially, um, especially these days where it is 
turn, it is always being challenged. So to uh, kind of keep my foot down on that and make sure that the communities that I foster are inclusive and welcoming and um, I have no nonsense for that kind of stuff. Yeah, I'm seeing lots of, lots of overlap. Brenna. Yeah, the um, three that I had written down were uh, safety, transparency, and passion. Um, so kind of uh, similar to what Tanya and Latia said, um, when it comes to like support and inclusion, um, like to me, a space is not worth like having or fostering if it's not like a safe space for people, um, if they can't be supported to be themselves and to like talk about things in a way where they're not going to be like harassed or bullied or any of that. So like for me, that's always the foundation. Like, is this a safe space? And are we like doing the ongoing work to keep that space safe? Um, transparency, that's, I'm sure we're like, we'll probably get more into transparency, but um, I tend to be like probably more on the transparent side, just as like my strategy. Um, I like being really open in that way. Um, and then passion, like I really like working with communities of really like passionate people who love um, like whatever the topic is whatever it's centered around um like i love that kind of coming together of um, people that just have like a shared love of something nice rachel um, so the three that i had written down were authenticity um welcoming and just being supportive um and so i mean everyone's kind of talked about inclusivity and being welcoming um and i'll just echo that um having been a board game fan a lot longer than i've been on like the inside i definitely know what it feels like um to be in a community where you're like this isn't quite for me, and I'd been playing board games my whole life before I was like, I'm going to join the like online community. Um, and there's all this lingo and all this terminology. And I was like, I, as someone who's been playing board games my whole life, I was like, I don't understand what's happening. I don't get this. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why I'm very adamant about at least the Resonum community. We are not like a capital B board game TM group, um, just because I know that that can be really alienating and just really hard to enter. I think we all know that kind of like like board game communities can very easily become like a board game bro like space and it's ve i'm very passionate about like staying as far away from that as humanly possible and i want people like if people come into our discord or our community and find board find board games through us and find a love of that hobby through us that's really important to me we don't it's not just a community for people who already love the hobby um it's more about like finding the right type of people that we mesh with and then if we can get them into board games that's awesome and if we can't then we just have more cool, cool people to talk to in general mm -hmm. um yeah and then just authenticity and being supportive of each other um our space the resonum space isn't a space where we just talk about resonum stuff we like barely talk about resonum stuff like we want to know what you're doing what's going on in your life um especially i think that's in partly a nature of being so small um and i'm really interested to hear how other panelists who run like really big communities handle that but like i have the like the honor of being able to like know everyone individually and like being able to support them on a personal level is really cool. So yeah, those are my my three. Are there values that you feel that like any and every community builder 100% has to have? I think probably mm -hmm. that commitment to like safety and inclusion, I would mm -hmm. think, or else like, I think if you don't have that as a core value, um, like you're probably not cut out to manage that personally. Yeah, I'll also echo um, Brenna's, one of Brenna's um, three, which was passion. Um, I think your community is smart and they'll know if you're promoting a thing that you don't really love. Um, and so I think, at least me, I know ideally, sometimes we have to promote things we don't love, but ideally I think it like, if you're really passionate about what you're doing and you, again, on the flip side, you would wanna be a part of the community you're creating, then you're, you're doing the right thing. Conversely, yeah. Are there any values or personality traits that you feel like community, someone who wants to build a, a community shouldn't have or should avoid? Ooh. We only have an hour for the panel. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think a, a thing that you don't need and shouldn't have is um, an ability not to take feedback mm. or inability mm -hmm. to take feedback because a lot of times your community and hopefully your community is one where you're not all in group think together and lockstep because then you just create an echo chamber where no one can have a, a real discussion. But if something happens, if someone comes in and, and, and I'm not talking about the, I'm going to play devil's advocate. I'm talking about like having a, an ideological difference that isn't like one where somebody's got to leave the community. This is, I don't agree with this. And here's why, where you can actually have those conversations some people just can't hear any kind of feedback without viewing it as a personal attack. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, and also realizing you're not the sole arbiter. A community is collaborative. It's not just you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. So let's move on to B. B is for boundaries and expectations. So this answers the question of what kind of community do you want to build and what are its values, which do not have to be the same as yours. Um, they can be, uh, but they they absolutely do not have to be. So uh, I'm going to give you some more homework. Uh, <laughs> what are values of the of a community that you manage? And then uh, add to that, how does that inform the tone you set and the decisions that you make? Hmm. Um, so I can kind of jump in. So because I work with Kickstarters a lot, um, I know that one of the big values that um, like my community of backers have is actually value. Um, like they're extremely concerned with the actual cost of things and like what they're paying, what they're getting in return. It's like a very transactional relationship. Um, for me personally, like I don't, that's probably not one of like my actual values. Like I see something on Kickstarter and look at it for a second. I'm just like, yeah, I want it. And then I never think about it again. <laughs> um, but for a lot of people, that's not the case. Um, so I have to like really adapt my thinking and put myself in the mindset of like, okay, are we giving these people what they want? Are we showing the value cor- correctly? Are we conveying to them like why it costs this much and like why that's a good deal for them? Um, like, obviously that's a more like concrete example, but um, that's something that like, I've had to kind of warp my thinking to get my head around to put myself in their headspace and make sure that I'm approaching it from a way that they'll find um, is fruitful for them. What about you, Latia? Um, the value of Adventures League is to create a an even playing field for uh, people who play Dungeons and Dragons. We set restrictions on you know, how players build their characters, what sort of, you know, magical items they can have and everything. And um, I think the, the the value there, like I said, is to make sure that everybody has fun at the table, to make sure that everyone is, you know, evenly, evenly leveled or at least evenly matched in terms of like player power. Um, I just lost where I was going with this, but <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the value that I have that, that we have there is to um, make sure that nobody is like overlooked or kind of overruled at the table. Like if everybody is at that even, if everybody, if everybody is on an even pace, there's no room for power creep or, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Power gaming. That's the one. Uh, there's no room for power gaming. So everybody kind of has an opportunity to shine at the table. Um, It's, again, not quite one of my values because, you know, if I see a really cool magic item in a book, I'm like, well, why can't I have that? Well, it's too overpowered for Adventures League. And I'm like, okay, I'll I'll deal. (laughs) Can you think of um, something that you and the other community managers, uh, like a situation where you had to make uh, a decision among the three of you? Um, like your coven of community managers. Uh, We are the fates. (laughs) I love that. Um, Where this value of sort of equality, even playing fields, uh, came into play and helped you make a decision? Yes, um, constantly. Um, There are a lot of um, magic items. Like, for example, in Tales of the Yawning Portal, um, when you play White Plume Mountain, you've got those three sentient magic items that are kind of constantly the subject of of ruling uh, amongst the the players. Um, I think we're still kind of figuring out exactly what will be the results, like if you acquire one of those magic items, but um, we're constantly reevaluating. And I think that is a, a thing that people should all should always be doing, like, you know, things change, you may have to kind of take a step back and look at something that you gave a ruling previously and think, well, maybe does it need to be changed? Does it need to be reruled? Um, that situation, I think, when it comes to the, some of the more, what we would call in adventures, like story items, mm-hmm. the items that are only meant for one person to have, or, you know, a little bit overpowered for the table. 
Um, let's see, Rachel. Sure. Um, so yeah, I, I feel very lucky that my my values align very well with Resonum. Um, it's partly why I'm I'm there because um, I saw them and I was like, that is that is for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the the core three for for Resonum are probably social consciousness um, and accessibility, and then again, um, inclusion in general. Um, we um, a lot of our earlier games in particular were actually researched at like a game lab um, that brings in psychology into gameplay. And our goal with a lot of our games is to help in subtle ways, like spark social change and spark new ideas and thinking about ideas in new ways and particularly the type of people who can play games. Um, like we use, for example, we use all she, her pronouns in our rule books because um, most of them are he, him. And that's just been a really weird standard for a really long time. Um, and so that just aligns really well with my, my values in general. And we're very transparent with that. And I think partly because we wear that on our sleeve, we attract people who like that. Like, uh, not that people can't slip in through the cracks, but the people who are drawn to us are the people who value those things as well. So I'm very lucky that I feel like it aligns very well. Um, what Brenna said about Kickstarter, though, is a whole thing. <laughs> um, because, like, I do feel like there is a bit of dissonance between the folks that we get on Kickstarter and the folks who I would consider in our, like, tangible community. Um, and writing that line can be very hard because I have to manage both of those groups of people. And there is overlap, but there are people who, like, just want to buy our product and, like, that's it. Um, and that's a much different experience um and those people i would agree with a lot of what brenda said like the value and all of that like nitty-gritty stuff um is much more something you have to handle with kickstarter and one of the challenges that i've had with that is like learning i guess like <laughs> that's the one time i feel like i've had to change my like i've had to address a situation differently than i would in real life where you have to pretend like everyone has a great idea on kickstarter <laughs> where like you have to just act like wow i've never thought about that new way of 3d modeling these components even though we've been 3d modeling components for like 10 <laughs> years <laughs> like having to like i am i can be kind of like a snarky person um and so that's the those are like kickstarter encounters are where i encounter the most having to kind of put on a face for the people I'm interacting with, um, because Kickstarter is more of a direct monetary transaction, you have to be more careful. Whereas with my community, like my actual physical community, I can be more transparent, more authentic, which is why I enjoy that work more than Kickstarter work in general. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, are there any ways that you make um, those, like you gave a lot of examples about how Resonum like exudes its values. Um, and mm -hmm. so maybe the way you communicate them is by just wearing the like, like, like heart on your sleeve. Um, yeah. But uh, are there any ways that you like explicitly kind of set expectations for what Resonum's values are? Hmm. Like, it's hard because I mean, I feel like we do explicitly set it through like our games and our products. Um, I mean, we get nasty comments like, every day about people being like, you advertise yourselves as women led, like, why are you doing that? It's like, well, then you can leave <laughs> like that. You can buy, <laughs> you can just go away. That's fine. Um, and I feel like, I feel like people get it. I haven't had to set it explicitly as much. And I feel like we also just set the tone, like even with our Twitch channel, like we are the kind like there's five of us, we're very small. Um, and so just by going out and being ourselves, I think that does, I think people get our vibe when you meet us and when you interact with us. Um, mm -hmm. So nothing like explicitly. Um, and I also don't really know what that would look like. I, I'm just, I'm just used to doing it through leading by example and leading through like the products that we put out. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, sorry if that's not a great answer, but oh, that's no. just my experience. There's no wrong answers. Uh, Tanya, what about you? Um, it's interesting because I'm re I've been reading the question and listening as everyone's talking. Mm -hmm. I don't think my community doesn't like my community can't have the same values I do, or there I can't build a community that does not have the same values I do. Like there are people like we may disagree on things. We may have some like we may disagree on pineapple on pizza, but if our values are that diametrically opposed, I don't think that they would fit in the community that's been built because it's it's been built around like inclusion and diversity in games and twitch streaming and the person you see on twitter is the person that you're going to get in person or on my stream like i don't do the peppy oh my god i'm so glad to be here like if that ever happens you've got the pod version of me <laughs> um now we check know. would be concerned <laughs> check that i've got a belly button because that will never be me um and so it's interesting because while, while people can have different values and different opinions, I don't think that the community that's been built out of what I do for the last five, six years, it can be opposed to my actual values. Mm -hmm. The only way that would work is if someone doesn't show themselves to be a terrible person. And then if they do, they gotta go. Um, we very much adopted the, we don't do that here mentality. 
and um, I'm going to take this ambassador. So that is a a found a charity, sorry, not a foundation about mental health and gaming. And so that is very important to us. It's very important that people can express themselves if they're having issues. And we do have some of our take this friends, at least in my discord and channel. So it, for me, it's all about having a safe, inclusive space. And that that is the core of my value. So if someone doesn't believe in that, they can't be there. Um, and for me, boundaries are like, you know, and certain things like in my Twitch channel, if you're new to the channel, let's say if I raid Latia or Latia raids me and I see Latia a lot virtually and you're like, we've gotten to hang out, we, we know each other. So if Latia comes in and says, hey, Tanya, blah, 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 but random stream person who came in on the raid starts calling me Tanya, that's a boundary. It's like, I don't know you. Who are you? And not in the who are you peasant, but in a I don't know you for right now, you're just a screen name. So for now, you can call me Cypher, Cypher Tier, and that that's it. So my values are built into the community that's been built. And so boundaries have, have saved me, and I think in some ways very literally, because while I'm not a different person online than I am in, in real life or in person, there's still a boundary of, I don't know you that well. Let's get to know each other first before you get a little too close, you know? Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit more mm -hmm. about boundaries. Oh, wait, no, Brenna, go ahead. Can I just respond to that really quickly? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I just wanted to say that, like, I particularly appreciate the work that you've done in that space, Tanya, because I feel like you were one of the first content creators who I saw kind of, like, publicly set boundaries with, like, parasocial relationships um, and seeing you being, like, hey, like, I don't know you, it's not okay to joke with me like that or something, or like, that's overly familiar. Um, because I, I used to have like big issues with setting those boundaries with people. Um, it was like very, like, inspiring <laughs> to like see somebody yeah. be very like firm with um, like how people interact with them um, and kind of like gave me a template for how to do it. <laughs> yeah, um, I actually just dealt with that in, in a stream where someone came and was like, oh, hey, sweetheart. And I was like, no, no we we don't know each other that way you can call me cypher maybe you can call me tanya but no like the person that gets to call me that is not in this stream right now <laughs> no. we all had a very visceral reaction to that uh, yeah, no thank you <laughs> like i was like mm, like and, and latia knows i mean you all know this, i cannot hide my face i'm the worst at neutral expression and i just i literally was just like <laughs> Um, before we move on, actually, Brenna, you used a term that some folks um, watching this panel right now might not know, parasocial relationships. Can you explain a little bit what that is? Yeah, so it's basically um, like a relationship uh, that exists in like usually in a digital space where um, you may have some kind of like very superficial relationship with somebody like you're a Twitter follower of theirs. That's the relationship. Um, but the person has like extrapolated that in their mind to be like, oh, we're friends, like I know them, you know, like I I'm involved in whatever they're doing. Um, that's that's my interpretation of it. And it's it's usually from the perspective of like, um, you know, a, a fan or a follower of like a bigger presence or creator. Mm -hmm. Um, which brings us to boundaries and setting those. So how important are boundaries? Why are they important? How do you set a boundary? I will start by saying <laughs> boundaries are incredibly important. Um, it's, depending on the community, some boundaries can be difficult to set, but they should always exist. Um, whether it be... You know, whether it be the boundary of I'm only going to answer questions from 10 a.m. in the morning to 2 p.m. in the afternoon, and then I'm going to take a break, or the boundary of um, in Adventures League, boundaries are, are, are interesting. I think the way that we set boundaries are by insisting that people have codes of conduct for their events, because that is a wonderful boundary. It's It sets the expectations of your event. It lets people know what you're about. It lets people know consequences for breaking those boundaries. Um, and is when, when I became a community manager and realized that that was a thing, I mean, I knew it was a thing, but like realizing that we put these boundaries here for, for you to make sure that we know what you're doing and that you know 
that we expect this of you. So boundaries are incredibly important. And like I said, diffi sometimes difficult to set, like Adventures League can't set a boundary for every event that happens. So we have to trust that those events are going to set those boundaries themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think Rachel had something to say. Yeah. So you kind of you kind of hit a lot of what I was going to say. I, I kind of interpret the boundaries, the B for boundaries to be um, boundaries for yourself. Um, I find that mental health with community managers can kind of be ignored a lot. Like our job is never off. Like our community exists when we're sleeping and it exists 24 seven. Um, and so one of the things for me, partly because I feel like our community is small and I've gotten lucky that we've only had a handful of like negative um, experiences that I've had to really like deal with. Um, so boundaries for me are more setting boundaries for myself um, because I am someone who A, just wants to like, wants to get to know people. And if there's an issue, I want to like address it immediately and I want to get to know everyone. And I also like can't stop working. And I magically found a job that never stops, um, <laughs> which for me can be dangerous. And I learned that, especially in my first year of doing community management, that I was getting burned out really, really quickly. Um, I was responding to DMs on weekends. Like after I went home from work, like I, would, I would still be engaging with people, which is like fine sometimes, but you really do have to know yourself and know like, when is this too much? And communicating that with your community of like, I don't answer DMs on weekends. Like that's my, that's sleep time. <laughs> that's when I like rest so that on Monday I can be like the person I need to be to interact with these issues and interact with these people. Um, and so, yeah, just setting boundaries for yourself and knowing when is too much and knowing, like being in tune with yourself um, and just being aware that this job can be really taxing. I think, I feel like a lot of people think it's really easy. Like you just talk to people and like have a really social job. Like it is hard, it's really hard and it's really taxing. And it's a, it's a lot of emotional labor mm -hmm. um, and being aware of that and knowing how much emotional labor you can do before it becomes too much. Um, so for me, that's the big boundary I've had to work on, um, at least with my like community size. Um, I actually think there might be some folks watching who don't understand what the concept or haven't heard of the concept of emotional labor. Do you sure. want to talk about that a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so emotional labor is sneaky and it'll get you. It's basically, <laughs> at least the way that I I understand it, it is like when two people are having an issue in your community or just like people are wanting to talk to you a lot, you have to engage with that. And if you're someone who, especially if you're like me and you're introverted, um, you don't like necessarily like thrive off of talking to people all the time. It takes effort to like engage with people thoughtfully and consciously. And if there's issues like uh, evaluating both sides, like that is, it's it's not physical labor, it's not necessarily like mental labor, you're not crunching numbers, but you are putting in empathy into a situation and putting in that much empathy all the time um, to a bunch of different people who you have different levels of familiarity with is hard and it's really taxing. Um, and so that's how I would describe emotional labor. It's sneaky, it'll get you, like you won't know you're doing it when you're doing it all the time, which is why I think it can be dangerous and hard and why people who don't do that as like the core of their job don't understand it because it's a type of exhaustion that maybe they haven't experienced before like if you're tired talking to your coworkers, imagine your entire job is like just talking and managing people um that's the best way i can put it for someone who hasn't experienced it before mm -hmm. yeah Brenna. yeah yeah I've, I've done a lot of the same things um usually like in the first update that i do on a kickstarter campaign to all the backers i lay out like what my schedule is and i'll say mm -hmm. like this page will be monitored on these days of the week between these hours and like that's it um i didn't used to do that and it was like nightmarish because you know like rachel said i was like on my phone all the time like all hours of the day and night like waking up in a cold sweat literally like having nightmares about not responding to people on time like yeah. it was really bad um so like i really had to set that boundary um another one i've set is and this has been tricky because i mentioned transparency um and like i've kind of positioned like myself as being like part of my brand and did that intentionally. Um, like, and I'm, and I'm very public and open about that. Like all of my social media accounts are like my full name. Like people can just find me and message me. They're all public. Um, and they're not like curated for work content. It's like just total stream of consciousness. Like this is me. If you want the professional stuff, go to the business account. Um, but I, I have had to institute, like, I'm not going to talk um, like, business stuff like in dms um like you can't dm me on my personal account like you need to dm the business account to do that um like i'm not going to talk to you like through instagram dms or something like that um so that's a boundary that i've set definitely um also like when it comes to emotional labor one thing that i think that we have to do as community managers is like it's almost an abstraction of the self a little bit because when you're dealing with somebody who is like unhappy with the decision that you or the company or the brand has made um like you get 
you, you kind of take that on, like you become the avatar of like everything that they're upset about. <laughs> um, so it's really hard to kind of like remove yourself from that and, and understand like, okay, like they're not upset with me, like as a person, they're upset with this decision and I need to like connect with them to explain like why this is happening and like why I think it's a good thing. And, you know, sometimes it doesn't always work, but uh, yeah, trying to like remove yourself from feeling so like personally involved in it is a challenge, I think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, go ahead. Oh, I'm just going to kind of second what Brenna said, especially if your brand isn't necessarily yourself, if you're representing um, another company and you don't necessarily have control over the decisions that are made. Um, I used to take any criticism of Resonim as a like thing super personally. And like, I am not Resonim. I'm one fifth of Resonim and I might not even have been involved in that decision. And that's a huge, especially if you're working on a small company. Um, that's a huge boundary to set is like not every criticism lobbed at and this also is echoing what um, Tanya said about not every criticism is a personal attack um, and not every criticism is even about you or something you can control and not taking that personally can cut back on the emotional input that you put into your work so yeah I'm just kind of echoing that um, for me I I kind of, I try to establish very firm boundaries like I've had people try to add me on Facebook to do business and I've got like 80 unanswered requests because I don't do business through Facebook. My profile is personal. I talk about like my life there and not in a, oh, I'm super secret and do all those things. It's like, no, I need to have some space that is tr- strictly personal. Um, I have a contact form and other, like or if I do anything and people circumvent, like, I know you've got a contact form, but I've got your email. So I'm going to email you. And I'm like, well, you failed the first test of following directions. Because um, that means you, you're going to do this on a project or something else. Um, and like when people DM me, like I had someone DM me in Discord of all places because we share a Discord. And I'm like, I just read this like thesis length note. I'm like, there's literally a business email in my pin tweet. This is how you contact me. And, and people are like, well, you know, why are you like this? Well, one, I, you know, we haven't talked about it, but I've been stalked and harassed. And I, as a matter of personal safety, but also I need one space where messages go. Otherwise I will never answer them. They will get lost. They'll be in the ether. And you know, and also just in terms of like what is and isn't okay in like Twitch chat and the discord, um, you know, when we do rivals and and things like that, where it's like, there's a line. And if you cross it, you got to go. Mm-hmm. And I try to be very clear about that. That's why our code of conduct document, it states up front, it's a living document and thing, you know, it can be changed. We're not like, this is it. This will never change. It's written in stone. But that boundary is you elected to come here, whether you, you are a patron, a Twitch subscriber, or whatever you do, you elected to come to this house. And as such, there are certain etiquette rules and things you should do when you are it visiting someone's house. And that's the way that I treat it. Like I'm letting you visit me virtually. Um, and you know, Latia among you has been, actually been in my apartment. <laughs> so, but Latia also was awesome and came and visited and hung out. And, but we've also known each other. So, you know, having had good home training as we'd like to say, <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't come in someone's house and act the way that we see people act online and, and talk to community managers and talk to people who work on games. So I think there's just like, the expectation of etiquette as a boundary, which may sound weird to some people, but you know, for those of us that have home training, as my grandmother would like to say, you act a certain way when you visit people and you're visiting when you are in a community. Yeah. I kind of want to summarize a bit of what everyone has talked about, which is really two ways of setting boundaries and expectations. One is sort of, and this is more for setting boundaries for yourself, sort of training people how they are able to treat you and what access they have to you. If someone is DMing your personal account, but you have a a separate brand account or a company account for a company you're representing, it is okay to tell them, hey, I don't answer DMs about work. Please email me. Here's my email address or DM this account. Um, The other one that both Tanya um, and Latia mentioned was uh, setting a code of conduct. A good code of conduct is going to code of conduct is going to set the expectations for what behavior is okay or not okay. Let you know what the consequences are if you break this code of conduct. You might get kicked from a Discord community, or you might lose access in Adventurers League to uh, having special Adventurers League events or something like that. 
Um, and also maybe contact information for if someone sees that a code of conduct is being broken, how they can report that behavior. Um, all of those things, um, super important and a really good way to set expectations and boundaries explicitly and empower you to enforce those boundaries and expectations. Um, all right. So the last letter of the ABCs is C, which uh, stands for communication and engagement. Um, and these two are really, really important because they're not just about um, you're building the community, but they're sort of the next step of how you're activating the community and harnessing it uh, so that the people in your community want to be your biggest brand ambassadors. Um, so I'm wondering what communication means for the different panelists. So fill in the blank of like communication should be blank. Hmm. We'll go first. Yeah, if Rachel. No one else wants to. Uh, my gut reaction is just authentic. Like I, the number of times I've been in meetings where, you know, the people on our team are trying to figure out, like, we got this email or we got this question and like, how, how are we supposed to answer this? I'm like, just tell them what happened. Tell them how we feel, what happened. Like, at least in my experience, like just being honest, not trying to curate like the way you're supposed to like handle, like, just tell them what happened. Tell them like, especially because I do feel like our, our group is a very just like authentic group. Like, just do that. Like, don't try to put on like a business face, just be real with the people you're talking to because that's just I always find that to just be the most natural and the best way to solve most um at least issues that I've encountered is like just be authentic just be honest tell them what happened um and especially even if it's not a negative situation if it's a positive like just be yourself <laughs> like I know that sounds so stupid but like communication should be there shouldn't be a filter at least in my experience I just like to talk to people like I'm talking to people and just be authentic about it Mm -hmm. And whatever authenticity means to you, that's, you know, that's different for everyone, but. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, I don't know, like, if I can sum it up in one word, maybe it's like, um, the other word I'm looking for is like sensitive, but I'm trying to convey is like, um, like actually answering, like what's being asked of you. Um, and sometimes like in community management, we do have to kind of do like, like around the block speak <laughs> kind of like dance around an issue um especially if it's like um you know for another company or brand where it's like either information we don't have it's maybe not public information there's like a million reasons why we have to do that um but like when when possible um i think like really trying to get to the root of like what somebody's saying and what they're trying to convey and finding a way to address that is really important because sometimes Sometimes they do come out and say, and they're very blunt. And then other times, like it may manifest in different ways. Um, so like kind of being sensitive to, to what people are saying and um, trying to like read the truth in what they're saying. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, it'd be ongoing because you can't, you, you can't just say a thing and then consider it done. You need to, you know, talk to people and whether, you know, and communication doesn't always have to be bad. I feel like a lot of people when they hear you need to communicate, they assume it's a bad thing. Like the infamous, do you have time to talk? We need to talk. And that sends everyone's anxiety through the roof because <laughs> people do that. And then there's no follow-up and you're like, about oh, what? <laughs> um, so I think communication just needs to be ongoing and whether it's kind of checking in, whether it's a good or a bad thing you need to talk about, because we're not mind readers. If I was a mind reader, I'd be a lot richer. Um, <laughs> So I, I think that for me, that's key. And like, you know, I, I try to talk to people as often as I can, or I'm just as transparent as I can be, you know, and, and that's for the community, people I'm working with, you know, and Latia can confirm or deny that. <laughs> um, but uh, for me, it's the key thing is ongoing. You can't just like have a one and done thing and expect it to be okay. Mm -hmm. Latia, anything to add? Uh, no, it's actually Brenna who kind of, got what I was going to say. Um, it, open wasn't the word, open is not the right word that I should use, that I wanted to use, but Tanya kind of got it with ongoing. Like it should be um, honest. You should say what you can say. And, you know, it's it's not always, I can't, it's, it's not, all, the answer is not always, I can't talk about this. It's like, you know, I don't have that information. Um, yeah. When I have that information, I'll let you know. So ongoing, like Tanya said, and honest like rachel said it's pretty much everything i wanted to say yeah and one thing to think about and, and this is a caveat honest does not mean you have to be cruel yeah because so many people they'll, they'll be cruel and go but i'm just being honest and i'm like there's a difference mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Uh, so I'm going to combo the next two questions. Uh, tell me, what are the different ways um, in which you engage with your communities? What platforms do you use? And um, I guess, what are those platforms good for? Um, if they're good for a particular type of communication, how you how does your communication vary by platform? I comboed like five questions there, actually. <laughs> good job, good job. Um, I'll start. Okay. Uh, so Adventures League uses both Facebook and Twitter, although our Twitter is mostly for announcements of things happening. Uh, we also have a blog, but again, the Twitter and the blog kind of go hand in hand. If something goes on the blog, we make an announcement about it on Twitter, and then we make an announcement about it on Facebook. Um, but the Facebook groups... We have two. We have one for general Adventures League questions, and we have one for uh, Dungeon Master questions. Um, so we engage with both of those. It's the community managers are really just mediators for for some of the questions. It's mainly meant to be discussion amongst the community, and then we step in as needed. Um, but I think. What was the question again? Oh, um, there were five of them, so it's there understandable. Are there were uh, but I guess I'm trying to get an understanding of like what platforms you use and how does communication vary by platform? Okay, so yeah, so Facebook is um, mostly letting the community communicate amongst themselves and having the admin step in as necessary, um, whether it be to issue a final ruling or to tell someone that they're not being a good community member and to knock it off. Um, or to un sometimes, unfortunately, we have to uh, escort people out of the community. Um, Twitter and our blog are mostly just for announcements. Um, occasionally, we'll get a DM about events going on on Twitter, but uh, Twitter is mainly just announcements and kind of keeping up with the community because a lot of the community is on Twitter these days. Mm -hmm. um, I'll go. Right. Um, in terms of platforms that we're using, um, I'm not on TikTok. I'm holding it out. <laughs> um, I'm on. I'm actively managing communities on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Discord, Slack, Twitch, Kickstarter, and then Board Game Geek, which is um, like a very it's a board gaming specific hub um, that's doesn't really have like wider world significance, but is important in the board gaming world. Um, I think the tone definitely changes from platform to platform. Um, Twitter is the platform that I tend to be most comfortable on. So I feel like Twitter is like my most like natural and free flowing kind of conversation. Um, Facebook tends to be like more corporate, maybe a little bit more formal. Um, and then Board Game Geek is more like uh, if I'm on there, it's pretty much to deal with like rules and gameplay stuff. So that's more like procedural sort of. Um, so Twitter is probably like my favorite platform and then um, like Instagram because I can like kind of experiment with communicating more visually. So I enjoy that. Rachel? Um, sure. Yeah. So when I started at Resonant, we had Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. I think that was pretty much it. Um, and those kind of communities already kind of existed, but they weren't tangible and we weren't really doing anything with them. So the first thing I did when I came in, I was like, we need to make a Twitch channel because I love Twitch. I've been watching Twitch forever. Um, and I've found that the times when Resonim really shines is at conventions, like when people can come up and meet us and we can talk and we can just feel like we love what we're doing. We want to get you to love it too. And I was like, the only way that I can like transfer that through the internet is like to sit in front of a camera and say, hi, I love what I'm doing. You should love this too. And the only way I knew how to do that was on Twitch. I was like, that's, that's what I, my favorite part of my job is running the booths at conventions because I get to just like look someone in the face and be like, this is why I love it. Da. <laughs> and that's kind of just what I have done on Twitch. And that's what I really love about Twitch is that I get to just go on there and I get to be myself. You get to see inside our very weird, goofy team. And there's no like feeling for a need of like a corporate filter or like, like with Instagram, everything's kind of curated. And um, at least with like business Twitter, every tweet needs to, at least I feel like has to be you know, important and intentional. Like if you go to our Twitter, what are the first five tweets you see? Like, do they say something important about our company? Whereas with Twitch, it's kind of more just like, nor it's just normal chatting with people, which is what I just love so much. And that's why I love 
Twitch. Um, and same with Discord. I've also created a, dis a Discord server where people just hang out. <laughs> My moderators just spend like half of our Discord server just like roasting me, which is just really fun. And I just find that a good way to build like, I don't know, the types of relationships that I love. Um, that's also where we handle more like interpersonal issues is in our Discord. Um, that's really where our community exists, um, at least how I understand it. Um, and then we also have the Board Game Geek and Kickstarter communities, which are very different. And I think the communities where I'm, Kickstarter is great because that's those are the people who are really engaged and want to help us build our product. Um, and we've had we've made tons of like major decisions mid like mid production of a game based on what people have told us on Kickstarter, which is awesome. That's like the only real place where that happens, um, which I really value. Board Game Geek is an interesting place. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Board Game Geek, I have a love and hate relationship with Board Game Geek. Um, it definitely hits in a lot of ways the side of the board game community that I don't always love. Um, so navigating that can be challenging and that is much more, um, as, as Brenna said, like gameplay issues. Um, so sometimes you get really awesome people try to mod our games to be different, like fit certain needs, like single player mods, you find those on Board Game Geek, which are awesome. So you can't, as a board game company, we kind of made the mistake the mistake because none of us really use or like board game geek because it's just kind of a weird i don't know it's kind of a weird space um we made the mistake i think initially by kind of ignoring board game geek and you really do have to engage with it as a board game company because it is such a monolithic thing in the board game community and so learning how to handle it and handle it correctly has been challenging but yeah sorry that was long-winded but those are all the platforms and the differences between how we engage with them twitch is my favorite though i love twitch <laughs> Um, you know, for me personally, I've got Twitch, Twitter, Discord, Instagram, and the worst Instagram though, because since I haven't been traveling, no one has. I'm like, what am I going to take photos of? There's only so many times I can take a photo of the same cat in the same spot. Yeah. On the floor. <laughs> um, but you know, I, I have the biggest, I hate the word following, but the biggest presence on Twitter, but my Twitter's like, you're going to get my random 4am thoughts as well as a well thought out thread on whatever's on my brain or something I saw that annoyed me. Um, I've been streaming on Twitch almost, oh God, almost six years now. Um, I know, and, and that's, it's good engagement and it's it's a way to, to keep the community going, especially in the time that we're doing this because there's nowhere to go. And for a lot of people, that is their only interaction with other folks. Um, and on the I Need Diverse Games side, we have all the same things. We've got a Facebook page. And right now we're not really active because again, where to go. Um, but our Twitter and our Discord are the most interactive right now. And in both cases, Discord's place to have conversations, to get to know to people, to to learn more about each other in a way that you can't on Twitter and in Twitch chats. Because even in granted, even in Discord, tone does not convey over text. And so if someone says a weird thing or you read it in a certain way, you can then go go ask. Well, how did you mean that? You can't really do that on Twitter. And I am the fastest block in the West on Twitter because I just don't have time for it. And that is me that is on the I Need Diverse Game side because there's been too many bad faith actors to, to assume good intent some days. Other days, I'm a little more forgiving, but six out of seven, probably not. And that could be a bad community building thing. But when people have shown you who they are, you kind of, you have to accept what they show you and, and run with that versus giving people too many chances, which is kind of a downer note, but unfortunately that's, that's how my experience has kind of colored how I interact with people. So, you know, Twitter is very off the cuff. This is what it is. And the I need verse games is a little more businessy, but you know, you follow me on Twitter, you never know what you're going to get. And discord is more conversational, more, more long form talk. Um, I guess, again, to summarize what all four of you have touched on, there are many different platforms uh, where you can be community building, and there's different communication styles that work better um, for those different platforms. And also the different platforms can attract different types of members of your community and what they might want from you or the brand you're representing. Um, I'm wondering, because we mentioned so many different platforms, does anybody have tips for managing communication on the different platforms, keeping that organized? Um, is there any like software actually that you use? Or I, we touched a little on mental health tips already. Um, oh, go ahead, Brian. No, it's just, just in terms of software, um, this has become like more vital to me since I've been in Australia. Um, I use like scheduling software. 
um, to schedule like posts and notes to everybody to go out through the day because I'm like not usually awake when most other people are. Um, yeah, I, I think it's just about like adapting. I, I think like you just have to like really like live in the social space to kind of learn like the vernacular of it. Um, and that only comes with experience. Um, so like, unfortunately that does mean like, like I say, I'm like aggressively online. Um, like, cause I just feel like I'm always online. <laughs> um, and so I think it's hard for people who maybe aren't inclined to do that to, to learn like the very intricate differences between like the vernacular of each platform. Um, so that's just something that comes with like time and experience and kind of immersing yourself in it. Um, there's, I think there's like very stark tonal differences between each platform that are probably like subtle to people who don't live in it every day. Uh, Latia. I don't use any um, like outside software other than my calendar because necessary. Um, but I would say for anyone who is looking to engage on a specific platform, find out what all that platform is capable of. Um, more recently, aggressively online as well, and Twitter being my primary platform, um, I figuring out what the accessibility tools are on Twitter. Like I've started, um, I don't always, I don't always get it right every time, but I've begun uh, doing alt text for my pictures um, because I do know that there are a lot of um, visually, uh, I don't know what, you know, what the, I don't know what the proper term is, but like blind and like visually impaired uh, community members and uh, giving them that alt text so that they can understand what is in the picture that they may not be able to see so well um, is very helpful. So I would say no matter what platform you, you use, like take some time to just kind of poke at it and see what is available for you to use. Um, because you may find a feature that you didn't know that you had or you know a feature that may be uh, very beneficial to your community at large. Um, I use if the if this then that I think that's what I have T T T stands for. Yeah, I, I can never get the all the T's right. Um, <laughs> beneficial. So like if I do um, like a blog post or something, it can go everywhere, and I don't have to worry about like different mm. tweets and and Instagram and it all looks different. It's like here, here's one push. I mean, I also try to limit my time online. Um, like first thing in the morning, kind of as I'm having coffee, whatever, on a break, and then in the evening, so I don't have something to do. Because um, being online all the time, at least for me, has not been great mental health wise, especially with the state of the world. So um, one thing I would say is is know yourself well enough to know if you'll get get drawn into the rabbit hole of of Twitter and Instagram, and if it helps schedule yourself time to do these things. And, and like Brenna does. Schedule posts. That way you don't have to worry about like, oh shoot, I forgot the announcement. Just schedule it. Find things that work for you and go go from there. Um, Rachel, any last things to add? I think everyone really hit it. I really loved um, what was said about spending time on the platforms that you're going to be using. Like, don't go on Twitch if you have never watched Twitch. <laughs> Do it like, especially I would say, especially Twitch and Discord are two of the ones that I think are the most dissimilar from normal social media. Um, especially like, as Tanya said, like people will be over familiar in Twitch chat, which is something that like in Instagram, it might not bother you as much. You can delete the comment, you can like whatever, but like your face is there. And if someone's being weird, you have to be a like prepared to handle that and be like, no, what effective means to handle that are like watch other people see how other people do it um know the the language and also as um latia said like what it's capable of like captioning on twitch is important all that stuff so that you can do it right from the start is important and um the same kind of over familiarity happens in discord too and and join discords and understand how people handle that and what that looks like so you're you're prepared for it to also hit the mental health thing so that when those things come up you know how to handle it so yeah spend time in the spaces that you want to curate is really important well, thank you, thank you, thank you all for sharing your wisdoms on the ABCs of community building. Uh, authenticity, boundaries, and communication. You master those three steps, you're off to a really, really good start as a community builder. Uh, let's go through the panel and do some outros, starting with Brenna. 
Hey, thanks so much for having me again. I'm Brenna Noonan. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Brenna Noonan, pretty much everywhere as Brenna Noonan. Um, I'm the co-founder of Quillsilver Studio. We create tabletop game products. You can find us at Quillsilver Studio on Facebook and Instagram or on Twitter at by by Quillsilver. Awesome. Yeah, I'm Rachel again, um, Rachel Billings or Ray. You can find me at Twitter at, at underscore Raybird underscore. Because Raybird was taken, um, <laughs> which is like my usual handle on all socials. Um, and you can find me on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Resonim. And pretty much all of our socials are just at Resonim. So find us there. And thanks again for having me. I just want to say I'm really honored to just be on this panel with all you folks. Oh, really, yeah. really big moment for me. Oh. So thank you so much. <laughs> Um, hi, everybody. I have been Latia Jackies. You can find me across most social media as Latia Jackies, L-A-T-I-A-J-A-C-Q-U-I-S-E. I'm also behind the D&D &D Adventures League Twitch, which is uh, at D-N-D underscore A-D-V League, L-E-A-G-U-E. -E. Um, I'm also on Twitch as well, um, but not so much these days, but you can find me kind of anywhere, uh, again, aggressively online. Uh, it's a problem. And uh, Lisa, thank you for having me on the panel as well. Uh, I'm Tanya DePass. You can find me everywhere as Cypher of Tears, C Y P H E R O F T Y R. Uh, that is on Twitch, Twitter, Instagram. I still have a Tumblr, even though it literally feels like it has tumbleweeds these days. <laughs> um, you can also uh, find me and Latia on Rivals Waterdeep, which is uh, Rivals Waterdeep on Twitter because the OF was a bridge too far for character limits. And um, yeah, I do a little bit of everything online. So say hi, be nice. And in the weird case that you find yourself blocked, it's because I ran a block list. It's nothing personal. Just say hi and we'll fix it. Um, and again, it, this was awesome. I miss doing panels and talking to people. So maybe this time next year, we can all be in person again. Yes, please. I think uh, this is my first panel. Wait, really? No way. Never, no. <laughs> I think so. What? Well, you did great. Everyone in chat, clap for Latia. <laughs> I am Lisa Penrose. Uh, I was your moderator today. You can find me on all the social medias, mostly, I mean, all of them, but also mostly Twitter, Instagram, and Twitch. Uh, Lisa Penrose, Lisa spelled with a Y. Uh, I am also the brand manager uh, for a publishing platform called Dungeon Masters Guild, dmsguild.com. We're on uh, Twitter, Instagram, and we have some Facebook groups. Our handle is dms, dms underscore guild. Uh, check that out if you want to publish some DD things um hit me up and we can chat more about that um but thank you thank you again everybody uh, for joining this panel and to everybody watching thanks for joining as well and enjoy the rest of your packs online bye everybody bye, bye. Hello there, I would like to introduce to you a cooperative, friendly, fast-paced and fun-filled game by the name of Camped Out. The first title from Inca Studios from Melbourne, Australia. Camped Out is a couch co-op game for friends and families where up to four players work together to set up their campsite before nightfall. Work together as a team to complete campsites and unlock further areas in the game world. Throw into the mix some hazards from natural environments such as bears, critters, ghosts and spike traps and things are sure to get out of hand quickly. 
Oh, there's a bear now! A hearty offering of fish! Ha! Ah, and the bear is on its way. Be sure to share the tools, as there's only one tool per job. A hatchet to chop down the trees, a pickaxe to harvest the rocks, a fishing rod for fish, and a mallet to finish off the job. Each level is a race against the clock, where players are required to build tents, construct a campfire, cook enough food, and get into bed before darkness falls. To achieve these objectives, players must harvest resources scattered around the level and satisfy the building requirements while avoiding hazards, navigating the landscape efficiently and work cooperatively to complete the objectives as quickly as possible. Oh, that's one tent complete! Now, Two tents complete. Three tents finished. One to go. The last tent is finished. Well done, campers. A straggler. Quick, get to bed before nightfall. Ha-ha! Success! I hope you enjoyed this gameplay demonstration. You can wishlist Camped Out now on Steam. See you at the campsite! recently had a shift. Both Child's Play and the medical community has recognized an unfilled niche where we needed some additional expertise in the hospital to help us deploy everything that they've provided. And they've started to help us develop a brand new role within medicine, that of the gaming technology specialist. These are people who have expertise in gaming, in technology in general, knowing how to set things up, keep them updated, but also have expertise working with children and work hand in hand with our child life specialists. We can't afford to support you know, 250 of these positions across the US, um, but we can support five or six or seven a year, get them started and then have them prove useful so that ultimately every hospital will want to have this person. We'll always support our partner hospitals with Amazon wish lists. We'll always send them an annual gift to support their child life department. But being able to spread this position across the globe 
is the next push that we want to be able to do. I think that this is um, revolutionary. I think it's the, the next greatest thing for our, our profession. To see a, an organization like Child's Play really be able to admit, you know what, we can do better. What's our next step? What's our purpose? What, how can we change the world? How can we make a significant difference that's lasting? And so it's been really an amazing part of my professional growth to watch them get to the point they are today of introducing something that five years ago we wouldn't have even thought about. So hey guys, um, welcome to PAX, um, PAX Online. Uh, this panel is going to be over collegiate esports during COVID. Um, I'm Dylan Liu, I'm CEO of Uconnect Esports. Uh, we're a sponsorship marketplace that allows brands to activate in college campuses and collegiate esports communities. And I'm, I'm just going to let everyone go down the list and talk a little bit about uh, what they do, what their position is, and just make a general introduction. Starting with who? Yeah, with Bobby. Yeah. Oh, okay, cool.
Um, so my name is Bobby. I'm working on Flock Wealth uh, Financial Services, but for millennials and Gen Z. I've also worked in the past in the hackathon and collegiate uh, esports scene, and so that's kind of like my background there. Yeah. Ryan, yeah. Ryan. Uh, Ryan Marsh. I'm currently the operations executive for Intercollegiate Game Network. We've only been up for around, I think it's like, it feels like four months now. Gosh, time flies. Uh, so we're kind of a new group focusing on uh, collegiate esports across North America. And before that, uh, I was the events coordinator for the University of Connecticut Gaming Club for about two or three years. And I also did a bunch of uh, competitive Overwatch. Um, yeah, I think it was everything. I recently graduated, so that's oh, awesome. why I'm not with them anymore. Yes. Thank you. Congrats. Um, Mike? I am Mike Aguilar, and I am the director of esports for the University of Oklahoma, having been developing since 2016 at OU, and have been approaching esports from the context of the macro view of the industry, bringing synergies for streaming entertainment production on top of the intercollegiate competition, as well as deep integrations for community engagement and programming, not only for OU's population, but heavy philanthropy and K-12 development in the state. Cool. And then Kevin? Hi, everyone. I'm Kevin. I do product and scholastic partnerships here at Twitch, uh, working on the Twitch student program. Uh, what we do is we help universities institutionalize gaming and esports on their campuses. And yeah, thanks for having me. Awesome. So um, as we all know, you know, quarantine has affected, um, you know, a lot of people, especially the um, esports industry, but for collegiate esports, it's been, you know, a mix and match. There's been a lot of good things that have been happening, a lot of, you know, not so great things that have been happening, a lot of things that we have to kind of adapt to, right? Um, so one of the first questions I want to ask um, is kind of under the topic of the effect of COVID on, um, on each of you guys. So, um, you know, like you guys all come from different parts of the collegiate esports ecosystem. Um, what are the biggest ways that you've seen quarantine affect your part of the collegiate um, esports uh, uh, scene, I guess? And um, just to give you guys some background, um, you know, Ryan comes from, uh, Ryan, I'd like to hear a little bit about the student background from you. Uh, mm -hmm. Mike, I'd love to hear about like how it's affected administration. I know like we've had a lot of, um, you know, conversations off camera about that. Bobby, you've worked a ton with brands. I think in the past, you've also worked with Red Bull, right? Um, you know, obviously a lot of those activations have changed. And um, Kevin, you have a really good overview of like the overall ecosystem as well as, you know, how, how Twitch has been really popping because of um, everybody being inside and looking for things to do. Um, so we'd love to hear a little bit about um, how that's affected uh, you guys. But let's start with um, Ryan, since, uh, you know, students are at the core of everything we do. So I'd love to hear how it's affected you guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, disclaimer, I did, I, or like I said earlier, I graduated yeah, yeah, in yeah, May, yeah. so I'm not like as well versed in how people are preparing now for the upcoming semester, although mm -hmm. I'm still kind of involved with my uh, old college, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, being the events coordinator for a college group when the entire on-campus events are canceled kind of sucks. <laughs> we had planned, or like, and, uh, like many other colleges, we had a big LAN event planned and had to cancel that. We also had a collaboration event with the uh, spring concert, which was canceled, so we had to cancel that. And just some other things in development that we didn't really get to do because uh, at the start of spring break, they said, don't come back to campus. <laughs> uh, and everything became remote. So it pretty much ended up being a lot of like just canceling plans and figuring out how we can move remotely. Now, granted, in this space, a lot of stuff is online already. Uh, a lot of colleges are using Discord and Twitch to do events, uh, simple, um, like smaller events with just party games and things, and also streaming bigger events, which now, instead of having the event be local and streamed online, it's kind of all online. Yeah. And there's also... One of the bigger things that I've seen is the groups kind of like mine that have sprung up from this uh, intercollegiate game network was originally started as a response to all the colleges being like, well, we had to cancel our big LAN event and now we don't have any kind of big event to promote for this semester. So uh, mm -hmm. Rachel Cronson from uh, CMU started it and messaged a bunch of people being like, hey, do you want to do a big Discord event? And we ended up getting I think it's it was like over 2,000 people joining the Discord in a few nice. weeks and then getting a bunch of panel people to come, a bunch of people to stream events, do a little bit of charity work, 
and a bunch of raffles and it was really kind of a a big event for everyone to come together when they couldn't have anything on campus themselves so it was it was big pooling of resources basically because everyone's like well i got this but i can't use it at our event anymore so you guys can use it um kind of ended up being that and a big uh networking drive as well yeah and we'll definitely dive a little bit more into icgn and um, what you guys have been doing there's been a lot of online communities popping up um we'll probably talk about the next segment but um you know i'd love to hear like moving from students to uh, direct administration, Mike, I'd love to hear about how um, the administration has been affected. Um, you know, obviously it's changed views on esports. Um, you know, would love to hear your perspective. Absolutely. So Ryan put out a lot of uh, really good stuff as things that are echoed almost on every campus as ways to evolve in this landscape. And so on the administrative side, um, naturally COVID, er, COVID is amplifying the magnitude of potential inside of gaming and esports communities. And uh, whether it's a student organization or an administrative uh, directive, it is elevating more awareness as we see traditional sports programs now getting reduced a little bit, as well as student life programming on everybody's campus. Um, in general, just um, activations that are happening outside of each individual colleges. So College of Engineering can't program as much for their own student life needs for their big pool of students. So this is naturally putting a lot of attention on these other topics to find innovation for um, you know, ways to sustain some kind of business model. I hate to use the word revenue, but it matters when we talk about the business of keeping things running um, in tandem with trying to stay sensitive to the cultural needs and the climate on the campus. And this is where this has created a, a really strong opportunity for both really successful program elevation and also the exact opposite with very dismal support for, for it because now esports is a knee-jerk reaction topic versus a strategic development um, that had you know planning ramping up to it. Now it's like, what can we do? COVID, we don't want to furlough, we don't want to, we don't want to fire people. So let's just do esports. And instead of defining what that is, they just say do something. And um, yeah, it can it can spark uh, the fire to build something of substance, mm -hmm. but we also see it equally spark that and then be completely. Um, conceived differently, where they talk about focusing purely on the revenue stream instead of the heartbeat of the culture of gamers and and the diversity of the of the people inside of it, because um, they think that it's a lot of a lot of times gamers can be defined as a singular term. Well, you know, FPS versus MOBA, two completely different demographics. Right. Madden versus Animal Crossing, also two different completely demographics, and it's just like saying human. You know, it's it's different. You know, it, there's so much diversity opportunity which is also a pretty big narrative on almost every single campus right now, especially with the social uh, issues that have been across the globe in the last quarter um, in regards to how do we create opportunities for equity building and inclusion. And mm -hmm. so for us specifically at OU, this has helped us elevate the topic in regards to looking at other ways of creating curriculum branches and also further development and support of student programming, intramural spin-ups and alignments with those same narratives um, that are focused on growing community, looking at it from the mental health aspect of things to keep students engaged and still feel like they're part of a community despite the physical distancing. Right, awesome, yeah. Um, so talking a little bit, since you, you mentioned revenue, I want to go uh, to Bobby a little bit, because Bobby, so obviously like um, brands are usually those for, uh, those forms of revenue sponsorship uh, makes up you know the majority of the revenue streams for esports. Um, so Bobby, like how, how have you seen, um, not just in collegiate esports, but just overall brands reacting and um, changing their activations because of COVID? Yeah, so like one thing to remember is like, there's two aspects to COVID for when it comes to brands. Like it comes down to revenue, it comes down to targeting and advertising, seeing how we can creatively come up with like different ways to integrate a certain brand. Um, one thing to remember is like, there's certain brands that just can't participate. COVID was not only a issue of like people not being able to meet in person, but it was also an international foreign relations issue. A lot of these brands that have factories in China were not able to deliver their product in the US. So not only can they not market, they can't even sell their product digitally if someone orders it online. And like, that's something I think in consideration. So you have a lot of brands like MSI and HyperX and Cooler Master that just couldn't participate in interesting ways just because they just didn't have the bandwidth of the resources or the ability to convert any potential customer. Um, but when it comes to the other side of things, the companies that are taking advantage of the solution is all these companies that are now more focused on how do we create really in-depth um, activations by leveraging the fact that we're digital and we can do interesting things, such as DoorDash. So like I'm working with DoorDash right now 
and we're working on a January, January, December, like conference summit where literally in the chat, we're just dropping, um, dropping like free food to random and partnering with brands. So like we'll partner with, uh, Pizza Hut and Burger King and all these brands and just drop random foods. Like, Hey, respond with an emoji. And then like, because we already have their address, we know their home and we can just go up and just send them something right away while the event's happening. Um, another thing is like, how do we engage people and how do we not match the experience of a traditional conference or an event, but how do we even make it better? Because we have this aspect of digital that we can take and leverage. So doing like live action events where you can actually change screens and see different viewpoints a lot quicker and doing those types of act activations is what we've been looking at. Um, second half of COVID. So we're looking at like April now things are not end of April, not end of April, but end of, let's say probably June. Uh, we're looking at a boom. Stock prices are back up. Everyone has money to spend. Um, and we're looking at countless people trying to do activations in Collegiate. And it's been really exciting to see what creative ways people can like activate. There have been a few brands taking risks with in-person activations. Um, mm -hmm. I have not touched any of those activations by any yeah. means. But um, I, think, I think it's really exciting to see what not only brands are thinking of as a creative way to get engaged, but what colleges are pitching to us as brands of ways that we can do it. Like Cloud9 Watch Party, that was a great example of a really great activation that was like, and you guys had 10x reach because, why? Because everyone's at home. What, what else are we supposed to do? And like, it's a good opportunity for us to leverage something that wasn't respected before and actually make it a really good experience. And even post COVID have people come back just because right. They enjoyed it the first time and it wasn't something that we had the opportunity to showcase to people prior um but yeah i think like that's kind of like where brands are and like brands are just trying to also still figure things out like we equally yeah. don't know um, but i think also non-traditional brands think about like your uber eats or doordash uh more screaming tools logitech and stuff like that more than mm. your peripherals and like i think and like energy drinks that need to be in person right uh, right and so like i think that shift needs to happen uh, for colleges to like actually reach out to those brands as well but yeah gotcha cool um and then kevin obviously you have um you, you're kind of engaged in every facet of the collegiate esports ecosystem but also streaming has kind of taken center and front stage uh during covid because um you know the increase in users and stuff um can you tell us a little bit more um about you know your perspective on covid from twitch's point of view as well as twitch student um, yeah, I mean, there's no doubt to Bobby's point that streaming has become uh, has dramatically increased in terms of traffic and people being more at home. And uh, that's, you know, I guess like for us that we have it, we've been positively impacted uh, in terms of like, I guess, overall business growth. But um, in my line of work with Twitch student, it's been very, uh, obviously very crazy as a lot of universities are trying to figure out how to navigate uh, coronavirus. I don't think there's any and there's there's no one like every, every single school is having uh fires left and right so uh we we are emphasizing with that and trying to help universities build a digital experience for these students who are going back into the school year uh with no on campus experience so trying to find a way uh for students to get a lot of value out of their gaming esports program when they're when a vast majority of that is kind of uh canceled mm -hmm. Um, some things I wanted to kind of bring up, um, you know, I think Bobby, uh, we had a conversation, um, you know, before about how, um, we're seeing like the lowest levels of enrollment or lo a lot of students are looking to take a gap year. Um, do you, is that still, and if, I guess like that was like a couple months ago, like in the summer, but do you, is that still, do you know if like that's still um, going on or yeah. like what's going on? Yeah. So, so something that you have to think about is like we chatted about that a few months and now school started last week at a lot yeah. of campuses across the country. Oh. Uh, main thing is your international students are not there mm. anymore, mm -hmm. um, which is a huge revenue driver for most universities. Mm -hmm. And that's something to be worried about. But for example, most state schools are pretty, pretty much equal, if not like probably under 5% enrollment. Um, mm -hmm. And your only issues are going to be your mega schools like your UT Austin's and stuff like that, that will see a significant drop um, in a gap year. And then also your smaller high tier schools like Harvard and Stanford that are going to yeah. take the drop because they don't want to admit students that are, that they denied previously. And so I don't think it's as much of an issue because those students are still in the same communities online digitally. And they have access to those. 
So from a brand and an esports perspective, I see no change whatsoever moving forward. I think um, one interesting, I don't know, um, Ryan, what, um, I know you just graduated. I don't know um, if you have any friends that are, um, you know, still, uh, still like going through that or like if, if you've had any friends who wanted to take a gap year, but I, I would be um, super interested yeah. in seeing like the effect of, you know, we, obviously those people are, are probably going to end up coming back to school. So I definitely see like after COVID, it's possible that like, um, you know, we, we see a bit of a decline then suddenly like a sudden explosion. And I'd, I'd really be interested in like brands taking advantage of that. But have you seen um, the effects of that um, yourself, like among your student population or, um, you know, uh, yeah, I guess what, what's your what's your thoughts on that the gap year thing? Uh, I know a few friends that have taken a gap year like mm. long before any of this kind of happened. Uh, mm. So it's kind of on a case by case basis of if you find that it'd be helpful for you personally. I uh, never really considered it cause, just because of um, kind of how I had my whole plan going. Uh, of course, COVID got in the way of that, but it's too late to do a gap year. So <laughs> uh, I have seen some mentions of uh, kind of suggestions to take a gap year this year or to do some other alternative. Like um, if you do, because a lot of the a lot of the college experience comes from being there, physically being there right. on the campus. And uh, a lot of the cost comes into that too. So when you're in these situations where a lot of people are going exclusively online, some of the suggestions has been to try to go to a community college or some kind of cheaper college for a year. Uh, and the, I, I guess that kind of, that would def I don't know exactly how that would affect the esports side of things for the colleges, but um, yeah. I've definitely seen that where there's kind of suggestion of a gap year or just yeah. going to a different cheaper college. And I think it will, it will also probably like affect um, a lot of people who like want to have like, you know, walk for graduation. Um, I don't know if that affected you, but like, I know like yeah. some people say like, Oh, let's do like a graduation on Roblox or something. And it's just like, I didn't pay like 40 hey. or something over four years. I, I don't know what, what part would graduation. be good for that, but yeah. I, I can talk about our Minecraft graduation if the, if there's a good point for that. It, I can tell yeah. you it went very well. I think Ryan, like, awesome. like Ryan, what you're doing with I, IGCN, like and like what you guys are doing there, that's kind of the point, right? Like, it doesn't matter if you dropped out, you're you can still be involved in communities like that, right? Mm. Like, since everything's digital and it's not tied to that school university email, since no school takes us seriously yet fully, or some schools do, but like those things are still accessible by even students that drop to a community college. Like I have maybe yeah, yeah. 20 friends that took a gap year this year and probably another 20 that went to a community college just so because it's the same experience. And like, there's definitely a lot of resources still. Yeah. Available. It's still on the discord channel of their original school. Like nothing's going to change. Yeah. The, the, the challenge that schools are facing right now, because, uh, a vast majority of how these schools uh, make their money is that online, I'm sorry, that uh, in-person experience that is now no longer a thing. So then you have, you have the internet now in the last like 15 years that, that changed the way society operates and how these kind of relationships are being formed. And so the power of discord internet, you can tap in and, and really save yourself a ton of money while learning a lot of the other things online through YouTube, Udemy and Coursera, any other like types of online learning platforms that, Honestly, a, a lot of these schools aren't equipped to have the same ecosystem as the Udemy, Coursera, and such. And so the value of paying, let's say, $40,000 a year to go to an out-of-state school is not really viable anymore uh, for, uh, not even during, during this era. So that's kind of why we see this shift in people taking gap years because they're like, if I'm just doing online classes, then I'm just going to go do online classes. Yeah, and we... The, yeah. Yeah, and we've seen that in like companies as well, where like um, people are like, you know what, let's just like do remote even after COVID, you know, um, just like a shit, like it's just like forced a shift in how we kind of, um, uh, yeah, I guess it's shifted like the way we traditionally do things, you know, like the traditional like put on a tie, go to work kind of thing. That's kind of being like really shaken up. Um, so like since we're talking about like um, you know, how things are overall changing. Um, let's talk a little bit about the innovations during COVID. So um, what are the most interesting and impactful ways you've seen the collegiate esports ecosystem innovate during um, COVID? And um, 
you know, we can start that off, like talking a little bit more about um, ICGN, ICGN, and you guys can just like uh, come in uh, whenever, um, you know, based on what you've seen. Yeah, sure. Uh, I don't want to talk too long, so just stop yeah, no if it's get too crazy. But um, yeah, so Intercollegiate Game Network or ICGN, mm -hmm. uh, we started, like I mentioned, in uh, I think it was early March that Rachel kind of started messaging everyone. Mm -hmm. And the main idea of it was, hey, you all had to cancel your big LAN events. Mm -hmm. So why don't we do we and why don't we do a big online event together? Mm -hmm. And therefore the uh, intercollegiate game night was born. And then it went very well, had a ton of people, uh, a full uh, it wasn't 24 hour Twitch stream, but it was it was a pretty long Twitch stream with a bunch of people that we featured, big panels, all the, the full nine yards. Um, and then after it, we're like, well, we have this big server and we have a bunch of people that are still interested in helping out. So what do we do now? Um, and a few of us that were in leadership at the time said like, why don't we keep going? Um, mm -hmm. Keep doing what we're doing, foster an area for uh, an area for resources in the collegiate Esports space, um, continue doing panels, uh, game nights, giving people positions where they can learn and grow in their field. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because I don't know if uh, I don't know if we'll get to that part, but this, but a lot of the collegiate esports space is a huge area to just learn. Um, if you're doing graphic design, social media, mm -hmm. you don't have to just be a player. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, you can be, and you know, if you're great, then props to you. You're probably better than me at Overwatch, but. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we've been going for a few months now, and yeah, you guys have done like panels. You've done like game nights. Mm -hmm. I know like a lot of people. Like I, I don't know any like um, way that I would have met like Team Liquid people or like online <laughs> people. Or, yeah, like, there's like, something like that came up. You know, so uh, there's a like, lot of people there. Discord, you know? I was I was surprised when there are people joining. Like, oh, we have Discord staff in here. Can yeah. can we get partner? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah there's, I, it's, I can it's, tell you from, um, oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, I can tell you Very from good. a brand side, like, uh, ICGN was like the vanguard for like all these, like you see like, um, people like Sab who are, um, you know, creating these, um, um, like EG's discord, you know, all the, I, I can tell you that, uh, ICGN was definitely like the, it was almost like you guys are sacrificing yourselves for <laughs> us. Like we're like, we're, we don't, we don't have like, I guess the, we're not brave enough to try this on our own day. <laughs> these students, a lot of these like innovations come from students, but like, um, you know, like we're going to let them try it and end up being a huge success and just like create this wave of um, online activations and people really investing in discord. Cause I think a lot of people are just like, you know what, it's COVID. We're just not, we're just going to like dip out, you know? Yeah. Um, I think you guys really started that way. So like props to you, but I know Mike has also um, at university of Oklahoma, you have, uh, you just did a make a wish foundation tournament. Um, do you see, like, I, obviously tell us a little bit more about that, but um, do you think make a wish foundation, like started diving into esports because of COVID or do you, were, were those conversations and interests were already there? So first and foremost, like when we first founded the organization, I first vetted that first round of, of leadership. Mm -hmm. um, culturally, I instilled a heart of philanthropy as a core fundamental of how we will do all things. Any default idea that we can't fill, we fill it with philanthropy as a means to give back and advocate. Plus it helps us kind of defeat and, and combat against some of the stereotypes of gamers not being contributors. Mm -hmm. Um, right off the bat. And, it, and it's just a real good feel, uh, feel good moment that you can't really describe until you've had it. Right. And so the Make-A-Wish League of Legends tournament that we did uh, was purely for Oklahoma directly. And so the way that their organization is structured is they have a global initiative, national initiative, and then regional initiatives. And so there's an Oklahoma, Texas, Oklahoma, California, and so forth, or Make-A-Wish Oklahoma and all, and all those things. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> at the time, you know, obviously it's summer intercession. Um, this was a July event. And we just wanted a way to one give back and also just do something like we all had zoom burnout. We all had meeting burnout. We all have burnouts about meetings about meetings. Um, you know, it's, it's just got old and say, let's, let's go do what we, we came together for in the first place and just go play. Yeah. And then it just takes a little bit of effort to get that off the ground because um, historically we've had that pr production house in house. We've had, TOs in League of Legends for three years and partnered with one of the biggest local um, tournament, organizi torgani tournament organizers in League of Legends in the state and region, Get Wrecked. And so we brought their expertise in their community for advocacy and marketing. And then we tapped your shoulder for HyperX inclusion right. to incentivize it. And then we spawned $2,000 out of thin air oh, wow. for kids in our backyard. Yeah. And uh, that was beautiful. Everyone felt great. And the competition was lighthearted and friendly. And the broadcast was great and streamlined and professional. 
And so speaking to the Make-A-Wish energy is they had a global initiative called Stream for the Wishes. Um, and so, and that was a global initiative. So every single um, division of Make-A-Wish across the state level or regional level or so forth was given basically branding, verbiage, legal you know, guidelines and everything on how to activate inside of that, leveraging influencer style streaming, very similar to what we see with Extra Life culturally as a global initiative. Now, Make-A-Wish and, and things like Extra Life and these charitable events are all suffering too as we primarily focus on the social injustice topics of quarter two and moving into people legitimately being furloughed, laid off, and having um, financial burden issues. And so naturally, a byproduct of that is also going to be hospitals and those that are taking care of kids that are terminally ill or have been dealt in a series, uh, 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 unfortunate series of cards and just need a little bit of support further. And so there's plenty of things that we can all contribute to. Um, but for us, the focus has always been keep it local, take care of our own backyard. And if everybody did that, then collectively we would all be much better versus looking at national campaigns where we can't see where the money is going to impact. And we know very well that these kids are probably somebody within my students' families or within the community of my neighbors and, and these things. And that's, that's kind of the focus with that. So Make-A-Wish Oklahoma had not utilized that activation from the global campaign that kicked off in quarter three of 2019. Mm -hmm. And so they used this as a means to finally explore it because they just didn't know where to start and they weren't reaching out. And so because of that culture we instilled, we had a student reach out just to see if Make-A-Wish would be interested only to find that campaign and create this opportunity. And then the student owned the entire execution. The oh. only thing that I did was help kind of design the overlays and make sure that the logos were included and then creating the after action article to satisfy the needs of that sponsorship, mm -hmm. um, which was also a very big moment of pride because mm -hmm. students are executing in the things that they're passionate about mm -hmm. and they understand that philanthropic heart and why it is so essential, especially right now when we have plenty of people in our own neighborhoods that need help. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I've seen a lot of the stuff that you obviously like I've, I've known about y'all's program for a while and you guys always like um, dish out some really quality stuff, really impressed. Like you guys give um, like students the opportunity to really like own those roles, you know, it's not like overbearing or anything. No. It's totally yeah. like, I think your relationship with the students, exactly how every, um, how every university should be handling the relationship with students. But, um, you know, talking more about social change, I know Kevin, um, like during the COVID period, I obviously, I don't know how long, um, uh, y'all's thing has been wait um uh, seeing okay yeah the meeting got upgraded apparently um yeah so kevin um uh, uh can you tell us a little bit about um community and what you guys are doing with hbcus um you know, obviously that's something that's really recent i don't know if that's because of covid but um i know that's something that, that a lot of people are really excited about um can you tell us a little bit more about that yeah, so Community with an X is a nonprofit that we decided to partner with back in, uh, I think it was April. Wow, time flies. Yeah. Um, the X stands for uh, the keyboard and console all share the same letter X, and that's the accessibility. Uh, it, that's the little hint of accessibility that's needed. And X is also uh, a, a definition for uh, Latinx and like other types of uh, people of color and people of minority. And so that has, that, that's why the X is there, just so to give some context. That's and amazing, so, by the way. Yeah. yeah, we started working with them in April because we just like really got along with their team. Uh, their founding team is uh, incredible. Um, and we started raising money for Divide to, to, for students at HBCUs to continue their education from home through internet access and devices. We think we did like $200,000 in that like oh. month. And then from there, um, we were able to kind of come together and kind of formulate a long-term strategy with which student. And so we announced the HBCU Esports League where we're partnering with them to running the first ever HBCU Esports League uh, with now uh, building pipe, uh, pipelines to uh, one, uh, give HBCUs uh, students uh, a, a competitive platform, but also work on ways to uh, help HBCUs build official game and esports programs. So there's more to that that's in the works. Um, and then at the same time, we're also working with HBCU student leaders to help them build awesome clubs, just like how we've been able to experience it here at, uh, in, 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 in what makes Collegiate Esports great is like through the student clubs and the grassroots movement. So it's a top-down, bottom-up approach. Um, there will be, uh, I can't announce too much since it's still being in yeah. development, but I think overall, like the, the three pillars that we've always worked on, uh, 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 we've always uh, that we've always leaned on was community, career, and competition through inclusivity, inclusivity, diversity, and collaboration, and now equity. 
Um, and I think uh, this is a way to do it. And the reason why we got involved is because um, um, the Black community has, uh, through through IGDA, the Black uh, the IGDA research, uh, Black community index about 83% of them play play video games, and about only 18% of them make up the professional workforce in the gaming esports industry. And so, uh, whereas uh, the white community has an index of 71%, but make up a higher majority of that side. So the goal is to then uh, build uh, uh, some sort of system to help uh, close that gap uh, in some way, shape or form. So there's a lot of different ways to go about it. Uh, we actually have the first ever streaming one-on-one class at Johnson C. Smith University mm -hmm. and Howard University uh, starting next month. And so oh, those awesome. are uh, ways to then outside of the competitive space, we're working on education and curriculum and actual accreditation that is uh, super exciting to us. Awesome. Yeah, really excited for uh, you know, what comes next for you guys. Um, I guess, Bobby, like, um, you know, obviously like uh, brands, I think we've already talked a little bit about how brands are innovating. Um, I guess like for Bobby and, and just like it's kind of open to everybody else. Like, what are some other like really exciting ways you've seen, um, you know, the collegiate esports uh, ecosystem kind of change um, during COVID? You know, like with all, the, all these online activations. Um, I, I mean, some things that come to mind personally. Um, I think uh, SFSU um, ended up holding like the West Valorant tournament, which got hosted by the Team Liquid, um, you know, official stream. Um, so I see a lot of these like. The, there's been like a, a huge explosion of uh, online leagues that have been like totally student run, like um, SEI, Southern Esports Invitational. Um, I know there's like um, a couple other ones in the South where they're just, um, because these teams like don't have a lot of like tournaments to go to or don't have a lot of people to play with, they're just like creating these big regional leagues that I've never seen before. Um, I think it does have to do with like the changing dynamics of like the old entities that usually held these tournaments. And um, I think there's like probably like a little bit more of a gap in, I don't want to say power, but there's like a, some kind of void that people are rushing to fill. But I guess um, Bobby and anyone who, who yeah. else, anyone else who wants to join in on that, uh, you know, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think, I think the biggest thing, like speaking from brand side is like just mm -hmm. willingness to try new things, right? So like given the time, we don't know what, what the heck to do, like period, right? And like, mm -hmm. so when a school comes to us with a plan, we're willing to do it more than ever before. And like the willingness to cooperate between multiple brands is also new. Like imagine like Twitch and DoorDash and like three other brands working together on a campaign. Mm -hmm. The accessibility in order to get into these doors has never been lower, right? Mm -hmm. Given because everyone's willing to try new things, do new things. And those relationships are going to last far past COVID. And we're going to be continuing to do digital activations between esports teams, uh, food brands, like mm -hmm. whatever, like streaming platforms, whatever mm -hmm. else. And that's the exciting thing to see. I think like if you're someone that is a student that wants to do this in the future, like now is the time to start your league, start your, start your org, start your Discord ch uh, channel. Um, mm -hmm. start building, start developing things in the space because people are more than happy to open the door right now because they're kind of open to anything since mm -hmm. we'll, we'll bite if it works for us, right? If, it, if, it's, mm -hmm. if incentives are aligned, we're going to do it. And I think um, that's the biggest, now is the biggest opportunity to try something new and do something different. Um, and I just want everybody to know that, yeah. Yeah, and um, I think one thing, uh, one interesting thing you, I think you told me once was uh, um, there's also like the value of online advertising, like Facebook ads and stuff like that. That's, um, I think at the time you said, um, like the value of that is, is just like crazy right now. So like mm -hmm. where some doors are open, like some doors are also shut just because, you know, like no, almost nothing can beat the conversion rate of, you know, so I, I don't know if that still applies or what your it's, thoughts are. On. It's going away. Um, okay. I think like that is true to some extent, like, yes, your, your data is going to look great. I think the more important thing there is though because of the times more people are bullish than ever and like kind of ignoring that type of stuff given the times and so you need as a brand we need to activate on a community driven level period like we need to be fully immersed into the conversation like for example like uh, at red bull we did this crate drop experiment years ago when i was working there and it was pretty much like a fake parachute with a large crate of red bull in the middle of a college campus we can totally change that up and activate it like if it was a PUBG drop, for example, right? And like a great drop in that game or Fortnite or whatever. Like that's an integrated campaign that people are going to remember. Yeah, to that's awesome. Post, right? I definitely remember if I came on my class and saw that. Yeah, that'd be <laughs> sick. Right? And like, 
Facebook ads just aren't going to do that for you. Like I, I can run that once I can spend like, yes, $10,000. I'm not going to be able to track it, but I'm going to get a hundred user generated content posts. I'm going to get tons of people that are probably by Red Bull. will know the product. will know how it tastes. And that's going to be a, a significant change. And the issue is the only brands that can do that are the bigger brands. Right. And so they're only ones that have the privilege of running experiments and, maybe losing money on an idea. And so that's something that you have to think about as well as like when you're pitching these ideas, do, does that company have the resources to go and try something? And now that's coming in the digital world. Like how does a DoorDash do that? How does like drops in the Twitch stream, uh, cash up, cash up. They're great. They're like free money, free money. Right. And like, that's, that's what they're known for. And that's what they do. And like, they do that in Twitch channels and like, like the top contributors cash up on like some big streamers. That's awesome. And like, I think people are trying to figure out these innovative ways and those things are just going to stick. Uh, and like Facebook ads don't work for most brands or bigger brands anymore. So, gotcha. um, yeah. Um, so, uh, do, do you guys, uh, do the rest of you guys have anything um, you guys like thought was um, like super interesting, like super interesting things that you've seen come out of COVID or, um, you know, open for? I want to chime in here and talk about a little bit of the things that I wish I wasn't seeing as a byproduct okay. of it. Um, so we have a lot of both endemic brands and non-endemic brands in the space kind of activating. And that's, that's all a good thing because we obviously need more visibility on this topic continue to elevate the scene. But we also at the university administrative level and not just, you know, OU or any other specific college that I'm referencing, but we do have a lot of players coming into the space that feel like their their expertise in another industry is purely um, what's going to make them the strong ass, asset for them to partner with for you know spending university funds to get something going instead of taking the time to empower students and empower faculty and staff that are already on campuses and allowing them to build something that is uniquely important and potent to the culture that pre-exists in our campus. N nobody can fault a school like UC Irvine, for instance. You know, everybody knows who they are. Everybody knows uh, Mark Deppie and Kathy Chang and uh, amazing, you know, additions and, and cornerstones to the foundation have launched multiple programs. But it's not a cookie cutter reference. It's not something that you can employ or deploy somewhere else and just expect it to be successful without massaging it to cater it to the specific cultures on your campus. I am in a giant cow pasture, for instance. I'm, the, I'm in Oklahoma. And so culturally, I don't have the same resources that I would have as if I was in Irvine, California. And there's a lot of administrators that are now obviously exploring this topic and, and diving in this too, again, as a knee-jerk reaction versus a strategic development opportunity to really kind of elevate the champions that they already have within their own walls because they don't bear a title of PhD or because they don't bear a title of, of being on a bankroll or, or being on the payroll already. And that's a huge oversight because yes, that could theoretically be a savings in cost if you wanted to look at it from revenue and spin up costs. But what you're actually doing is, is empowering and building the equity of your campus and, and making students have the opportunity, not making, providing them the opportunity of, of investing themselves and taking ownership of it with guidance and mentorship to build something that's truly unique to that campus that will inspire other students and prospective transfers of wanting to be a part of it versus here's this really polished thing that is kind of intimidating to gamers of introverted nature who see this giant kind of titan come out of nowhere that has no tie-ins and no representation of student population, of student leadership, of grassroots energies, of the things that they have known prior to this stage um, as a recruitment tool. So you have universities that obviously dive hardcore into varsity development and then they focus on recruitment and that's it. Whereas what's going to elevate and tell that story? Why not looking at production in journalistic and communication degree, you know, students, you all, we all have taught a lot of those energies. We all have business degrees. We all have typically something in advertising and marketing. And these are all organic and logical ways of building actual scholastic mission to incentivize coming to this campus and subscribing to this alma mater and what they're providing as their, as their unique experience, regardless of a physicality state or a virtual one. So as part of the innovation by, you know, innovation product byproduct opportunities, this is where the, the academic components on campus can now look at this topic and say, well, you already have students that have been executing in, in production and we teach, you know, creative media production and we teach broadcast and journalism in that way photography, videography, sensibilities, fine arts for creating themes for a stream. These are all ways of organically tying in 
our expertise on the playground that is a college campus in the topic of esports when we look at the entire industry as the objective, not just a siloed topic of thinking that this is the viral component that's going to make us stand aside. Many universities now have esports. It's never truly ever been about having esports. It's yeah. always been about what you're doing with it. And I think um, one thing that I always tell students, I think like with the, well, we, we talked about how many new entities are joining, are, are coming into the esports ecosystem. I think whereas, um, you know, the, the business side has kind of opened up, the, the school side has almost closed down a little bit just because they, they're getting hit with so many requests and stuff like that. That's, they're kind of almost not trusting people. So like the three things that like if any students are watching, like the three things I always look for are um, do I see a Twitch student logo um, or like, is there some relationship between them? Like, is it Twitch student approved or whatever? Um, is it run by student lead, like former student leaders, you know, um, or people who have been student organizers? Um, and those are like the two, I guess the two big things that I, t and also the, the third biggest thing I look for is, um, you know, are they, do they have a relationship with the organizers or are they going straight to administration? Because administration is right. typically the newer um, set. But um, in terms of innovations, I don't know, Kevin, if you want to mention anything, but I know um, with like music festivals kind of going down and stuff like that, um, you know, Twitch has been pushing like music, um, music concerts, like virtual music concerts. I don't know if um, you want to talk a little bit about that or anything else that you see that, um, that you think is really cool that's coming out because of quarantine. Uh, so like innovative things that are happening in this industry because of COVID. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think, I think a lot of, for, I was able to connect with more people because of COVID. Um, I was able because I'm not. I think COVID has made it so that you have to go online, and therefore people who can't afford to go to these types of events can now connect with people in the industry a lot easier, as a lot of these teams these organizations are building online presence now that can then create this uh, team or like organization or whatever directly to uh, the community, uh, which is like super dope. You, you would have to like, shell, you don't have to shell out a couple hundred dollars to go to an event plus hotel plus airfare and all those things anymore. I think that level of access accessibility is critical uh, moving forward and that should not go away. Uh, that, should that should continue to uh, sustain itself uh, because it's super cost efficient for everybody. Um, Two is on the on the music side. Uh, I was able to work with the music team for a couple months uh, after they signed the deal with SoundCloud. Um, it was really cool to. I think one of the most uh, one of the most awesome thing I worked on was uh, I think his name was DJ Martin. I forgot his last name, but he kind of did his whole entire DJ set uh, for like six hours in the middle of an empty football stadium, as if it was like a real yeah. crowd, and um, it was raining too. And he was just there for six hours by himself. And he he peaked like forty thousand viewers, and yeah, he just like it. act, and he, and then he used Twitch chat as a way to say like, hey, we filled out the entire stadium, because it it held only like th it held like thirty five thousand people capacity. So he said like, oh, we're beyond capacity on stream. So I thought it was pretty funny. Yeah. Um, stuff like that is like really creative, and that's what makes people stand out. Um, on terms of like industry wide movement stuff, um, I've been been really keeping up outside of like, um outside of mostly putting out fires when it comes to how to you know how universities are building online presence and online engagements right now because again like i said before um there are la there are, a lot of these schools are lagging behind on infrastructure to be able to do this i think the only way that's that professors have an online ecosystem right now uh, correct me if i'm wrong is through like canvas and like blackboard Yep. And that's not as good as Udemy, Coursera, and YouTube, and uh, and all the these other learning platforms. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's kind of been their biggest challenge. Um, it's like innovative stuff. Uh, we did some, yeah, we did some streaming scholarships, and we were able to like work with a couple of students that actually are killing it on Twitch. So it's super cool to see. Like, uh, I met a student that we worked with that uh, I think he just cleared like six thousand dollars last month in Twitch revenue. Oh, wow. Nice. Um, yeah. that's like a ton of money doing that part-time streaming Minecraft. And it wasn't even esports. It was just like, mm -hmm. I just like making content. I'm just at home. And this little uh, piece of like, we, we helped them with like onboarding and like some guides on how to start on Twitch. And then the kid just like ran with it. So mm -hmm. I think these types of journeys are like really cool to see. And like, um, and then 
lastly, we're looking at cloud gaming solutions uh, as well to, um, again, not everyone can take a streaming course because of the $1,000 paywall, uh, depending on what you're streaming. And mm-hmm. so we're looking at like different cloud gaming solutions to be able to give licenses out to universities to give out to students who are taking these classes. So yeah, more think- on that later, but um, yeah. yeah, that's kind of, that's awesome. kind of it. Cool. Um, yeah, I think another like uh, thing I just wanted to mention real quick. Um, I think like baseball, like the um, this MLB, right? The MLB has been like uh, pushing pretty hard hard towards uh, esports. I think they're putting a lot of they're trying to put a lot of money into the whole esports scene as well. Um, that's just something like interesting that I that I saw. Um, obviously, MLB is like the fastest aging. Um, uh, major like mainstream sport, so I can definitely see why like they would be the first to like really push hard. Um, but obviously, like the NFL has done stuff with Twitch as well, which is really yeah. exciting. But yeah, um, but um, I guess moving on to a, uh, another topic. Um, so online events weren't always the staple in the past, even though um, the majority of the community was housed there. Um, you know, mainly Discord. Since quarantine, the majority of events have shifted to Discord. Are online events a permanent expansion of the collegiate? Um, organization properties or do you think it's a temporary measure do you think like obviously we've innovated and grown this whole discord events online thing um a lot but do you think it's a permanent addition like is it going to be live events and discord events or do you think the moment live events comes back on everyone's going to shift uh back and i guess um i'll give that question to ryan first just uh because um you know you're most recently a student um obviously this affects icgn um because a lot of your stuff is purely like obviously it's difficult maybe you guys can have a meet meet up at pax but oh um, i would love to (laughs) Uh, (laughs) when it's safe to Yeah. yeah um yeah i definitely think uh there's definitely effect of a lot of people are definitely more aware of the many online tools that are available to uh, enhance online events. Like, I'm sure there's plenty of people that did not know what Zoom was before this, uh, or people that didn't know what Discord was before everything happened, or maybe even didn't know what Twitch was until a bunch of um, stuff started getting moved to Twitch. So there's definitely, I see in-person events when it becomes safe to do so, they will definitely come back in full force, but a lot of people now are more aware of the accessibility that online offers. A lot of people just can't go. Uh, I forget who had mentioned it earlier, but, uh, or I think it was Kevin that said like, oh, you know, if to going to a person, uh, especially at something like a college campus where you're mainly focused on the people at that college, depending on, I guess, what group is working with it, um, they, they'll definitely try to do it in person. But it, if you want something like, between multiple colleges um, or that affects many colleges like uh, conferences or something like that, there's definitely a undeniable case for having an online portion of it that increases the accessibility for it and allows a lot more people to, <clears throat> sorry, to get involved uh, with the event and the content that you're trying to share. Gotcha. Yeah, so yeah, I, I would like to see because right now, um, I think a, a big part of collegiate, like why um, there hasn't been as much money as we'd like to see, like in collegiate investing in the community is just because of like a lack of properties almost. Like um, we do have live events, um, you know, obviously we see arenas growing and stuff like that, but just like the more the more things that are sponsorable, the, the more valuable that overall package is, right? Um, I don't know if Kevin and Bobby, and I, I think Mike, um, Mike's blacked out, but- I'm uh, still here. Oh, okay, cool. Um, yeah, I don't know what y- y'all's thoughts are on that. Um, I know Mike, you're doing some great things in Oklahoma. Um, Kevin, uh, you know, Kevin, you're, um, you, you have that overall like 9,000 foot view or whatever. And, um, you know, Bobby, you've also um, worked on this. So I guess just like uh, whoever wants to, to jump in on this. I'll, I'll get going and I'll speak I'll speak at least to my experience with other universities and I apologize if my camera cuts out I'm still here yeah, but um, yeah. uh, so I think for OU because of the amount of infrastructure we've built in regards to what we've done for the last four years and empowering students and look at my camera acting up I was gonna kill that um, so with with all that that's done you know we can stand the test of time I think you know with COVID's ramp up we already had plenty of energy built into online development and then post COVID, we already had plenty of develop, you know, energy built into sustainment in a physical capacity. So COVID really was kind of a test of that 
idea and that strategy. And it's just showing that I think the only thing that we really truly lost um, is that we do 51 weeks of programming smash weeklies. And now we obviously can't do that, but everything else could have evolved. Um, now there are energies doing smash online, but we all know Nintendo's net code isn't ideal. So um, <laughs> to say the least, but that's only one program that was, that was really kind of significantly impacted. Everything else was able to convert online. Is it ideal? No, but is it work? Absolutely. And it still caters to a lot of what we're seeing statistically, not uniformly, but you statistically have high levels of Gen Z who do have, and gamers that are obviously socially awkward or have more introverted nature. And so online speaks to them and allows them to be a part of something and, and aligned with something that is going to make it last post COVID because it absolutely is essential. Every university struggles with trying to create programming that will entice students to leave their dorms, you know, to, to come out, to actually utilize the services on campuses, whether it's intramurals or, you know, student life engagement programming or whatnot. Um, and then we also start talking about, you know, international students, which obviously is, is a hot topic in general, but um, even when we were, uh, pre-COVID and, and the, the controversy of all that regulation changes, international students would attend events. And that's also a big thing that has research in it in regards to a lot of international students never making friends outside of the context of their own culture or peers that come to the same campus um, because it's such a different uh, community in a different world. And so this language of gaming and esports transcends so many different barriers that the lessons that can be learned about uh, development at a university, online uh, presence and things like this can almost all point to a gaming community and almost always point to the history of gaming, especially when we started going online um, in you know late 90s, early 2000s with you know, Battle.net and everything else was really kind of that it can thrive this way and it, it, it just it can live without this. And so for a lot of the younger generation converting to Zoom wasn't foreign to it. You know, it wasn't that at all. They were having Discord watch parties already. They were on Ventrilo in the mid-2000s. They were on TeamSpeak forever. And so it's not like we were thrown into a world we didn't know. But the administration level, who is not part of that same generation, obviously has, strugg has struggled to wrap its head around and then develop tools of engagement, which engagement is the part that's missing the most. How do I actually engage? Sure, we can do Zoom. And, you th and at the beginning of COVID, a lot of administrators learned really quickly that there's tons more that needs to be done versus just creating an online presence. Um, it had to be marketed, it had to be developed, you had to foster communication and engagement, you had to make it fun, um, and you had to, to, to let go of some of the traditional norms of, of what you would expect in re representation. You know, Maybe a professor or a faculty member needed to spice up their background and bring a little bit more of their own personal character out to help engage um, and then we start talking about K through 12 and that short yeah. extent attention span on top of it. So I think that it, it, that there's plenty of elements that will sustain past the COVID um, impacts to online, but there will be some that, that do disappear because a lot of people are just waiting for that time for that vaccine and for us to return and aren't letting go of it. And gotcha. they're sitting at a place where they might have the financial buffer to sustain the duration of this and are just doing what they can as a stopgap Mm -hmm. but they're going to revert a lot of that energy back the minute that the time changes because that's still where they know they can capitalize on things Yeah, and um, they're not going to adapt to it. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Um, like, I guess uh, we're a little, we're, I guess, approaching the end of um, the panel, but um, do you guys have any like quick, uh, quick statements about like um, how you see, like just, uh, I guess like really quick statements about um, how you think, um, you know, these new innovations will last through like, um, um, if not, um, I guess uh, we'll just close it out. Um, I, I do want to give everybody a chance to give a quick shout out um, to something cool that's coming up for them that you want people to know about. Um, yeah, I guess we'll start with Bobby. Yeah, uh, a lot of my stuff is like under the radar right now. I've got a few cool collegiate projects coming out with you, Dylan, of course, as you know, uh, later this year. And then um, actually my last day at my full-time job is today. Okay. Um, awesome. or when we're recording this, I don't know when we watch <laughs> this, but, yeah. um, we, we will, so I'll be launching my new company that is mm. flock, uh, flock money in a few weeks. Awesome. So hopefully by time. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Ryan, uh, I'm just chugging along, uh, intercollegiate game network. So nothing much now. Uh, if you, anyone interested in checking us out, you can head to our Twitter page. Uh, or Twitter, Twitch, Facebook, 
it's all just a uh, uni game network or you can go to discord.io not gg unless we've got partner by the time this goes up but i doubt it uh discord.io slash uni game network uh, and reach out if you're interested in working with us or just come and chat uh we got some stuff in the pipeline but nothing to uh share yet okay awesome <laughs> kevin uh no just uh check i guess the only thing is check out the hbcu esports league um more to come there uh hit me up at twitch student at twitch.tv if you have any questions about how to build gaming esports program at your university happy to help and uh kevin also hosts a panel i think every wednesday oh uh, um, yeah i have a stream i have a stream every wednesday from god damn it dylan I have a stream every wednesday from uh six to eight i just kind of talk whatever i want to talk about uh, anywhere from esports to like finance to random stuff about league and, and valorant and whatever games that's interesting but yeah he has his own discord community and um he brings on guests to talk about like various topics so it's a pretty good uh pretty good content and then uh mike do you have anything you want to shout out or yeah let's see if my face will come up for a okay. second um yep. so obviously we're continuing to elevate for oklahoma uh the university of oklahoma specifically but i'm also looking at initiatives within k-12 through in a very deep deep meaningful way um, and as well as elevating as much of my collegiate peers in the space, which is who I've been since 2016 and starting on this journey. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're just continuing to elevate that and I'll just be a showcase through the culture that we have instilled in our students as they go out and represent exactly what we wanted to achieve by contributing to this industry as it continues to grow. Awesome. Yeah. So um, I guess uh, I'll give a quick shout out um, to you know, my company, you connect eSports. Um, we're a sponsorship marketplace that allows um, brands to activate across all these um, awesome collegiate communities. You know, we work with Twitch, we work with HyperX. Um, you know, we, a lot of the Cloud9 stuff that they've been doing collegiate is um, also through our platform. So, you know, everyone's laughing because I'm a huge shill, but um, yeah, check us out um, if you're a brand that wants to activate collegiate. But besides that, you know, thanks, thanks so much for, um, for all y'all, um, for giving y'all's time. And um, I'm really looking forward to what you guys have in store. Awesome. So, thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. Always fun to talk. Well, thanks, guys.
and welcome to our developer introduction for Garland Glory Firstborn, a turn-based tactical RPG where the battlefield is your only weapon. Here at Elston Studios, we set out to create a strategic experience that focuses on tactical unit placement and clever use of the environment. In Garland Glory, your foes cannot be harmed by normal weapons. Instead, your heroes use their abilities to push, pull, and maneuver foes into deadly hazards around the battlefield. Not everything you face will fall so easily. From undead sorcerers to mighty dragons, we've dotted the drowned lands with fearsome bosses to challenge even the greatest of heroes. Though your foes will be powerful, you will have plenty of tools to balance the odds. As you play, your heroes will amass the blessings of ancient deities, each providing new sets of skills and abilities. Mix and match these boons of divinity to create your own unique playstyle as you challenge the legions of the Firstborn. From the team at Elston Studios, thank you so much for your attention, and may your adventures in the Drowned Lands be glorious. And the battles they fought in will not be forgotten once more. The Firstborn are bound. What do you think it's like, here? Being a kid in the hospital. How do we feel? Are we all the same? No. We are each our own, different. Some of us are here for an hour, some of us, months. We all experience different things. But we all share one thing. We all just want to be kids. And that's where you come in. Because of you, we have a new way to play. A new way to make things better. And you helped us get just the right people to make it all happen. Including one of the first gaming technology specialists in the country. Every day I get to come into work and use technology to help kids feel better. This includes gaming on consoles, it also includes 3D printing, and even includes immersive technology such as augmented and virtual reality. Not only do we use this technology for fun, but we also get to use it to help kids get through treatments and for procedure supports so they can heal faster and get home quicker. It feels like you're a kid again when you're playing video games. Not only that, because of Child's Play, we also have the world's first child life medical director. Not only do I get to help develop and manage these programs, I get to promote the mission of child life throughout Children's Hospital Colorado and the community. And you help us figure out how to do all this even better. We're conducting research on how we can use these new and emerging technologies to establish best practices to benefit our patients and families, to improve the experiences, and how we can leverage this technology in really fun and innovative ways. So we just want to say thank you. Thank you for helping us be kids. Thank you for helping us play. Thank you for helping us heal.
and welcome to our developer introduction for Garland Glory Firstborn, a turn-based tactical RPG where the battlefield is your only weapon. Here at Elston Studios, we set out to create a strategic experience that focuses on tactical unit placement and clever use of the environment. In Garland Glory, your foes cannot be harmed by normal weapons. Instead, your heroes use their abilities to push, pull, and maneuver foes into deadly hazards around the battlefield. Not everything you face will fall so easily. From undead sorcerers to mighty dragons, we've dotted the drowned lands with fearsome bosses to challenge even the greatest of heroes. Though your foes will be powerful, you will have plenty of tools to balance the odds. As you play, your heroes will amass the blessings of ancient deities, each providing new sets of skills and abilities. Mix and match these boons of divinity to create your own unique playstyle as you challenge the legions of the Firstborn. From the team at Elston Studios, thank you so much for your attention, and may your adventures in the Drowned Lands be glorious. And the battles they fought in will not be forgotten once more. The Firstborn are bound. Child's Play. And since 2003, we've been very, very busy. We supply toys and games of all kinds to hundreds of child welfare facilities across the world, taking a little of the outside world and bringing it inside, sharing our expertise to help make children's lives better. Child Life Specialists provide therapeutic play and education to reduce fear, anxiety, and pain for pediatric patients, making their lives a little easier and a little happier. Child's Play works directly with Child Life staff to create a wish list specific to their facility, ensuring donations are used to their fullest. We've raised more than $44 million so far, and our work reaches more than a million kids per year. Come be a part of our story and learn more at childsplaycharity.org. Hi, I'm Travis, the Executive Director of Child's Play Charity. Um, I get to take the time to fill you in on the history of Child's Play and give you an idea of how we started and how we got to where we are today. So back in 2003, Child's Play started uh, with video games being kind of now uh, negatively portrayed in the news. They were talked about as having no redeeming qualities, murder simulators, and it was just one of those times where the news and um, society as at large looked at video games and gamers kind of looked down on them a little bit. And our founders, uh, Gabe and Tycho, Mike and Jerry of Penny Arcade, didn't think that that was an accurate representation of themselves, or the gamers they knew, or the fans of, of Penny Arcade. So out of spite, out of uh, a bit of a publicity stunt, they worked with Amazon to create a wish list of toys for Seattle Children's Hospital and invited their fans to buy toys and have them uh, sent to, to their house that they would uh, later deliver to Seattle Children's. Fast forward about two weeks from there and a quarter million dollars worth of toys that stacked floor to ceiling, wall to wall Tetra skills definitely came into play. The toy drive, the Child's Play toy drive was a huge success. And after it was done, they realized that this stunt really gave the gaming uh, gaming community an opportunity to step up and show that gamers really do want to give back. And so ever since then, Child's Play has been a thing. So we started one hospital, 
2003 in uh, in Seattle, and now 17 years later here in 2020, we partner with over 180 children's hospitals all across the globe, as well as about 200 domestic violence shelters across the U.S. So when Child's Play began, hospitals didn't have a lot of gaming equipment inside the facilities. Maybe a console inside a playroom, um, not very many consoles on carts or things like that. They just weren't very prevalent inside the hospitals. So for many years, what Child's Play did was took your donations and bought iPads and consoles and games and controllers and all that technology that was needed inside the hospital and got it delivered every year annually with the support to the Child Life Department, which is really who we focus on supporting. The Child Life Department is the group of people in the hospital that makes a children's hospital really different than an adult hospital. Both hospitals have doctors and nurses that are taking care of you, but the Child Life staff inside a children's hospital is there to educate the kids on what it means with their diagnoses, what procedures are coming up, but also to help normalize life for them, give them opportunities to play, keep them on track with school, keep them connected with friends and family, and the impact of games of technology allowing them to do that has been really huge. In about 2013, Child's Play started to support domestic violence shelters also. So we started with a pilot program of 100 um, shelters across the US where we sent a huge kind of Ikea style um, TV screen and Xbox console on a, on a rolly cart sort of piece designed to be able to move in and out of private rooms and, and public spaces in the shelters so that kids could game. Often when someone leaves the hospital or, or leaves their house, sorry, um, and has to do it very quickly to get to a shelter, you don't get to grab things like your Xbox or your PlayStation. You don't get to bring your games. You kind of just grab quickly what you need and go. And this was an opportunity to get games to kids in another place where they really needed them. Um, we, in 2016, changed our shelter program to uh, sending games cases. So now kind of the briefcase style console all enclosed, um, still with the same idea, getting games so that kids who have been quickly ushered out of home have the opportunity to sit down and play. But we've also filled them with preloaded games so they don't have to keep track of discs and things like that, and really selected our games to make sure that they are uh, intentional about the environment where they are being played. So making sure that we have nonviolent games and pieces available to play, but also games that are multiplayer so that um, a parent or a counselor can sit down next to the kid and use the game as a bit of an icebreaker. So we've been able to expand that program. Um, now we send out um, about four shelters. We support about four shelters a month sending out consoles and games cases to them. In about 2005, Child's, or 2015, sorry, 2015, um, Child's Play started doing hospital visits. So we started our Gamers Give Back tour. And um, that tour got us into our hospitals where we noticed that gaming had become more prevalent. They had systems in place. They had Xboxes. Some places had an Xbox or a PlayStation in every single room. Um, lots of them had them on carts so they could wheel them into kids. Uh, but we heard things like, our consoles are all broken, um, or we just can't keep up with updates and things like that. So we... Uh, figured out lots of broken consoles were just uh, disconnected controllers. And the Child Life staff who became responsible for this equipment was not always aware how to just sync up an Xbox controller back to the Xbox that it was paired with originally. So we realized that sending toys is, is important. Getting the games, getting the consoles in is really important. But we needed to really step up the game into how we could impact them. One of the first things that we did is we created a therapeutic video game guide. This guide, um, we worked with EDAR, and it looks at different symptoms that kids are dealing with inside the hospital and breaks down how to be really intentional with games to address things like pain or anxiety or sadness. Um, if you missed it, there was a panel on that that happened on Thursday. And you definitely could go back into the PAX feed and find that panel. I really recommend that you look into that if you want to know more about our guide or if you just want to get a quick look at it, 
childsplaycharity.org. Scroll down a little bit and you can see the therapeutic game guide on there also, where you could download it and get a copy of it for yourself to see what kind of games are suggested and why certain games are suggested. It's something we like to share with the hospital, with parents, game devs. We'd love it if people were really intentional as they were thinking about the games that they're making and the games that they're selecting when they're choosing games for kids. Um, and right around that same time frame, we started talking with with Children's Colorado and some other hospitals about a game tech position. Inside CS Mott, there was one child life specialist who, uh, who was a gamer who sort of fell into this position and he really kind of became this standout uh, model that we started thinking about what if every hospital could have something like this position. And so we started doing grants for game tech positions. And um, Eric will tell you a little bit more about it in a minute here, but these game tech positions are inside the hospitals now working with, with the kids advancing all of the technology. So um, we've been able to change our support and our focus a little bit into not just getting the games into the hospital, but also into helping the staff learn how to use games in a really intentional fashion so that they have a stronger impact on the kids that are inside the hospital that they're taking care of. Um, and the other piece that we've really done is become a hub. So we are in constant contact with our partner hospitals, talking with them about how to use technology, what kind of technology they, are, they, they have seen and how they've been successful with it and being able to share that with others. So we've really gone from being just a passive charity with the community support that sends out technology. Now your support is allowing us to really become this hub of knowledge and information that is having a huge impact inside all of the children's hospitals that we support. Um, with that, I'm gonna hand this off to Eric, who is gonna talk a lot more about the gaming and technology, the pediatric gaming and technology specialist. So uh, Eric, here you go. Thanks, Travis. Uh, I'm Eric Blandin. I'm the program director for Child's Play. About five years ago, we decided to start visiting hospitals, giving some gifts to kiddos, but also sitting down over lunch with the child life staff to chat. We wanted to make sure that they knew about uh, how we could essentially help them, um, but also in the first year that we were doing our visits, we wanted to listen and find out about their challenges and what we might be able to do that could assist them in their practice. As the ones that look after the emotional health and well-being of patients, uh, as well as the ones that oversee the playrooms and game systems, we knew that child's play, child life staff could be our allies in the hospitals. Very quickly, we realized that for the most part, they have as many game consoles as they can support. Replacing old equipment is important, but even uh, before the COVID times, hospital staff were generally very busy and didn't have the time to spend on maintaining game systems. Almost no child life specialists that we've met identify as gamers, and they usually have just, uh, not just one, but 10 to 20 consoles per hospital to maintain. Imagine uh, that you have a console at home and you opened it up to random neighborhood kids to play with for the day, uh, for a day of unsupervised fun. They came, they uh, played with them all day, and then they left. After they're done, you'd have to clean off a bunch of profiles that they created, delete the games and demos they tried to download, change back some settings, recharge controllers, all of that just to get them ready. Now imagine you had not just one console, but maybe a dozen. And they're not just being used one day, but every day of the week. Um, it's a lot of work to maintain that kind of equipment. Hospital consoles do get used a lot, but they generally only get looked at when they stop working right. Uh, and then these untrained non-gamer staff have to try to fix it. Uh, stumbling through menus, uh, setting aside anything that they, is broken, they set aside. Um, and sometimes these things are you know, just full of profiles. They run out of space or um, something just isn't right. Or maybe even just the battery is dead in the controller and so it's broken. Um, and then kids can't play with it anymore. So those things just sit on the side until either a volunteer comes or some staff has the time to fix it. Um, all of this is taking away from their job responsibilities of patient care and what they were trained to do. 
in our visits, fortunately, we did run across a few uh, hospitals that actually had a gamer on staff. And in some very rare cases, that person actually had maintaining the equipment as part of their job responsibilities. We learned as much as we could about this role and what it might look like um, in the future. Uh, talking to uh, talking to those who had it and also chatting with some of the hospital partners that seemed like good candidates to see what it would look like if we were to put this position in hospitals all over the place uh, via grants. In the last four years, we've been able to approve 18 grants uh, for these pediatric game technology specialists, including one in Canada and one in Kenya. We received over six times as many grant applications as we had the funds to approve this year, uh, which is exciting um, as it shows the demand for this position is so huge. We continue to gather data and evidence about the importance of games in hospitals, and especially this kind of position and being able to support them, and are starting to see other organizations and the hospitals themselves funding these positions, which will help speed up the adoption. Part of my role is to help make sure that these game technology specialists have the resources they need to do their job and facilitate their ability to coordinate with each other. Uh, we have a Slack channel that I, we set up and I manage where they can share ideas, ask questions, talk about the latest game news and how it might affect the work they're doing. Things like which games have good accessibility options, uh, which companies are changing their login requirements, uh, what VR headsets can be wiped down versus which ones are filled with foam and just can't be reused by multiple people in an uh, infection sensitive area. We have weekly calls where we discuss their procedures, how they set up carts, all that kind of stuff. It's really quite exciting. We look forward to the things that are happening with games and therapy and uh, excited about how much uh, better the future will be. Uh, with that, I will pass this to Kirsten. Thanks, Eric. Is this on? I'm just kidding, you guys. For those of you that have already met me, you know that I am new to gaming, but not new to my role at Child's Play, which is fundraising. I'm Kirsten Carlisle, and I'm the Director of Philanthropy and Partner Experiences at Child's Play, which is the fancy way of saying that I'm the fundraiser on the team. So I want to share a little bit about me and then tell you about all the great ways that you can be a part of being a gamer that gives back and truly giving power in play to our children's hospitals. So that said, on a normal panel, we'd have a few notes in front of us. Our team would be together side by side. And obviously, we're pre-recording our panels. So I do have a few notes I might glance at from time to time, only because I want to make sure that you hear about every opportunity and every way that you can participate and help support Child's Play in the mission that we have. So I come from children's hospitals in my background, fundraising and helping lead a child life team. So for Child's Play, that part was not new to me, uh, learning every single day about how to be a gamer and what games I can play well, what games that the team is helping me learn through, um, doing some Twitch streaming with Tabby and everyone else. And um, it's been super fun. And I'm glad that everyone is so supportive and engaging and helping me learn different ways to, to play especially as an adult, right? It's such a great hobby in a fun way. So often the question I get is, how do you fundraise for Child's Play or how do you raise all the money that you guys do? And, you know, we raised, we've had years of three to four million and years up to $8 million that we've raised to give back to our children's hospitals. So let's talk about how creative this community is and the things that you come up with to support our mission. So First, individual donations. So many of you already give philanthropically to organizations, maybe even Child's Play, and this isn't new to you, but some of these ways might be new. So a lot of donors send us checks and cash. They give online. They um, might have a donor advised fund where they're actually giving us checks at certain times of the year as a small grant to us and monthly giving. Monthly giving is an incredible way to support Child's Play, where we see every month anywhere from five, 10, 25, $100 a month that directly comes to us um, that you set up at home yourself through either your bank or credit union or through PayPal giving. Um, great, great easy ways for you to do that. Um, the next would be really to shop and support. So Humble Bundle, all of you know about Bundle, Humble Bundle and whether we're the charity of the month or where you're a charity that you select for every time you purchase something on Humble Bundle, all of that adds up to um, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in support for Child's Play each and every year. And we are forever grateful to you and to Humble Bundle for that opportunity. 
also Google Play. You can go into that store and purchase games and part of the proceeds comes back to Child's Play. And then obviously during COVID, we have all experienced uh, how great it is to receive a package, most often from Amazon. And so with getting your Amazon package, make sure that you are clicking and hitting smile.amazon.com when you're shopping. And not only do you get a gift in the mail that you purchase for yourself or maybe send to someone else, but you're giving that gift back to Child's Play if you choose us as your charity partner. And we cannot thank everyone enough who has been showing us that support. We have seen quite the uptick um, since the COVID quarantine and people are staying home and staying safe, but getting some some packages at home and doing it where you can support charity too. Um, next, really, I wanna talk a little bit about corporate giving. So when you think about um, on our website, if you go to our homepage, you'll see corporate sponsors at varying levels. And it's really a way that sometimes corporate partners simply write us a check, um, part of their corporate social responsibility. Other times they're holding employee campaigns for employee giving. And that can be anywhere from a one month campaign for a corporate partner to year long monthly giving where someone might select child's play. So, and then corporate giving, they actually match it. So what's great about Microsoft and Apple and USAA and so many other groups is that they match their employees gift. Sometimes it's a two to one match, sometimes one to one. I mean, it's an awesome way to really help um, extend your gift into giving even more. And then corporate partners also really support a lot of our special events. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the special events that we have and ways that you can get involved year round for, for fundraising with us. Um, one of those would probably be this week if it has already aired is the Make a Strip, which has Hot Dog Ferry with uh, Mike and Jerry. And so there's an opportunity if the crowd uses Mobile Cause or um, this year through Donor Drive can give during the hot dog ferry and support our mission. We also have our Child's Play Dinner Auction, which is an awesome event held every December in Redmond, uh, Bellevue area. And we have about 550 people that attend and get to experience not only a fun night of celebrating all the great things that Child's Play is doing, but bid on really unique auction items and have a chance just to interact with each other. This year, as with most all events, we are gonna be going virtual with that dinner auction. So if you don't live in our area, there's a chance for you to also participate. If you head over to our website, you'll learn more about our dinner auction and how you can get involved in that special night that we'll be having in December. Um, as I talked about the crazy, talented, amazing community that we have um, in the gaming sphere and even out of the gaming sphere, two of the events that I'd like to highlight a little bit and share with you are Desert Bus for Hope and MAGFest. Both have created a really unique event. Desert Bus is a week-long event where there are chances to win and really good entertainment and opportunities to engage with the Desert Bus crew with Loading Ready, Loading Ready Run and Child's Play to raise money for us. Last year, having a record-breaking year, um, raising close to a million dollars for us. Um, MAGFest is another great one that I'd like to feature, and MAGFest is the music and gaming festival um, held every January, and they have several events throughout the year. MAGFest is kind of the largest one in January, so not sure what's happening with that yet this next year, but really an opportunity for, as the official charity, to recognize Child's Play and support us with their live auction and, and various things they have throughout that week -long, weekend long event uh, to support Child's Play. Um, also, Facebook has an opportunity and a great way for you to hold your own special event. So whether that is a Facebook birthday, um, some special way for you to ask people on an anniversary or your child's birthday um, to dedicate money to a charity. It's a really great, easy way to share why you support that charity and ask your friends online to also do that. Um, and last but not least, with having PAX Online this year, we did come up with a PAX uh, online silent auction. So you have an opportunity to bid on some items from the gaming community that they have donated to us, some one of a kind, um, unique packages for you. So if you head over to www.childsplaycharity.org and click on news, you're going to see a blog post that talks about all the ways to engage with Child's Play during PAX, and the silent auction actually closes tomorrow, so you still have time to get in on the action and support us. Uh, with that said, I do want to take a minute and um, 
share that we also have one last way that we feel like our community has supported us, and that is through individuals and influencers who hold charity streams for Child's Play. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it to my coworker, Tabby, who's going to share with you about that. Tabby? I guess it is my turn now. Hi, I am Tabitha Sheehan, but you can call me Tabby. I am Child's Play's Community and Program Coordinator. Child's Play was started by gamers and has been supported by gamers since the very beginning. Are you a gamer who wants to give back, but you're not really sure how? You can host a charity stream and have fun while you play games and raise money at the same time. What a great combo. There are many tools out there that'll help you do this successfully, and you can reference our fundraising guide found on our website, childsplaycharity.org, for more information. I'm not here to talk about the physical tools that are required to have a stream. I'm here to talk about the other side of streaming and having a charity stream. If it's your first event, you want to make sure to set a reasonable goal because you don't want to be disappointed. And if you reach your goal quickly, you'll be even more excited about seeing how much more you can raise. You want to make sure to keep it positive because if you're passionate about what you're raising money for, then your watch or your audience will too. If you, you know, learn more about our mission, you'll be able to answer questions your chat may have. And if you can't answer all of them, you can always reference your audience to our website and or send us an email or have them send us an email with their questions. It will be happy to answer them. And while you're learning about our mission, it might prompt you to talk about personal experiences with games and how they've helped you feel better in your life, if you're comfortable sharing those stories. And that might prompt your chat to open up if they're comfortable and share their stories. And it'll get everyone connected to our charity and our mission because it's, it's important to be able to play games and feel better for everyone. If you have milestones and incentives, those are two things that can help you reach your goal and make your stream fun because you wanna make sure to do things that you're comfortable with. Say for example, if you have a $25 milestone, so if you finally reach your $25 milestone, you can say, wear a funny hat or I don't know, anything you're comfortable with. If you have a $50 incentive, so that means when someone donates $50 all at once, you'll eat a weird flavored jelly bean or whatever you feel comfortable with and make sure to have fun. Don't forget to engage with your audience while you're playing the game. I know when I play games, I can get kind of hyped up and like just so focused on what I'm doing. I have no idea what's around me, but you don't want to forget about your audience because they might have questions. Or they might not even know what's happening when they come into your channel. They might be new and your timers, if you set chat timers to promote the charity, they might not have went off yet. So it's good to make sure to, you know, mention what you're doing, what the fundraiser is for, uh, the link below, or if they want more information to go to our website. Uh, you also don't want to forget to have fun because that's very important, like I mentioned before, because if you're hype, your audience will be hyped too. The most important thing is to make sure to remember to take care of yourself. Make sure to take breaks when you need to. Make sure to, you know, set reasonable time uh, limits on your stream. You know, like if you feel comfortable doing a 24 hour charity stream, that's great. But don't feel obligated to do such a thing. You can, you know, stream for three hours on every Monday for charity, whatever you want to do, because this is your fundraiser. Also, don't forget to stay hydrated because that's very important in taking care of yourself too. If you want to learn more about streaming for us to fundraise, send me an email at tshean at childsplay.org. Now, the community has sent us questions and now we're going to answer them. Thanks. Someone asked, can I donate my old gaming equipment to Child's Play Charity? Uh, and while we appreciate the thought, it's most for most cases it's not that useful. Hospitals have a tough time using used equipment. Um, they are both the germ concerns; they don't know where it's been, as well as just it being used. Its lifespan is less, and since equipment gets so used uh, in hospitals, so well loved, um, new stuff is much better. It means they have to replace it less often, um, and uh, it'll last longer. Next question is can I tag Child's Play when I share my fundraiser on social media? Of course. And if we can, we'll boost your signal for you. 
And you can also use our hashtags, play games feel better, or gamers give back. And you can find us on Twitter at CP Charity or on Instagram and Facebook at Child's Play Charity. We were also asked, how can hospitals contact us to become part of our program and how many hospitals do we take each year? So if you go to the Child's Play Charity website, childsplaycharity.org and look at the About Us page, there is a button down at the bottom where hospital applications are and we will take as many hospitals as we can get. Someone else asked, how do I find out if my company matches my gift? So a great way to do this is to reach out to your human resources team or someone in administration, and they can usually walk you through how to submit your gift. Some are easy online and some require you um, to fill out some forms in HR, but a really great way to make your gift have an extra impact. Another question we get a lot at panels like this is, what do the job requirements of a pediatric game technology specialist look like? And it's not, it's so new because we have so few of them right now. There isn't a, a recommended career path. I can tell you that having uh, experience in a hospital is a huge plus. So if you are interested in that, you don't have that yet, go volunteer once volunteering is allowed again. Um, go, you know, get a job in there somewhere if you can, maybe the IT department or something. Uh, and then having uh, education background or camp background, um, paid or, or volunteer, um, you know, tra some kind of training working with kids uh, is a huge plus. That'll be a huge part of your, of your job. And don't forget a great way to support Child's Play is to visit our store and rep our brand. Uh, remember 100% of all the proceeds from uh, your purchase support the work that we do in our hospitals and shelters. Thanks for taking the time to listen to our panel. You've heard about the impact that your support has had on all of the hospitals that Child's Play supports. And we've got now a very special video from Colorado Children's that is just a huge thank you, really showcasing that impact. Wait, wait, we forgot something. Since I'm the editor, I can do this. After the Colorado video, there's another video. We miss everyone so much at PAX West that we wanted to share a video from PAX West 2018 where we will see the story of a kid that we helped during his hospital stays as he enjoys PAX and tells you his story. What do you think it's like, here, being a kid in the hospital? How do we feel? Are we all the same? No. We are each our own, different. Some of us are here for an hour, some of us, months. We all experience different things, but we all share one thing. We all just want to be kids. And that's where you come in. Because of you, we have a new way to play, a new way to make things better. And you helped us get just the right people to make it all happen, including one of the first gaming technology specialists in the country. Every day I get to come into work and use technology to help kids feel better. This includes gaming on consoles, it also includes 3D printing, and even includes immersive technology such as augmented and virtual reality. Not only do we use this technology for fun, but we also get to use it to help kids get through treatments and for procedure supports so they can heal faster and get home quicker. It feels like you're a kid again when you're playing video games. Not only that, because of Child's Play, we also have the world's first child life medical director. Not only do I get to help develop and manage these programs, I get to promote the mission of child life throughout Children's Hospital Colorado and the community. And you help us figure out how to do all this even better. We're conducting research on how we can use these new and emerging technologies to establish best practices to benefit our patients and families, to improve the experiences, and how we can leverage this technology in really fun and innovative ways. So we just want to say thank you. Thank you for helping us be kids. Thank you for helping us play. Thank you for helping us heal. It's very rewarding to work with this community because I can't believe how generous they are.
people that recognize us when they see us at a convention, uh, our booth, they're like, oh, Child's Play, and then they're just don't, they just donate. Pretty much everyone either has personally experienced being in a hospital or can relate to you know, friends, family, whatever, being in a hospital and, and understands that it's boring, it's painful, it's stressful. The gaming community also understands that games can help with that. People will seek us out just to tell us how thankful they are for what we do because um, they've experienced hospital stays and they needed a way to be distracted and entertained and to keep from feeling isolated, stuck in the hospital. And it, we've really helped them. I'm Liam Baker, here at PAX West 2018, thanks to Child's Play. I've always liked video games, and Liam would first just watch myself play video games. He would always be by my side. As he got older, Liam started overtaking my skills at first. Liam would like, let me try, Dad, let me try. And then I just let Liam do it, because Liam, that became his passion. At six months old, I was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis, and since then, I've been going to the hospital five times a year for 14 day stays uh, every year. In the beginning of the hospital stays, there was like nothing to do, and it was really like boring and stuff. And then, as I got older, uh, child's play came into the picture. I definitely don't know where I'd be now without having video games to play. For somebody who is stuck in this like environment of just all these people just walking by outside, being able to like participate in everyday normal life, it helps provide me a sense like I'm still connected to the outside world. As he's gotten older, it just seems like he's been spending more time in the hospital, and um, it also affects his overall mental health as well. Um, Having the games available to Liam while he's in the hospital, it's so beneficial to Liam's overall health. It helps him get through the days. Child's Play started in 2003. There was a newspaper article that really kind of got Mike and Jerry of Penny Arcade fired up uh, that said video games are murder simulators that are just teaching kids and, and people how to be horrible. And so they decided that they would show the world that gamers can be good people. They knew that they were good people. They knew hundreds of gamers, thousands of gamers that were also good people. And so they issued a challenge end of November, it was like November 24th, that said, we've got this wish list of toys put together for Seattle Children's. Buy a toy, send it to us, we'll deliver it. In two weeks, they raised about a quarter million dollars worth of toys. And um, from that point went, oh, this was kind of a stunt we were doing, and this was a huge impact. We need to continue this. Then quickly in the next year, um, you know, registered the charity, made it an official charity, reached out to a whole bunch of other hospitals, got more other hospitals on board, and Child's Play was a, was a thing. So we're here at Seattle Children's. We're visiting on our Gamers Give Back tour stop with Game Changer Charity, our partner charity. Together, we're gonna visit a little over 100 kids today. We've got gift bags behind us here for all of them. It's a chance for
Genesis Noir is an adventure game set before, during, and after the Big Bang. A cosmic gunshot aimed at the heart of a god rockets the universe into existence and must be undone. Explore the expanding universe to discover clues on how you might destroy the Big Bang and prevent this tragedy. You'll stumble through seedy speakeasies, transform energy into matter, create far out jazz duets, discover what's inside a gas giant, track animals through primeval woods, Watch stars die in this film noir creation myth. Learn more at genesisnoirgame.com and help destroy the universe.
What do you do when you run out of spell slots? I'm sure you've wondered how I, Walnut, have become as well known as I am for never being in want of spell slots and always being prepared for any situation. Listen to the end for my trade secret. As you know, personally, I never run out of spell slots. As a level 10 druid, circle of the moon, mind you, I have so many spell slots and so many options. Do I want to scare off some feral cats with a little magic missile, cure an oafish paladin's boo-boo with a little good berry, or am I feeling spicy enough to drop a third level moonbeam down on an entire illegal logging operation? I'd love to run out of spell slots. I would. That would mean I'm doing my best out there to protect the natural world. I suppose I do have to mitigate only having two wild shapes per day. Now, I know what normal people would think in this situation, but Walnut, can't you just save those wild shapes for when you're in the most dire circumstances? No, I say. Instead, I would say, what defines a day? Certainly, there's no law, no rule, that a day has to be anything other than the time between rests. And that's why I've developed a perfect system to skirt the rules, as it were. <laughs> I need to do a big fight with a dragon in 30 minutes. Good thing I can turn into the mighty dragon's most feared natural enemy, a regular ass bear. But oh no, I don't have enough time to sit for four hours and regen my wild shapes. Guess I'll die. Sorry, the rest of my party. Has this ever happened to you? <laughs> not anymore. Now druids can perform not five, not six, not seven, but eight equidistant mini trances or naps as I like to call them across the day. Why wait for your wild shapes to fully regenerate when you can get partial credit for a 30 minute nap blast? Sure, I could turn into a whole bear, but isn't it just as good to have my regular body and say like one bear arm for about 15 minutes? That's a whole 150 rounds of combat. If you can't get the job done with one bear arm in 100 rounds of combat, then why are we even talking?
Shot of a fast paced skate trick multiplayer shooter where players dodge bullets and take out opponents as they skate ramp, grind, parkour, 
Complete tricks and kills for the most points to win. Contestants select between hover skates or hoverboards. You can score points by doing tricks or taking out opponents or a balance of both. Complete tricks to fill your trick meter. It boosts your overall speed and damage, making you a more deadly opponent. When the match ends, the player with the highest score wins. You can carry as many weapons as you can find. <laughs> Knock opponents off their feet by tackling. Use dash to bridge gaps and gain on enemies. Or you can slide into boom boxes to launch them at your opponents. When you're holding a weapon, each air trick will give you a small amount of ammo. Each ground trick gives you a small armor boost. When you kill an opponent, the score they lose from death adds directly to your combo score. Jump towards the wall to start a wall run. Grinding will continuously give you health boosts. Actions add points to your combo score, and kills will add to your score multiplier. Trick points are based on selecting basic, advanced, or pro tricks. From fast and easy to slow and hard. Pick the air, ground, or grind trick right for you. When the match ends, the player with the highest score wins. This is Trick Shot.
Genesis Noir is an adventure game set before, during, and after the Big Bang. A cosmic gunshot aimed at the heart of a god rockets the universe into existence and must be undone. Explore the expanding universe to discover clues on how you might destroy the Big Bang and prevent this tragedy. You'll stumble through seedy speakeasies, transform energy into matter, create far out jazz duets, discover what's inside a gas giant, track animals through primeval woods, Watch stars die in this film noir creation myth. Learn more at genesisnoirgame.com and help destroy the universe. What do you do when you run out of spell slots? I'm sure you've wondered how I, Walnut, have become as well known as I am for never being in want of spell slots and always being prepared for any situation. Listen to the end for my trade secret. As you know, personally, I never run out of spell slots. As a level 10 druid, circle of the moon, mind you, I have so many spell slots and so many options. Do I want to scare off some feral cats with a little magic missile, cure an oafish paladin's boo-boo with a little good berry, or am I feeling spicy enough to drop a third level moonbeam down on an entire illegal logging operation? I'd love to run out of spell slots. I would. That would mean I'm doing my best out there to protect the natural world. 
I suppose I do have to mitigate only having two wild shapes per day. Now, I know what normal people would think in this situation, but Walnut, can't you just save those wild shapes for when you're in the most dire circumstances? No, I say. Instead, I would say, what defines a day? Certainly, there's no law, no rule, that a day has to be anything other than the time between rests. And that's why I've developed a perfect system to skirt the rules, as it were. <laughs> I need to do a big fight with a dragon in 30 minutes. Good thing I can turn into the mighty dragon's most feared natural enemy, a regular ass bear. But oh no, I don't have enough time to sit for four hours and regen my wild shapes. Guess I'll die. Sorry, the rest of my party. Has this ever happened to you? <laughs> not anymore. Now druids can perform not five, not six, not seven, but eight equidistant mini trances or naps as I like to call them across the day. Why wait for your wild shapes to fully regenerate when you can get partial credit for a 30 minute nap blast? Sure, I could turn into a whole bear, but isn't it just as good to have my regular body and say like one bear arm for about 15 minutes? That's a whole 150 rounds of combat. If you can't get the job done with one bear arm in 100 rounds of combat, then why are we even talking?
Shot of a fast-paced skate trick multiplayer shooter where players dodge bullets and take out opponents as they skate ramp, grind, parkour, complete tricks, and kills for the most points to win. Contestants select between hover skates or hoverboards. You can score points by doing tricks. Hello, everybody. Welcome to PAX Online. My name is Patrick, and 
like everybody here, I'm a big fan of board games. And as the title suggests, I'm also very much into 3D printing. In fact, the main reason I got into 3D printing is board games. I have bought my first 3D printer a little bit over two years ago, bought more since then. I've been printing almost all the time ever since. I have way more uptime than downtime. And almost everything I print is related to board games, almost. It's one of the best investments I've made for my hobby. And what I'd like to do today is let you know exactly what having a 3D printer at home entails if you happen to also be into board gaming. I think it's a great thing to get into. Um, we've seen a lot of people that sell all kinds of implements to make your games look better or easier to play. Um, they're often costly, but they're worth it. What I want to show you is how you can unlock that potential at your home for a relatively low cost. So without further ado, let me show you exactly what we're going to be doing today. We're going to be talking about this in three sections. There's going to be uh, what I like to call the spiel. Uh, basically, this is the kind of talk I have with people whenever I want to introduce them to this mix of the two hobbies together. Uh, usually it's what I, I tend to have as a conversation whenever I'm at a con convention and I'm showing up with these parts and everybody's like curious about where I got all this stuff. They're super weird out when I say I made it myself, it wasn't that hard, blah, 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 you know. Uh, second part is uh, how does this all work? Because whenever I start talking about this, it, it always opens up a can of worms. There's going to be questions, they're always the same questions at first. And it's it's hard not to avoid delving into the technicalities of it. So we're going to do that. And once we have that done, it's going to permit us uh, a deeper view into all the rest. Like, how do we get to do this? Uh, what do we do when we can't find the models that we want to do? All kinds of tips and tricks to make printing for board games easier and more accessible, more fun, and so forth. So basically, it's going to be three parts the spiel, the technical, and like what I like to call the fun stuff. So without further ado, let me start with uh, a little story about how I got into this. And it's actually a great way to segue into everything else you can do. So uh, a while back, well before there was a Kickstarter that was announced for Terraforming Mars, saying they're finally going to be making all these beautiful 3D versions of their tiles. Well, one of my good friends three years ago was really into the game already and he loved the game so much that he went online and bought a whole bunch of things to make his game look better. Uh, so to give you an idea of what we're talking about here, this is what the game looks like. Um, usually stock, no nothing. Uh, you're going to see a bunch of color cubes that represent which players put down which kind of tiles. And these tiles represent forests, these represent cities. They're all generic cities except for maybe this one, which is really ain't that different. Uh, you got ocean tiles. It's it's a fairly simple diagram. It's not a bad game, by the way. It's just simple looking. But this is what his version looked like. And as soon as we played with his version, immediately, you know, we were enthralled with it. Like, we were, we were, we wanted everything that the guy had. Uh, I mean, there were inlays for the boards and the expansions and there were custom ships and there were custom forests and cities and since we're we're geeks here i think it's here only that we'll be able to have a conversation even deeper than just showing you that image notice how there's less cubes on the board that's because he didn't only improve some on onto some of the components he also got rid of some of the mechanics of the components that he didn't like because having the ability to find your own version of components for any game means you can change the way it's played without cheating, without without changing the game itself, but making it play the way you would rather play it. Because there are a lot of games that have components that work differently. They have component mechanics that work differently from one game to another. He just adapted the way other mechanic, other games work to terraforming mars so um as soon as we play with that version we were on our way back home and i immediately told myself this is it this is the reason i've been looking for to get a 3d printer i know i'm going to buy one and it's not going to accumulate dust because i got so many games and i love terraforming mars and i i want to see what i could do with that with my other games as well but obviously the first thing i wanted to do was to emulate what he had so i went back home bought a 3d printer 
and I started looking for the same parts that he had. And not only did I find them, but I also found out that 3D printing and board games was actually a lot more popular than I thought. To a point, a lot of people had these different versions, these different sets of components that you could put into the game. Uh, and I found one that went ahead and literally detailed every single different city in its uniqueness from the cars themselves. Now, normally you wouldn't see this in the game. Normally, whenever you have a city, you just plop it down and that's it. Uh, but the reality of the game is there are a lot of different cities that come from special cards and you don't really see that on the board. You just know it by looking at your 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 tableau on in front of you that these cities that you own are actually a little bit more special and so forth well it was actually possible for us to print all of those single cities and have a, a different looking version of our 3d terraforming mars and it looks a lot i i like my version a lot more his version has a lot more colors and i'm kind of jealous of that i'm still very envious of it um, and i wish i knew how to color print how i could actually uh you know print minis if i uh, not minis but if i could actually paint minis I, i'm sure i could do a really good job but uh long story short his version is much more colorful ours is much more monochromatic um but they both have their advantages and disadvantages long story short there was a lot of stuff that you could do out there so Hence, started the big adventure of printing everything else I could think of for my board games. So, the first example that we can look into the things that you can do if you have a 3D printer is obviously components. A lot of games have components that can be improved of. And I keep going back to Terraforming Mars only because it's one of the best examples I have to show you. I could have picked other games that would have other uh, examples, but this is one I have with the most printed parts. Um, to give you another idea of what kind of upgrades you can make for any game, uh, in the case of Terraforming Mars, these are the these are the basic ships that come with it with one of the expansions. As you can see, they're not very ship-like; they're more like arrows. Uh, and you identify these ships by slotting them with color cubes. Uh, again, my friend simply printed ships of a specific color to get rid of those cues but uh on day one day one i found uh people that made different looking ships simply a little bit more i don't want to say realistic but it looked a little bit more like an actual ship on the board game and i ended up printing those um what i'm trying to say is that better components are very easy to find for pretty much any board game you're going to find uh even upgraded currencies you're going to find ways to make your own special meeples you can make 3d versions of any tile that you can pretty much think of uh if you want to find faction ships or miniatures or buildings it's very easy to find that as well uh if you want to upgrade the look of any game that you already have now that was the main thing i kept doing for the first couple of weeks if not a couple of months but eventually i started printing other things and one of the things I tend to print the most actually nowadays are inserts. Um, this is actually an insert I printed for a game called Arkham Horror. Uh, this is a quick video I made when I present when I finished it. As you can see, it's completely modular. It's very easy to deploy and put down whenever I want to play the game. And there are basically inserts for almost anything I can think of. And the, the crazy part is this insert, if I would have brought, bought it off of a third party company was have been easily 20 30 dollars almost the price of the game that cost me about two dollars worth of material that was like super cheap and i printed it overnight uh, you can make your own custom custom inserts you can make modular containers to sort things like all kinds of tokens and and, and components and cubes and money. Um, I have a ton of them for any game that has money, like Scythe, for example. Uh, this one, this is one I printed for um, for Wingspan. Uh, you can make grids and overlays of all kinds. Uh, again, Terraforming Mars. There's a lot of components, mechanical components in that game where you just put cubes on top of cardboard, which is very easy to fly off. But these these overlays are simply a must. Um, usually you would pay upwards of $30 online to buy these in, these inserts, um, at least at the time. I know there are a lot of ways for you to get actual better cardboard inserts from 
the company that made Terraforming Mars itself. But um, these cost me 25 cents to make each. And I actually still print them and give them out whenever I can. So uh, you can make dice towers. You can make dice arenas. You can make all kinds of stuff. And speak, speaking of of dice and other games related to dice, obviously you're probably also into games like RPGs. And if is the case, well, 3D printing can also be a good friend here. These are tiles that I printed uh, to create my own dungeon. I have a much bigger one that's a lot better looking, but I wanted to throw something really quickly for this presentation just to show you exactly what you can do. They're, they're basically any kind of dungeon environment if you want to create them to have, uh, and, and obviously you, you'll want to paint them if you want to make them look good like Acquisition Inc. maps or Critical Role maps and stuff like that. You can absolutely do that. You just print the tile types that you need and want, and you can find them for literally any environment environment and you'll be able to uh, basically use them you can even print all kinds of accessories like tables and and furniture and so forth um, and the crazy part is for for map tiles like these there's an actual open source map building system for 3d printers where you can just go down you know look around for i don't want to say shop because it's actually free uh, and you just look around, look for for the tiles that you want, and that's it. And these tiles cost me about 25 cents as well to print. It takes a lot of time, but over time I just build my collection. And you can make dice boxes, you can make your own currencies and coins. There's a lot of ways that you can implement your RPGs with um, all kinds of storytelling props. So, for example, you can create idols of power. You can create gameplay elements like scrying bones that if one of your players throws down it can dictate the kind of uh, bonuses or debuffs that your team will have somewhat prediction the future of the next fight you can say oh this is not going to go well you know um i actually um i actually uh even went ahead and printed these very quick uh inspiration tokens and i put them down in front of me whenever i dm and people know that if they bring their a game they're going to get some of these to spend. And it's a very simple, I don't want to say psychological, but it's a very simple trick that makes gaming better, makes the session better. And it's such an easy implement too. Long story short, there's so many things that you can do here. And again, if we're talking about RPGs and map and making dungeons, well, you're probably wondering and probably guessing that you can also make terrain for all kinds of wargaming. So uh, if you want to make your own buildings, your, mo your own laser bunkers, your crash ships, your treasure hordes, you can do it. And, you, and if you're into crafting these things by hand, um, you can actually also print tools for that, such as rolling pins, which are used to uh, press down textures on floors and surfaces, such as bricks uh, and and di and di and all kinds of of, uh, of uh, temple floors and so forth. Uh, it's very easy to print, very easy to use. And if we're saying wargaming and RPGs and all these other board games, you're probably asking yourself, can I print minis? And the answer to that is yes, but there's a lot to say about printing minis. We're going to talk about it, but we're not going to, I don't want to get this too out of scope. So here's the thing. I'm First, I'm going to pr uh, point you towards this um, article from a website called All3DP, uh, which is called 3D Printer for Miniatures, All You Need to Know. I'll also show you a whole bunch of other um, resources for that a little bit later. But yes, you can print your own miniatures of all shapes and sizes. And if you happen to be into mini painting, there's also tools that you can print. Uh, so for example, I use um, GW Citadel paint pots, which I'm not a big fan of the actual pot themselves. I love the paints, I hate the pots. So there are actually um, paint pot holders that exist that let you keep those those pots open so you can scoop out the, 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 the paint that you need. There's also, for example, um, uh, you know, paint trays and, and, you know, paint, you know, brush holders, whatever you can think of, you can, you could literally print your own wet palette if you want. So, um, whenever I talk about this, whenever I talk about all this stuff, it always brings up the same questions and it's the same three, almost always. How much does it cost? 
Do I have to do 3D modeling? And what's the catch? So let's look at these three questions before we dive into the technical stuff. How much does it cost to get into 3D printing? I'm going to tell you how much it cost me, but um, we're going to revisit that question later because after I'm going to tell you about all the types of different technologies that exist out there, that question is going to be the answers are going to be a bit different. So I'm going to tell you how much it costs me to do what you saw. So um, an entry level printer like the type I got is between $200 and $300. The first printer I bought was about $220 US. And the material I use is about $20 to $25 USD for about one kilogram or 2.2 pounds of material. Um, a lot of people, whenever I sh show those stats, they go like, oh, I can find it cheaper if you want. But there is such a thing as being too cheap. And if you go, if you, basically the material uh, that you use to print is kind of like paint in, in the sense that uh, there are paints that are so cheap that you hate using them and you'll you'll swear never to use them again. It's kind of the same thing for me. So in a certain, in, in most cases, I have brands that I kind of swear to and they're at least around a 25 USD range. Um, <clears throat> so that brings the cost to about, for a couple examples, a 28 millimeter miniature, which is a typical miniature, is about a dime if you want to print it out. Um, now, the other question, which is, do you need to do any 3D modeling to do 3D printing? And the answer to that is absolutely not. Now, listen to, listen to this bit, though, because I want to be very transparent. My first year in 3D printing, which I easily printed the most stuff, all right, um, I never even looked into doing any kind of 3D modeling whatsoever because I did not need to. The, the most of what I do still to this day, even though I know about 3D print and 3D modeling now, I still almost never touch that stuff, almost never. I'm saying almost never, as in 99%, I just want to be very transparent. What I will say is that knowing about simple editing goes a long way, but you really don't need to do it. Now, let me put it this way. Knowing how to download a recipe from the internet for a, 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 on how to make cookies and making the cookies at home is what we're talking about almost all the time whenever we're doing 3D printing, at least in the context of board gaming, in the context of what I'm going to be showing you today. There's a difference between the person who's the chef who comes up with knowing which kind of ingredients, wet and dry and so forth, and knowing how long you'll need to put that in the oven. That's the job of the modeler who shares their, their, their models online. You just download it and print it. That is your 3D printing enthusiast. That is not up to you to come up with the models. You don't need to do any modeling. If you know how to do modeling, you're probably going to enjoy it even more. But none of that is going to stop you from enjoying everything we're going to be talking about today. Okay? So, no, you don't need to do any 3D modeling to do 3D printing. 3D printing is about getting a 3D model, which can come from any source whatsoever, you take it and you print it. Another example and a final one I'll give you, you could be a writer that knows how to write books, but maybe you just want to print a couple of the pages from that book. You don't need to be a writer, right? So uh, moving on to the last question, what's the catch? There is a catch. There's definitely a catch. The catch is this is not a hobby that is made or is ready for the mass market. It is really, let's put it this way. These machines get out of tune all the time. They need constant calibration. They need love and attention. When they break down, you're less and less on your own because there are a lot more shops that do 3D printing services nowadays. So they'll probably be able to help you fix them. But in most cases, you're going to be on your own. When you're going to buy them, they're going to come completely disassembled. And I don't mean, oh, I need to uh, put this part here and there and snap and that. there we go. No, I'm talking about the belts are off. Everything is to be done. 
it could take you hours to to set it up for the first time. In my case, my first printer it almost took me a day. Uh, and if you're not technical, it's going to be a little bit longer, but it doesn't mean it's out of your out of the scope of you being able to do this. I want to be again very transparent here. I've been in IT for more than 25 years. Look at this gray. This is all IT gray, all right. Um, I've been troubleshooting stuff every single day for most of my career life. And I thought this would be a joke, but because it was mechanically inclined, which I never really did before, I never really did mechanical IT troubleshooting and mechanical troubleshooting, it kind of took me by surprise. I eventually had to learn it, but I had to learn a new skill by doing so. Because in, in the case of 3D printing, especially one of the two technologies, if a screw is too tight or a belt is too loose, it shows up in your prints. So uh, it, you really need to be careful with your machines. This is not to scare people off, it's to give a very clear warning that this is not a hobby that you can pick up like this. You're gonna to have to invest some of your time to get into it. But once you do, once you get over the learning bump, it gets a lot smoother. And thankfully, it's totally doable to get into this hobby because there's it's it's not as niche as it used to be. There are a lot a lot of online resources to help you out. You just need to know what which questions to ask, and kind of you will need to do a lot of reading up or watching videos. Uh, in that sense. Um, your options are basically all the kinds of online help and tutorials of forums. All that stuff is going to be a huge help. Even better, even however, COVID is not really helping. Uh, local maker spaces are a huge help as well because in many cases, at least one person is going to be a 3D printer enthusiast and they'll be able to help you out with some questions you may have. Uh, local libraries, by the way, also have more and more uh, 3D printers which you can rent by the hour or by the print. So if you don't want to, if you want to like do a soft dive, you can always go over there and use the, theirs. That could always be always something you can do. And if all of the above is just too much, still not your bag. Well, you can still keep listening because a lot of the things I'm going to be talking to about today, they're going to be relevant regardless. You can still look around for models and parts that you will want to use, and you can ask a designer or someone who does 3D printing to help you out and print those parts. You'll just have the files on hand and ask them to do it. And in, in fact, in many cases, the designers of these, these parts usually have a link where you can order the parts from them. They'll just print it out for you. Um, so hopefully I didn't scare off too many people, but again, let's be clear, let's be transparent. It's not always super easy to get into 3D printing, but I swear to you, once you're in it, it's it goes a lot smooth, a lot smoother than the first few weeks. Um, which brings us to the technical part. Now, I've um, the technical part here is going to be sh literally tailored to people who are board gamers. I'm not here to explain to you about every single thing that exists when it comes to 3D printing and the technical aspects. I only want to talk about the parts that are going to be mostly interesting for board gamers. I want to talk about the aspects that will be of major interest. Let's put it that way. So it's a very high level view of all of that. There's a lot of stuff we're going to be not talking about and that's normal. All right. Um, so uh, without further ado, let's start off and look into what actually 3D printing is. Because the reality, and I'm stealing that from a 3D TED, uh, from a, a TED talk about one of the designers of one of the two technologies I'm going to be talking about, there is no such thing as 3D printing. It doesn't exist. You don't 3D print something. What you're actually doing is you're printing something in 2D over and over and over again, one cross section at a time. 3D printing basically involves printing slices of objects and stacking them up until you end up with something. A crazier example would be that the Michelin Man is technically a st just stacks of tires. Well, we're making stacks of 
2D prints made out of plastic, which is just thick enough to have some build-up material going on over and over again. Um, so when you think about it, um, there's a lot of ways that you can end up doing slices of an object, especially nowadays when if you, I mean, look, I can microwave a hot dog in 30 seconds in my microwave, right? So probably not enough, but still. Um, so there are a lot of different technologies that you can use to actually come up with slices of objects. There's uh, right now there, probably one of the next big things that's going to come out is uh, sound-based 3D printing. A lot of people are working on that. It apparently is very promising. But for you and me, for Monsieur, and Madame, tout le monde, you're going to have. There are basically two technologies that are readily available for consumer 3D printing. Right. The first one is called FDM printing. It's it means fused deposited material. It's easily one of the most popular, uh, more common printers that you'll find in houses right now. This is the one where you have a spool of plastic. Uh, and when I mean spool, you basically have like a strand of plastic that's being fed through a hot nozzle, which is itself moving around, drawing on a plate. And when it's done with the first section, it moves up just a little bit on top and starts drawing again on top of the last layer. Um, if I were to give you an example, think of a hot glue gun. If you wanted to make a log cabin with a hot glue gun, you know, that would be it. Except obviously the 3D printing process is a lot more precise and the hot glue gun was a bit messy. Um, the second myth method, uh, which is commonly known as resin, is actually known under the term stereolithography apparatus. Now, I don't like to name that too often, and I can't believe I got it on the first try. So, anyway. Um, so, yeah, stereolithography apparatus, twice, uh, better known as SLA or resin printing, it basically looks like sorcery. Uh, this one uh, involves having a, a pool of liquid resin, which is kind of is actually a special liquid uh, that is sensitive to light. And when it's hit with the right right wavelengths of light, it um, or light waves or whatever, I'm not into physics, but um, long story short, when it's hit with the right type of light, that part will harden. And so um, they basically shoot the surface of the resin, uh, the pool of resin, and remove that uh, with, with light, draw the shape that they want, remove that layer and do it again and again and again. And it's actually a little bit faster to print uh, than, than um, FDM. Uh, and it makes fantastic results, but it's very messy. It looks super weird. It kind of looks like... Uh, the T1000 when it comes out because it, when it, when it comes out of uh, from its liquid form into something because it's almost it's almost that it's I, I call it voodoo sorcery whenever I see it normally I would have shown you videos of how that works but unfortunately uh, oh there's a little bit I forgot to mention here but uh, normally I would have shown you videos of that but since we're on Twitch and PAX online and everything I don't want to get into um, potential fights with YouTubers and just steal their videos. Uh, however, I, I strongly suggest you go and check out time lapses of those those types of printers. I have a quick link to show you where you can go. Um, but uh, before I go on, uh, when it comes to resin printing, there's going to be a lot of purists out there going to say, you got DLP, you got SLA, it shouldn't be resin. Look, the thing is, when it comes to resin printing, there are actually two types of resin printers right now. There is one called the SLA. The other one is called DLP. But um, the difference between the two printers is that one shoots a laser drawing the image and the other projects an image of the entire layer at one at a time. It gives, there are plus and minuses to both technologies, um, but they're essentially the same. Right, in the sense that it's the same kind of material, the same process, it's the same technology, is the same is the same material when you're printing with it. So a lot of people kind of just use a shorthand resin, not because of that, but because it's it's also kind of more popularly known as resin printing. So I'm going to use the term resin printing as of now. So uh, just know that it's a little bit more complicated than just saying resin printing, but in the end, it is it is uh, resin based right 
Um, this, is, this is a quick idea of what these printers look like. When you see a printer that looks like this, it's because it's an FDM printer. These are the printers that basically have these nozzles that are being fed plastic through this tube, which normally there would be a spool around here, but you can't really see it. Uh, it's not there right now, and it's kind of a big spool. It would take maybe about this big in size, maybe a quarter of, of the image easily. Uh, and that whole frame would move in the X, Y, and Z planes, drawing in, uh, drawing with that plastic, where instead, when you have a resin printer, it's more of a, of a container of resin, which is protected with usually a special see-through shell, so normal wavelengths of light wouldn't affect the resin. And this plate here would dip down and rise up with the object itself creating it out of liquid as it's being pulled out. Um, I strongly, normally in my presentations, whenever I give them, I've given them to Gen Con, to Virtual Con, I've given them to uh, Dice Tower, all these other places where I gave those, those presentations, I would have these time lapses. Uh, unfortunately, I can't show them here for reasons. Uh, but it's very easy for you to go on YouTube and just look up FDM time lapse or resin printer time lapse, and you're going to find dozens and dozens of examples of what the printing process looks like. Um, I actually have one example to show you. That's one of the old first videos I've made a long time ago when I was doing a print for some of the components I've shown you in the in the pictures, uh, and as you can see. It takes a lot of time whenever you're printing something because it it doesn't move super fast. And once you're done with one layer, it's going to move up by my, literally tenths of millimeters and do that layer again and again. So most prints take a lot of time. I don't, I think for that print, I was already two hours in just to make those four very small ships. So yes, there are prints that can last literally days before they're done. So I'm just going to move on to the next um, to the next slide here. Um, now here's where things are going to get interesting for people who are into board games. Let's look at the precision and the differences between the two prints. This is a miniature that I printed a while back. It's 47 millimeters high. It's actually almost twice as high as a normal typical miniature so it's kind of big right and um, this was for a Cthulhu themed token that I needed and you're looking at it literally with the equivalent of a magnifying glass this if I were to show you this normal size you would barely be able to see all the little details of, of filament that you can actually see if you take a look here you can you can tell this was basically stacks of filament put on top of each other uh, you can even see it sometimes kind of screwing up and not being properly laid down but from an arm's length distance you cannot tell any of these these issues these artifacts however same size same distance of looking at it this is what a resin printer looks like and as you can see, it is by far superior in terms of results. This image is um, is provided to us by uh, Harrow, uh, their Harrowtail Studio. Sorry, I almost forgot, who graciously provided the image for this slide. Um, this is one of his prints, and as you can see, it's so good you can literally see the pores of in the skin. You can see uh, details in the rivets. There is literally no layer of visible. Now, I can tell you that if I wanted to, I could have pushed the quality and the resolution of my print on the left a lot more if I wanted to, but it would still not be as good or even close to this ever, especially if you're looking at it with a magnifying glass. Resin will always be better in terms of, of looks. A lot of people will boast that their printers can make resin quality. And I agree that a lot of printers can definitely surprise you in the terms of quality of print that they can make. This is actually not bad in terms for an FDM. You could still push it more, but 
it's it's going to be a lot of work and a lot of calibration and so forth. And in the end, if you had the choice between the two tools, even if you knew your FVM printer can make a good job, you there's a good chance you would still rather use just your resin printer, right? So that being said, you're probably asking yourself, why would I ever not use a resin printer? Why should I buy an FDM printer instead of resin? And this is where the conversation starts about resin versus FDM. And we're going to do that by starting with the costs. I told you to revisit, we would revisit this slide. Now's the time. So how much does 3D printing cost? FDM printers are between $200 and $300 for an entry range. And by the way, when I mean entry range, let me be clear here. If you need a hammer because you need to nail down a couple of nails from time to time, and you go to the hardware store, are you gonna buy the $10 hammer that will do the job just, just good enough? Or are you gonna buy the super deluxe WeWalt that comes in black and yellow and has a laser guide next to the hammerhead and has a you know, microbial sponge handle and blah, blah, blah. No. Bells and whistles are great for people that use that tool all the freaking time as a livelihood, which is not our case. These printers are good enough. They don't have all the bells and whistles. They will do the job great. If you're at a point where you're just frustrated because you wish you had XYZ, you can probably upgrade them, but you won't still need the two ten three thousand dollar printer ten thousand dollar printer because yes they can go as high as that but there are a lot of different types of technologies and printers and industrial uses that you are not in the need to do so fdm printers entry range consumer base almost always good enough 200 to 300 dollars is pretty much the range when it comes to resin printers, it usually starts more around $250 and upwards of $300, but it's definitely within the range of the same prices that we used to pay for FDM printers. Now, the great, fantastic news, in fact, is that these used to be in the thousands, easily $2,000 for the old form factor when it came out, which was a consumer level one, which is not really the big price difference between a gaming PC when you think about it, and it has its advantages. But uh, long story short, it's going to be slightly more expensive than a normal printer. Where things start to differ a bit, um, it's when we're going to start looking at the price and the cost of materials. So FDM filament is cheap. It's readily available. You can find it almost anywhere. I started seeing some in big retail chains that I would have normally went to to buy movies and music. I'm not going to name names kind of surprised that it started going there but we're at that point but when it comes to resin um, it gets a little bit more expensive because it's a specialized material um, so it costs about 40 40 dollars usd per liter which is about 160 or so dollars a gallon i made the math it came down to that um, the thing is that i don't have empirical evidence to tell you that prints are actually going to be higher cost. I know they're going to be higher cost, but by which margin, I cannot tell you. I can tell you that some people say that a 28 millimeter mini that used to cost you a dime is going to be in the dollar range, if not a couple of dollars. I don't have the proof for that. Mathematically, I'm not sure that's true either. But there's a lot of ways that you can print minis, and there's probably ways you can print them cheaper as well. So that's something to consider. Um, but for sure, your prints are going to be more expensive. That is a given. Now, that's probably not a big enough issue to say that we should completely dump FDM uh, that we should just, I mean, sorry, it's probably not a big enough issue to say that you're going to stay away from resin because of the, these cost differences. They're, they seem to be okay, right? Um, but there's a little bit more to it. And this is where things get really different. The major difference is, um, in terms of, of, of workflow, there are basically three steps that are the same. You're going to start off with, no, let, me, let me rephrase that. When you use an FDM printer or an SLA or resin or a DLP printer, whatever, uh, the first three steps are the same. 
you're going to start looking around for the 3D files that you want to print. Once you have that, you're going to process them to get them ready for print. That step is called slicing. We're going to revisit that at, as the last slide of this presentation, no worries, but it's definitely a big world that we need to look into. So the second thing is that you do, you look at your model, you get it ready for print by slicing it, and then you send it to the printer. With an FDM printer, with a fused deposited material printer, once the print is done, you pick it off of the plate within minutes. In fact, if you have a blade scraper, you can probably just scrape it off the build plate within the second it's done, but I'd rather let it cool off for two or three minutes. I'm a patient person and I can start using it. No problem, no gloves needed, no nothing. With resin, you're only halfway done because once your print is done, uh, you need to do a chemical wash uh, because now your your model is wet with the material that is it, itself hardened because of light. So you want to get that stuff off as quickly as possible before it hardens for reasons, right? So once you're done with that, um, and by the way, you need, I think it's, um, some kind of rubbing alcohol. I'm not exactly sure. I, I don't have a resin printer, so I can't tell you. Um, but uh, I, I'm pretty sure I know which material, uh, which alcohol it is. Once you're you're done with that wash, you want to recuperate your material that you didn't use, because unlike filament, which just stops feeding, in this case, you don't want to let it sit and risk it getting exposed to anything. So you're going to recuperate it. But during the printing process, there's a chance that our shards or particulates that were uh, that were formed during the printing process, or maybe it's dust and particles, whatever. You want to filter that out and recuperate the material for safekeeping. And after that, you need to take your print and you need to put it in the sun or a UV light source like nail salon, lamps, for example, and you let it there for a couple of hours because it needs to cure in the sun. And by the way, the entire process is a gloves on, mask on process for uh, resin. Speaking of which, safety. Uh, FDM printers uh, can use a lot of different types of plastic. There are a lot of different types of spools of plastic that you can buy and use when you're printing. One of these types of plastics called ABS can emit toxic fumes while you're printing. Meaning if you want to print with that stuff, you need to have a well ventilated area if you want to do it. But for board game purposes, I never had to use anything else than another type of plastic called PLA. We're going to talk about that later. ABS is done, is used for rugged outdoor prints or projects that you want to beat the crap out of or to let out in the sun for a long time. But we don't use that, not in board gaming printing. We just use PLA. PLA is food safe. It doesn't emit any odor. It's not toxic, blah, blah. It's actually mostly made out of food. It's actually made out mostly of cornstarch. So there's no safety considerations in terms of uh, other than using an electrical equipment that you obviously, there's always the risks there, but uh, like your toaster, but um, uh, there's no, there's no toxicity or issues. You don't need gloves or anything. You just print it. Once you're done, you take it off and that's it. However, when it comes to um, resin printing, it's a mask on, gloves on process the entire time. First off, just the printing itself is very, uh, emits a very strong odor and it has, it, it permeates easily. So if you have like, you know, textile cushions and in, in the next room that could actually permeate to that, uh, you'll easily get a headache uh, if you're not filtering yourself, uh, fil filtering the air as you're printing. Um, in fact, most of the resin printers, the modern ones, they actually come with, uh, air, air ventil uh, ventilator duct adapters in the back already there, ready to be installed so that you can ventilate that, that air elsewhere. 
Um, and once you're done, well, because of the wash chemical process and everything else, you, you need to keep your gloves on, masks on, and, and so forth. So it's um, the great result that you get out of them comes at the cost of you of being a little bit more careful. It's a more demanding technique, but it's totally worth it, especially if you're in miniature. So that is something you want to take into consideration. Um, just being able to print something without having to worry about gases or, or toxicity or anything is for me, the main deciding factor as to why I don't use one in the house that I have right now. I will be getting one. There's no way I'm not getting a resin printer eventually. I'm just waiting for the right opportunity, place, time, and setup for me to get one. So um, in terms of board gamers, uh, let's look at these two next slides, which will help you understand exactly what tool is best for what. Uh, the main differences that we have when it comes to uh, to the two printers, the two technologies, well, it's very easy to determine that resin is by far the best looking type of print that you can get. We're talking movie prop quality prints, right? If you want to, if you want to completely replicate something and someone would not be able to tell where the hell that thing came from, you'd go with a resin printer easily. Uh, but everything else, when it comes to expensive prints or the var variety of materials, like I said, PLA and, and, and I mean, uh, FDM has a lot of different types of materials and they also come in a lot of different colors and plastics. Again, I'll show you that a little bit later. Um, that goes to FDM and that opens up a lot of creative possibilities as you can be able to see a bit later. And another thing I didn't mention uh, is that the build plates for these two machines tend to vary greatly. FDM machines, the spool ones, they tend to have a bigger build plate, easily two to three times bigger for the same price than a resin printer, which is usually the size of, not unlike that of a cell phone. Um, so th there is no job that's too big for a printer. If something goes beyond the size of the machine itself, the, the, the build plate itself, you can just break that part down into different pieces and print it separately and glue everything together after that. Um, but obviously it's a lot more easy if you don't have to do that all the time, especially if your projects involve printing big things. If you want to print big things, they're actually big printer, big FDM printers are a lot cheaper to get than re big resin printers. You can get big resin printers, but they're, they're, they don't they don't come cheap, right? So um, here, what I like to do is give you an idea of what tool I would rather use for any given job when it comes to uh, board gaming. Basically, all the stuff that we talked about a little, a little bit earlier before at the beginning of the presentation would go a little bit like this, right? Um, when it's a, a clear grave, to me, it means it's a clear winner. Uh, when it's dark gray, it means I would rather use that tool if I could. But any of these tools, they would still be, any one of these two printers can do everything I'm listing down here, all right? No printer is limited in terms of what it can do. It's just a question of what tool would you rather use to do X, Y, Z. So when it comes to miniatures, it's no contest miniatures are by far best done on an F on a resin printer, but you can still do them on that FDM printer. Look, I have some, some minis right here. Like this is the Cthulhu thing I was talking to you about. Not that big. Can you tell the problem with it? I can't, you know. Uh, I have my Terraforming Mars first player token here. I printed a... Uh, a complete reproduction of the Curiosity rover. Can you see the problems with it? I can't. No problem. There's You can make so many things with those printers. They're crazy. But if I had a resin printer, you would freak out because it would be that good, right? When it comes to board game components, they'd be better looking on, an F, on a resin printer, but you tend to have to make a lot of them. And because of the entire workflow process, sorry, for a resin printer is a little bit more complex. 
they're good enough on an FDM printer, but I would rather use them uh, on an FDM printer because it's it's easy for me to print a lot of different parts all at the same time, which is not a super good idea. But uh, because if one part screws up, it could screw up everything else at the same time. But it's still for me my my, my choice uh, if I had to make a lot of different parts. Uh, when it comes to board game inserts or custom containers or dice trays, dice towers, things that are re relatively big, I'd rather do it on the on the uh, FDM printer. I can do it with a resin printer, but I'm limited by size and I have to break them down all the time. Uh, and honestly, I don't really care about the look of the panels if they're resin-like. It doesn't really matter. I don't look at that. So for me, it's good. It's more than good enough. It does a great job. When it comes to props, good enough on an FDM printer, but if you have a resin printer, you give your your RPG players, for example, class emblems, they're going to look crazy good. And they're going to be looking at that from up close. They're going to have a lot of fun with that. So obviously, I would rather do it with a resin printer. And when it comes to resin printing, same thing. Now, this is easily one of the to each his own. But if you want to make build, build big buildings, probably easier with an FDM printer. But if you want to make like small parts that are very mini level quality, you're going to go with a resin printer by far. Which brings us to the very obvious conclusion that when it comes to um, when it comes to uh, which pr which printer is better for you. I, my personal opinion is this. I think that when it comes to board games in general, you're better off with an FDM printer. But when it comes to people who are mini painters, for example, people who are really into miniatures and the level of quality of miniatures is very important, you go with resin, right? Um, I've noticed a lot of uh, miniature painters starting to get into the whole resin printing game because a lot of uh, companies uh, actually are now making Kickstarter campaigns to have custom minis uh, created, modeled, and sold in, in campaigns specifically for people who are into resin printing because it's obviously a whole new world for these guys. It's a fantastic thing. But to talk about miniatures and resin gets is something that really gets things out of scope. Uh, and uh, of this presentation. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to I'm going to basically point you guys to a couple of of great resources you can look into because these guys are really into not only really great media painting and, and crafting, uh, but they're also uh, they've also shown a lot of interest in miniature printing lately. So Miniac and Black Magic Craft are probably my two favorite sources right now. But you also have 3D printed tabletop and spiky bids that mention those a lot. In fact, 3D printed tabletop has a lot to show when it comes to board gaming, tabletop, and all these kinds of things as well. Um, if you want to have more minis than you can throw for your mini printer, like we're talking high level quality, cast quality, you want to go to myminifactory.com. A lot of your models are free. A lot of them are not. They're probably 50-50 at this point. Um, they have a lot of stuff for the miniature enthusiast who likes to print their own things. We're going to talk about that a little bit later because they also have board game stuff. But when it comes to printing minis on resin, can't can't you would it's, it would hard to be worse than to than going somewhere else. So I probably didn't say that right. Blame that on my English not being the first language. Um, but I'm pretty sure you understand what I mean. So uh, that being said, I'm going to concentrate on FDM as of now for the rest of the presentation, mainly because I'm not saying resin has no place in board gaming printing. I, I keep saying you can make anything with either one. It's just more practical. And because of that, more people are most likely going to veer towards FDM printers for cost, ease of use, um, no toxicity issue, and so forth and so on. But especially because the materials are easily available and easily usable and have a lot of variety, um, it's probably one of the better solutions. Again, that is my personal opinion. So that, that's where I'm going to veer off. 
uh, for the rest of the presentation. I have no beef against resin. Like I said, I'm getting one. I cannot be more transparent than, than what I just said. So <clears throat> going back to uh, the world of FDM printers, uh, like I said, uh, FDM printers use something called uh, plastics that, are, that come in spools, and they have a lot of different types of materials, ABS, PLA, PEG, so forth. The one that you want to hear about, the one that you want to buy is called PLA. PLA is non-toxic. It is food safe. It is mostly made of cornstarch. And most importantly, it is very reliable when you, when you print with it. it. It doesn't tend to have a lot of failure rate because some more exotic materials, I'm saying exotic probably a little bit too exaggeratedly here, but a lot of the materials uh, that exist beyond PLA can be a bit more finicky. Uh, they can be more, they have humidity problems, all kinds of things that you need to take into consideration. Uh, but PLA is very rarely fails. So uh, it's a great material to use. It's a lot less frustrating to use it. And like I said, it comes in a lot of different looks and materials. These are just examples. So to give you an idea of how the different types of, of looks and materials you can get out of them, um, I'm going to give you a quick list of what I know by heart, right? So you have your pretty much any color you can think of is going to be there. So you're not just going to find blue. You're going to find sky blue, lake blue, powder blue, dark blue, whatever. You can find any color shade that you probably need for your projects. But if that's not enough, you can even get all of the colors. You can have what they call rainbow colored PLA, which is a, 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 a filament that is gradually constantly changing color. And there are a lot of different types of rainbow colored PLA. I mean, some are specific to certain shades of color. Others are very dynamic. You name it, you can think of it. Um, there is even marble PLA. So if you want to make statue looking types of prints, you can do that. I'm actually working on creating a bust of uh, popular figureheads so I could put my VR headset on it because, you know, why not? I can do that. Um, you have transparent PLAs. Now, this I think is actually more realistic on a resin printer because um, the, the transparent colors that I've used myself uh, didn't give me clear looking results like that. Um, probably this is being post treated, but I just want people to understand that there's also transparent PLA, which I use for water tiles. I have a bunch of transparent blue PLA ready for that. You have metallic looking PLA. So if you want to print coins and stuff like that, you can use that. You have copper, brass, gold, silver, you name it, it's out there. Uh, and it's really shiny. And by the way, of course, I bought some silver looking PLA because I printed myself a, a, a ingot of Beskar, you know, why not? Uh, you got glow-in-the-dark PLA. If you're old like me, you remember G.I. Joe's Zartan figurine that turned green out when he was in the sun. You can print with that stuff as well. You have thermal sensitive, will change color depending on the temperature. You have nylon and silk based PLA, which has a very different smooth looking uh, finish to it. You have carbon fiber. Um, the creases I've seen is wood based. Now this picture is uh, also shared to us from another user. Um, you can sand and stain it, which is what this person did here. Um, this is this one here. I printed myself. It's a failed print. You can see it here. I didn't finish the entire bowl, but I kept it because it was so practical. And to be honest, it looks like wood. It doesn't feel like it at all. Um, in fact, I would tell, I would say that it's more like if plastic and cardboard had a baby, this is what it, you get. It's kind of weird, but very solid, very solid too, which is kind of a happy yet strange effect. Um, you can expect the prices of these colors to, and, and types of material, uh, of types of PLA to be more expensive the more exotic they get. Um, single colors are the, the ones that I said were around the 25 USD range. Multicolor probably is at another $5. Um, when I bought gold, I think it cost me about $32 or something like that. 
Uh, and the last thing I want to mention on 3D printing technology is something called slicing. Um, again, you, you could have a full presentation only on, on slicing because there is a lot to talk about it. Um, because it is the entire software side of the 3D printing process. I will give you only the rundown really quickly of what you'll probably want to know. So slicing software is what makes it possible for you to make any 3D printed file a reality. It's the, it's the thing that makes it possible for you to take any file you find to, and bring it to life with a 3D printer. Uh, it basically takes the model and analyzes it and will be able to tell you what your machine will need to do. Well, not tell you, but basically create a file giving machine instructions to your printer to know what it needs to do. Uh, and how it will do it, how it will behave, how it will basically function. So you need to give it at least a couple of settings, such as layer thickness, how much infill you want, like you want your model to be fill or filled or empty or somewhere in between. Um, you can determine the thickness of the exterior of, of the walls, the shells, the top, the bottom parts. If you'll need supports, supports is when you need to print something and there's something that's obviously going to be hanging out in the air, like the letter T standing upright. If you're printing slices at some point, what happens when you're at the letter T here? What where does this come from? Well, the supports are basically things that you print in advance, knowing that at some point there's going to be something with an overhang. To give you an idea of what we're talking about here, uh, I have a quick example about layer thickness. Layer thickness is probably the most important and if not the feature you're going to be changing or at least taking into consideration for any print. Layer thickness can be easily attributed to the resolution of your print, all right? So in other words, uh, the thinner your layers, the more slices you'll have and the better looking your print will look like. But the more slices you add, the more time your print will take. So uh, here's a quick example. Here's a model of a snake man, which you can barely tell right now. Uh, but this is what my software, my slicing software was giving me as a preview. If I use the thickest slice I could come up with for my machine, I don't know if I could go thicker than that. But if I double the number of layers by, by sorry, if I cut down by half the thickness of my layer, it's already looking a lot better. But I've already doubled the time because I have twice as many layers. And if I go even further than that, it looks even better. But now the time is getting really crazy high. But that's fine because it's probably worth it. Look at how clean those edges are now compared to before. I'm going to revert back in my presentation here. Look at how you had steps everywhere. And now it's way better looking, right? So these are some of the settings you'll tell your printer before you print. You know, this is how you tell your printer, print something like this. OK, <clears throat> now the good news is that most, if not some of the best slicing software is that you'll need to print with, they're free. I uh, Ultimaker Cura is by far one of the most used ones. It's free. And because it's free, it means it's very easy for you to find some help for it because a lot of people will have troubleshooting tips for you and so forth. But there are others like Slicer, literally called Slicer, except the the last E is a, the number three. Um, there, are, there are slicers that are uh, that you need to pay for, which are considered professional grade, such as um, uh, Simplify 3D, which I own. But I still use Cura very often because Cura happens to be, I find it very user friendly compared to others. And by the way, if all this stuff seems complicated, the good news is that they almost all have some kind of wizard mode where you just say, literally those four settings it will ask you how quickly do you want this or how pretty do you want this and go but if you want you can go in every single micro detail of how your printer will behave for any given thing and that would be completely out of the scope of this presentation what is interesting to you however the board gamer and especially the miniature printer
Um, almost every, I actually can't think of a single slicer software that doesn't do this, but because there are a lot of different settings that are possible for any given project, they usually let you save those settings for said project. So for example, if I'm printing a whole bunch of terraforming Mars tiles, and I have this specific settings because I have this specific requirement, I have my terraforming Mars settings, right? That I'll save under that word, that name. Now you can share those settings with other people. These settings are easily exportable and importable. And that is a big thing when it comes to miniatures. A lot of people for any given printer, they'll say, I'm using this printer with Cura and I got the best results with these settings and they share it online. And that happens all the time, all the time. So one of the things you want to look out eventually are, you know, when you get a little bit more at ease with the whole process is what settings are other people using and download them and try them out for yourself, especially for miniatures and terrain printing. So that being said, that pretty much covers the part that we had Hello everyone, this is Kevin from Treasure Coast Games, here to give you a quick introduction to our game, Hamster Scramble. Hamster Scramble is a brand new fusion between two familiar genres, a platformer and a match 3 puzzle game. It's separated into two distinct sections, the puzzle boards up above and the platforming stage below. In most puzzle games, you just have the game board and throw pieces at it from a static location. In Hamster Scramble, however, you have full control over a character in the stage below. It is also here that the hamsters will scramble. The hamsters enter from the top of the stage via pipes running up the sides of the area and loop back up when they reach the bottom. In order to make matches on the puzzle board, players will have to chase down and catch the hamsters. Each hamster has a color and when caught becomes a ball of the same color carried by the player. The player can then aim and throw the ball at the board to try and make matches. 
Making matches sends orbs at the opponent's board, filling up a meter that adds a line when full, pushing the opponent's board downward. If a player's board hits the center line, they lose. The platforming and puzzles themselves are rather straightforward, so I'll skip to the fun part, swapping. In Hamster Scramble, making matches isn't the only way to attack your opponent. Players also have the ability to swap into their opponent's side of the stage for a limited time. While there, you can harass your opponent and disrupt their game plan by throwing balls at their board, stealing their hamsters for yourself, or straight up finishing them off. Players can defend themselves from an invading opponent by attacking them, which will knock their hamsters out of their hands and stun them for a short time. Finding the right times and positions to swap is key to getting the most out of it. Each stage in Hamster Scramble has its own unique look, platform layout, and mechanics, such as slippery ice platforms and bubbles that catch hamsters and carry them upward. Players will have to adjust their strategies depending on which stage they are playing in. In our demo here at PAX Online, up to four players can enjoy local and online multiplayer in four of the game's stages. There's also the Hamster Village to explore, and a taste of the game's single player content as well. So please come try out the game, and have a great time at PAX Online! Hey, Dr. Ken Dutton Register here from Excite Science in Brisbane, Australia. Excite Science is a creative studio explaining complex science in fun ways. And at this stage, we're really focusing on cancer education. 
from cancer themed escape rooms to virtual reality to AR driven art galleries. And the project that I'm talking about today is Malignancy VR. As a cancer researcher of over 10 years, I know firsthand talking to the general community that there's a lot of misunderstanding and core fundamental knowledge gaps of what cancer is. And this isn't surprising because cancer is incredibly complex. But are there new technologies or new ways? What's up everybody? Welcome to PAX Online. Uh, we are going over our panel, which is called uh, Not Your Therapist, um, and we are going to be talking about managing mental health in streaming. So um, I want to, in, first and foremost, introduce our panelists, go over a little bit of uh, background of what this panel is going to consist of, and then we have got some questions for everybody that um, will maybe help about understanding mental health and streaming, as well as um, community management. So I would love for our panelists to introduce themselves and um, tell us a little bit about your stream and uh, what, you, what you do. Uh, I'll start us off. Hi, everyone. It's Anxiety. I'm a mental health talk show host on Twitch. I'm also an author. Uh, I talk to professionals and people living with mental health conditions alike. Uh, and I have a wonderful, wonderful, warm community as well. Celeste? Hi, uh, I'm Celeste. I am a mental health streamer. Uh, I also stream games. In real life, I am a scientist. Um, and that plays into my whole community. Um, that's it, actually. Uh, okay, I'm uh, Dr. M, also known as Gamer Doc. I'm a medical doctor who treats gamers, uh, and I run a stream on Wednesday nights where we talk about health and wellness as related to video gaming, and obviously mental health is a big part of that. Um, so, you know, looking forward to having this conversation with all these bright minds. Kilmer? I can go next. My name is Dr. Elizabeth Kilmer. I'm a clinical psychologist uh, and the director of education and training at Game to Grow. I don't stream, but I am here to help answer some of the like mental health and boundary related questions. And uh, my name is Shauna Spain. My handle is like seven spoon. I run a community where we play a lot of Dungeons and Dragons. We do it politely and safely. I talk a lot about that. Um, I'm, I'm an accessibility streamer, so I'm both autistic and I'm an ambulatory wheelchair user. So I talk a lot about that. Um, I'm a big advocate for that community. And uh, I, you know, I have opinions, so that's probably why I'm here. <laughs> And that's what that's what we need is opinions. I'm mm -hmm. uh, Emory, Dr. Emory Daniel. I'm an assistant professor at Appalachian State University. I'm also the marketing uh, director at Geeks Like Us. My handle is at Fusro Doc. Uh, so please come visit me. Uh, the reason that this panel was assembled with just so many amazing, talented people here is um, this actually stemmed from a study. Um, that myself a, and two colleagues, Dr. Arian Fauché and Dr. Steph Orm, started to work on about understanding toxicity and privacy issues uh, when it comes to streaming. Um, and we really wanted to, we found some kind of anecdotal evidence when we were talking to streamers about what are their experiences and um, a little bit about about those issues of, again, toxicity, um, as well as what do they keep close to their person, um, how they feel like um, they keep their privacy and so forth. And so while those things were somewhat apparent, um, and they very much were, uh, there were also seemed to be a lot of communication while we were going through it about this whole notion of, quote, I'm not your therapist. This came up quite a bit. Uh, and so I, tried to reach out to everybody in this group and uh, with uh, overwhelming enthusiasm, which I was thrilled to see so many people that were enthusiastic about this topic, um, I wanted to ask some questions about uh, not only the idea of what this is about, but also uh, what are some things that we can learn from it? What are some things that we can uh, take away and 
use in applicable streaming contexts. Uh, so for those who are just starting streaming, that's kind of a thing that uh, I'd really like to focus on uh, by asking these amazing people here. So the exact line of I'm not your therapist came up many times within the interviews uh, with strong agreement. So my question is for y'all, what are some experiences that you've had with this issue as it's been kind of consistent rhetoric? And why do you think this is so common and an important thing to talk about? I mean, I could start if you'd like. Uh, so because specifically my streams are about mental health on Saturdays, I have a, a show called Self Care Saturdays where we pick a mental health topic and we break it down from a peer reviewed scientific perspective and then see what we can take from that and apply it to our everyday lives, right? And because of that, I get a lot of people who are, um, struggling with mental health and when they see me talking about these topics they feel it's it's you know it's one of those relationships where i'm talking to all of the chat but everyone in the chat is talking directly to me right so what ends up happening is that sometimes they feel like i'm the one who can help them with their specific issue um but one of the things that i've had to learn over the years is that that's not my job i'm an advocate and i can take you to resources that can help you, but at the end of the day, like I can't be the one to give you specific advice about your specific situation. I can tell you what I've done when I've been in similar situations. I can try and direct you towards like help, um, but that can also be really difficult for some people because they see like the streamer as a person who's giving them this helpful information and they kind of build this relationship and they assume that that relationship goes both ways. Um, and one of the, the more difficult aspects is having to specifically set that boundary and at times have to say, no, I can't help you with this. I can yeah. send you to this, this and this, but specifically telling them like, no, and that's I, hard. I've had, I've had a similar experience and I'm, I'm very vocal about being autistic and I, I talk a lot about it. And so I'll have people approach me and say, hey, so you're autistic. Can you tell me if I'm autistic? And the first thing that I... I tell them, oh, so sorry. The first thing that I tell them is um, that I, I want to talk to them and I want to share my experience with them. But if they would like a diagnosis, they need to go talk to a doctor. And that I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm happy to talk to you about what getting a diagnosis might mean for you. And so I have a lot of conversations with people where I have to, I have to very gently remind them that this is my experience. This is what I've gone through. This is some, these are some resources you can look into. This is what the world looks like with a piece of paper and without one uh, for me. And uh, mostly what it ends up being is a lot of listening and a lot of uh, gentle deflection to, I can't tell you if you're autistic. <laughs> I can't tell you if you need to use a wheelchair. I can encourage you if that's something you want to pursue. And I can, you know, I can, I can be there for you and support you, but I can't, I can't, I don't have that knowledge. And I think that's okay. I think that's good to have people like me out in the world that don't, can't do autistic diagnosis but can have that conversation with somebody from that, from that level, you know, and it took me a really long time to get there. A lot of my friends are doctors and it's horribly intimidating. I have a, I have a very nice bachelor's degree and, um, and it's not in anything related to, to this stuff. So I, but it, I eventually got to a place where I was like, no, this is good. Then I started running a game and a character was like, I would like to play somebody with a disability just to see what it's like. And I was like, no. Because I'm not your therapist, so I don't want to, they were like, I, I want to see if I have this, and so I want to play through it. And I know GMs that will do that, and that's absolutely fine. I'm not comfortable doing that as a GM, because I don't have that skill set. I don't have a skill set where I can run a group where I can help you through a mental health issue. I just don't. <laughs> My groups are, for, are, are not for that. And so I, I, that's a good place to have as well, I think. Uh, I think I'm going to add to that since we're on the advocacy uh, portion of this. Uh, I also experienced something similar to what Celeste is describing, uh, where people will come in and they'll be like, okay, but give me advice. Uh, and especially this is hard because in the beginning of every stream, one of the things <clears throat> I ask is if there's something that you feel like you can't tell people because you know they would be bummed out, this is a great place if you want to vent about it. And I make that 
and setting that specific boundary that you're just venting. This is not going to be where people are going to give you advice. This is just your place to say, I'm really freaking sad and nobody accepts that as an acceptable, like that is, that is not an okay thing for me to normally to talk about. And I just want to say that I'm sad here. Um, I've also set up in our Discord, we have two separate rooms. Uh, one is called Just Venting and one is Support. Uh, and the, the Support will reply. Uh, and the Just Venting room is specifically for anybody to just like write out, here's what I just need to get out into the world. Uh, and the Support room is where things get tricky. You know, we have all the disclaimers that nobody's here as a doctor. Um, and, you know, you'll, you'll see things that people expect you to reply to that unfortunately, like I have to step in or one of my moderators steps in and says like, we cannot help you with that specifically, but like that situation sucks. And just ensuring that you validate while continuously reinforcing those boundaries. And that can be definitely exhausting. Yeah. Validation is important and those boundaries are so important. Yeah, I think the the advocacy and the the validation is so important, right? And and speaking as a mental health professional, um, there are a lot of things that I can do. I can diagnose people. I can offer therapy. I run therapeutic uh, tabletop role playing games, so I can do those right. things. Um, but that's a very different kind of relationship than sitting with someone and saying, "Man, I've been there too," and I understand. And it's a different kind of relationship on purpose, right? They're they're both really really valuable. Um, and they're both really val valuable. And in, you know, all of my millions of years of graduate school, uh, we talk a lot about boundaries, right? We talk a lot about how do you set boundaries with your clients? How do you set boundaries around work? How do you set boundaries? And we don't talk about that just in everyday life, which is ridiculous yeah. because I feel like I spend most of my time with my clients talking about how to set healthy boundaries. Because it is so important and setting healthy boundaries and setting healthy expectations is what allows us to feel safe and allows us to get really deep and allows us to get really genuine in relationships. But if I don't know when someone's going to stop pushing or I don't feel comfortable saying like, please stop, then neither of us is really going to be able to be genuine. Neither of us is going to get what we're, we're looking for out of that, that relationship. Um, and I have been in discord servers before where like the the support channel was there but without all of those boundaries and that's a, that can be a really scary place for anybody to be because if you happen to be in that server and someone comes in in crisis it suddenly feels like it is totally your responsibility to save that person's right. life right yeah and you may not have the training or the skills or the spoons yeah. to deal with it in that moment. And that's why your Discord server should never be a crisis line. Mm -hmm. But if those boundaries and those guidelines aren't set up, you can feel really, really stuck because now someone is, this is a person in this server needing this help. Yeah, and you feel like so you, hard. Yeah. you don't know what to do. And people so, will, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say that in, in our Discord, we have a very specific protocol for what to do with people who are in crisis. And um, it maybe doesn't sound like the nicest thing, right? But actually what my what my moderators and I do is that if someone comes in and they're talking about topics that are like, you know, st stuff like suicide that can be like, or self-harm that can be very triggering to others. And they're talking about it in a way that makes us like worried for them. The first thing that we'll actually do is, this sounds weird, we're going to quarantine them. Um, so we actually take that user out from like the general chats and we have a specific chat where like the moderators and myself will like reach out to them and be like, hey, I understand that you're in a crisis. Can we help you by directing you to these specific resources? And like, it sounds a little bit a good idea. rough to like mm -hmm. remove them from the community, um, like at that moment. Well, but you have to protect your community and that person at the same time. Exactly. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't necessarily want to risk someone giving advice to that person that ends up being harmful. And I don't want to risk yeah. their situation triggering others. Right. So we'll kind of like reach out to them, try to get them connected with as many resources as we can. And once they kind of come back and are in a more stable place, then they're like essentially reintroduced to the community. Absolutely. And think about this. Um, if, if Discord was in person, right? If, in, if we're in like a crowded restaurant and someone is in crisis, do you just keep them in the middle of that crowded restaurant? Oh, right. No. no. You don't. That's not helpful for anyone in the restaurant. It's not helpful for that person. It's going to no, become yeah. really, 
overwhelming, right? You work really hard to give that person some privacy, get them to the resources that can help them, right? You're going to call 911. You're going to ask if there's a doctor around, but you're not going to be like, cool, there's a person collapsed in the middle of the floor. Right. Everybody just watch. Right. Yeah. Right. That's um, fair. And especially when we we kind of remove that, right? And you were behind a keyboard and you're not seeing anyone and you're not talking to anyone and you have no idea what's going on uh, in someone's life. Having, um, be, if you are in a Discord and you think this Discord is a safe space where no one is going to come in in crisis and all of a sudden someone now comes in in crisis, that, that can trigger other people to feel really, really uncomfortable. They might feel really, really distressed. Uh, and this may be the place where they had come to kind of calm themselves down a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, but now if there's someone in crisis, it, it, it doesn't do that. The other thing Wait. is, go ahead. No, you go ahead. The other thing is there are some really good crisis lines out there. And now I'm not mm -hmm. saying if you've called a crisis line and you've had a bad experience and that's on you because I'm not saying that everyone who works at a crisis line is amazing. I wish that they were. Um, but crisis lines exist for a reason. Most of them are run really, really well. And you're when you call a crisis line, you're talking to someone who's trained to deal with someone in crisis, to talk to someone, to be there with you in crisis, and someone who's consented to that, who says, I, I got on, this is my shift, I'm ready to do this, right. right? I think sometimes when you pop in a Discord server, you might be popping on as a mod is like about to go to bed. And they don't have the, the, they might really, really, really want to help you, but they might not have the training and they might not have the energy to do that right now. And that is okay because they are people too. The thing that I've heard a lot that I think is uh, scariest to me is that um, people have talked to me and been like, well, how could you have turned this person away? Right? Like, like Celeste was saying, isolating them or me, uh, somebody comes into my stream and they say I'm suicidal and I go, okay, here's the resources. Like we kind of do what you do in your discord, but we do that on stream. We, uh, mm -hmm. we kind of put them aside, we time them out and then moderators talk to them and send them resources and everything. And people have asked me, they're like, well, why, why don't you, why can't you help? And they've said things like, well, I will try to help, you know, until my dying breath. Well, somebody actually said that to me. They're like, because it's so important and I don't want people to feel alone and uh, I just always reinforce like that's fantastic if you have the full bandwidth and you are prepared and you have the you know background to be able to do that otherwise you could potentially hurt someone more by playing a therapist than yeah you that's why I... by sending them to the resources they're supposed to go to so it's not yeah it's not that you're rejecting that person it's that you are bringing them closer to the correct destination than attempting yeah. to play one pretend to be one yourself that's exactly why I don't do it in my server. I don't have I don't have that many mods. I have mods that babysit me, not the community. I you uh, your your communities sound amazing, and I love what you've set up. But I don't have the resources to do that. So my best bet is to is to not do that. That's what I, I know. We've been talking a lot about Discord, but I do this exact thing, same thing in my D and D games. Is uh, if somebody's having a crisis, we don't play or they don't play. It's not because I'm being mean. It's because they're not bringing their self to the table, they're bringing their crisis to the table. And I want them to take the space to take care of themselves. I do everything I can for them as a friend, but that doesn't include me being like, all right, let's get to the bottom of, you know, and being their therapist. I, I, I'm not equipped to do that. It'll set me off. I, there's a reason I didn't go to school for this. And maybe someday I'll grow a community like, like these lovely ladies or humans here. And um, may, maybe I won't, maybe I'll just, I'll lurk in each of your communities and watch how cool you are. Yeah, that's fine too. Yeah. Gamer Doc, you've been awfully quiet. Do you have any thoughts? I mean, you guys have all said some pretty awesome things. I think it's it's really interesting because as a as a medical doctor, right, like you guys are all saying I'm not a therapist and I'm also not your therapist. It's like, yeah, like we are equipped to handle these things, but it's it's not the the time or the place sometimes, right? right. Like in order for me to be an efficient doctor, like I would be a terrible doctor for all of you because we don't have that type of boundaries. You know, when I'm at work, one of my roommates used to be, you know, used to work with me. And when I'm at work, I'm a very different person, right? I have to, as a younger looking, um, you know, woman, I have to do a lot of things to demand respect. And uh, one of them is setting up really strict boundaries with my patients, like we were talking about earlier. So, you know, giving, even if you were 
a medical provider and even if you wanted to be the person's therapist who was coming to you in crisis, you probably don't have the correct boundaries set up to be an effective, you know, Mm -hmm. care provider. Um, That's a really good point. I was in a Discord server that I chose to left to leave um, because I got at like put in as a moderator. There was a little bit of miscommunication, but I was put in as a moderator and all of a sudden there's a crisis happening in this Discord server. And I have the training to, to handle crises, but that was not something that I had consented to be a part of in that Discord server. I didn't have the energy. I didn't have the time. I didn't have the context, right? I didn't know this person. I didn't know where they were coming from. I didn't know that this was a common occurrence. I didn't know, like, I didn't have the information that I needed to keep that person safe or help intervene. And so like, I've got lots of training. I feel really good with crisis management, but not with, not with a username, not with a username from someone on the internet that I have no idea what's going on. I don't have any of the context or the information I need to help that person. Whereas sending that person to a crisis line, right? They're going to provide a little bit more information. Now, when you call a crisis line, you do not have to provide your name and you don't have to provide uh, your address. I recommend that you do, but you don't have to. Um, but the, the context wasn't there for me to be able to effectively help this person. And so what it did was it just prolonged this person pain as I was trying to connect them with a crisis line. And it put me in a really crappy situation. Um, that was, that was really hard because I wanted to help and I wanted to support, but I didn't have the, the context or the resources I needed to do that. One thing I, I've, the one thing I I do in my streams when I can tell, and so I'm autistic, and if I don't know you like super well, then it's a little difficult for me to read anybody. So if any of y'all ever get mad at me, you'll you'll have to tell me. I won't notice. But uh, what I can do in in um, streams is uh, I run this uh, one shot. Uh, I call it Dungeons and Doggos. Everybody gets a pre generated dog character. I dump you in a in a in a module that's pre written, and everybody gets to howl at stuff. And um, I have run those both online and offline, thank you, on offline. And sometimes people think they're totally ready to do it, but they're not. But then they, they get overwhelmed by the, but I agreed to do this. I, or, or something else. Let's just say that's the, the example I'm using. What I can do there is, is just make space for them. Um, maybe that's not the right time to recommend a crisis. Uh, maybe it's not the right time to do something like quarantine them. Maybe it's the kind of thing where it's like, cool. I'm going to keep running this game. You hang out. As soon as you're ready to jump in, you jump in. If you want to jump in via text, I've already established that before we get started, that if at any point you want to text your stuff and I read out what it is, that's fine. We can call it a mic error or we can say that you don't want to, you don't want to talk out loud. I'm regularly nonverbal. I was nonverbal this morning. You wouldn't believe the hoops I had to jump in to talk to you all today. So I try to make space for people as often as I can without, without, I guess, engaging them. So it, the space isn't like, here, come talk to me about this. Tell me your feelings or thoughts or whatever. It's more like a, you, you go do you, you're perfectly equipped to, to hand, you know, you're an adult, go handle that. I don't work with kids and go handle your, yourself and you come back and join us when you can. We're, we're here for you. Do you all have experience with that kind of thing as well? Yeah, so to to speak to that a little bit, I have a fairly severe anxiety disorder uh, chronic depression and um, ADHD, right? All these things nice mixed together. <laughs> um, and there's like a few things like I will sometimes, I mean, actually, even this week, I had a small, small crisis. Um, and I had to like kind of tell my community, hey, guys, I'm gonna be off for the rest of the week. I need a break. I can't do this right now, right? And um, they know, for example, when I tell them, call this crisis line, odds are I've called it before. In fact, I would say maybe like three months ago, I ended up calling the Trevor Project because I was having a really, really bad time. Um, And so when I direct people to like crisis resources, right? Like odds are I have used them myself. and it's one of those things that I think that for a lot of people, it, it breeds trust to just saying like, I know a little bit about where you might be at. And there are times when I'm very much not okay and I'm doing my best to kind of like keep things together so I can continue to be mildly functional. And that's the best that I've got. That's, that's all I can handle. 
and like especially with the way that things are right now in the world um lately like all i can handle is being moderately functional right because like this this entire shift to working from home dealing with like all of these changes in the world has completely like messed up the routine that I kind of based my need mental it. health and self care on. Yeah, I need want, that routine. Want, want the routine. Yeah, yeah. Got it. We, we <laughs> like routine, and then need not it. having that was suddenly this like breakdown. So my community has been able to be there with me as my routines broke down, and as I found ways to make new routines, and as I find like time to stop. And kind of like try to to reset myself, right? And I think that what that does do is it because it's such a visible process, it allows for when I have that dialogue with them being like, hey, I don't think you're okay. We're going to move you away from the rest of the community. We're going to have a discussion. I can, you know, send you to these crisis lines. I can tell you about the experience I had when I called them, like all of that. Um I think it kind of like breeds a lot of trust in the community um, and allows people to feel safer saying, hey, I need help. Um, and then the other thing that we were talking about, um, about how, uh, you know, being able to consent to being in that position to help someone. Um, when someone becomes a moderator in my channel, right, I have like essentially two moderation roles. I have the the Twitch like moderator role and then I have the Discord moderator role and those are two different things. Um, and so the Twitch people will only be responsible for what's kind of going on in the Twitch chat um, and they'll be the ones to address anything that happens in the Twitch chat. And then like the, the Discord moderators are the same thing but they all know very clearly what those roles are. We have established protocols for different types of crises like amongst the the mods and then there's a couple of people who are like power mods that like will be in both communities just because they've been around for so long um and it's it's one of those things where like if there's something that like a newer mod doesn't know how to handle then they usually can reach out to those mods but like they all are very clear in what position they're in and what they can and can't do um and they they've all consented to it essentially yeah, I think you also brought up a really interesting point in the beginning of that and, and how, you know, we're talking about how boundaries are really necessary because, you know, people aren't going to get effective treatment and effective care without boundaries. But it's also really important for us. You know, care for the caregiver um, is huge, especially in times like this where, you know, for some of us, we're all day, we're treating people and then we come home. And if we have to do that on Discord, if we have to do that on Twitch, it can be really, really um, can have a negative impact on our mental health too. So setting up boundaries is is just just as important for yourself as it is for everyone else involved. Because if I was if I was had to every time I stream deal with someone else's crisis, I wouldn't be streaming, right? Mm -hmm. I would I just wouldn't do it. Um, so so yeah, yeah, boundaries streaming good. I and I just want to highlight an, another really awesome point you brought up of like how kind of visible your experience has been. Right. And, and obviously there are going to be things that you're still not going to share with the internet um, because you, you get to make those decisions and you should make those decisions. Yep. Um, and not everything that we put out online is, is the whole world. Um, but I think having that kind of visibility and having that is incredibly powerful right now when people are feeling really isolated, people are really struggling to connect. Uh, and it can exacerbate, right? When we see things on Instagram, when we see things on Facebook, when we see things on Twitter and we see someone's life and their life looks just perfect because we're only getting that snapshot, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important to have um, voices out there that say, hey, I'm not okay in these ways and this is how I'm working on dealing with it, right? So like seeing that process can be incredibly helpful for people, um, especially with anyone with a marginalized identity of any kind. The internet can be an incredibly powerful place for us to reach out and find community and connect yeah. with other people and learn that like, oh, we're not alone, right? This, this thing that I'm experiencing, I'm not the only one. That's incredibly powerful. Uh, and it is, a, it is a huge service. To, to be able to, to look um, to, to look at our computer screens and see some of our same experience reflected back at us. 
Should we go back to uh, Fuzer Doc? I feel like our, we haven't heard. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to interrupt. This is so good. Hi, buddy. <laughs> no, 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 no. They, I, I think the biggest thing, because I mean, everybody here has already mentioned something about boundaries, and that's always been something fascinating to me when it came to the research we were doing with this, especially when it came down to um, when I first started to write the uh, instrument for this study, uh, one of the things I wrote was fans as a community. And I was quickly corrected by about the first three streamers that say they're not really fans, they're my community. But they're not my friends per se. Mm -hmm. um, and so this got into a big debate with boundaries because I was like, well, what do you mean by that? And of course, one of the things that was mentioned was online friends can absolutely be friends. Um, yes. Even even though, like New York Times, Washington Post did a article every now and again about having ten thousand Facebook friends and they're not authentically your friends, which get it understood. Yeah. Um, but the other thing that came up was this idea of what we call parasocial relationships, which are one way relationships with a viewer and a person that is a uh, person I, I would say on screen. Um, and it really gets into this, and I want to ask y'all. To an extent, we mentioned this notion of online friendships uh, who watch y'all's program. Uh, what should streamers be thinking about in terms of having your privacy respected? <laughs> Don't. <laughs> Do not give your address out on stream. Oh, please. Yeah. <laughs> um, you don't have to put up with trolls. If somebody rolls into your chat and is going to be a, a butt, kick them out. Um, for, you have to protect yourself. Um, and I'm not that big uh, at the, yet. And um, I had somebody follow me recently on Twitter and they started a conversation and I, I was really, really careful, even though, I, you know, they're a perfectly nice human. But you have to be really, really careful, especially for, for people like us that might be in a marginalized community. Um, like, I can't run away from someone because <laughs> I use a wheelchair, for example. Um, so you, you, you want to be careful about that, too. Uh, yeah. I think it's hard because, um, especially given the nature of what we do and given everyone in this chat's personalities, we I feel like we tend to excuse a lot more than we probably should, or maybe in the beginning, and maybe we've learned our lessons. But for me, in the beginning... When I first started doing this, you know, people would be in my DMs a lot, wanting to have personal conversations, ask about my life. And I think I, I fed into it a little bit too much. And now I, I kind of know a little bit better. You know, we're allowed to stick up for ourselves. We're allowed to say this is this is not, you know, we, would, we, we encourage boundary setting, right? But sometimes when you do it with yourself, it's just like any other thing. It's a lot harder. So, um, yeah. you know, allowing yourself to be firm is important. I, it's funny, I use this skill set as a manager. So I, I work for a company where I am a manager and I ended up hiring people that were technically my friends. Um, and, but I had to be their manager. So I suddenly had to draw this like really strict for me. I had to do this for me line where it's like, I, this is my manager hat and this is my friend hat. I find I'm doing that in the stream a lot as well. If I don't have the spoons to use the manager slash stream hat, then I don't, go online. I don't stream. I, and uh, I am fortunate enough that I can, I can afford to do that. But there have been days where I push through, I get online and I'm streaming and you, you kind of, you have to be really clear. Sometimes I'll say, Hey y'all, I don't have a lot of spoons. So don't, don't test me. Um, hey y'all, I don't have a lot of spoons. I need some support in this way. Like you got to tell me how you're feeling instead of me trying to read your, your strange human faces and things like that. So I think that can be important too. I think I run into this a lot in in the context of when I started streaming, I had IRL friends, uh, but there was this like whole part of me that I hid from them, which is my mental health issues. And suddenly I had this community uh, where I could I felt like I could really be authentically myself. Like I was myself around my friends, but there was a whole other facet of me that I was not able to necessarily express before. And as I started expressing it, I found people who I had things in common with and I created real, real friendships. And I'm very grateful for them. But in the long run, that is not sustainable. You cannot become, you know, every but he's friend that comes into uh, no, comes right. into your and it's it's not it wasn't really sustainable in the short run either because there were people of course that approached me that I was like ah uh, I'm not comfortable no, with this you. being a friendship I I you know 
I'm, I'm okay, but this is where this is going to stay. And that was definitely, uh, that was definitely a tough boundary. It's a weird space to be in, especially I think um, a lot of us, uh, This I've heard this come up before with people that I've interviewed, like, hey, I was bullied a lot as a kid. It's very weird to be now getting attention for what I'm doing because I'm doing something very publicly facing. So to have people yeah. come to you and be like, hey, yo, you're, you're basically, I, I see you every day. You talk about really intimate stuff. I feel like, uh, you know, cause mental health is in its own nature, just intimate okay, stuff. Yeah. And I feel yeah. a kinship with you and having to set up that like, yes, absolutely. But there is a screen between us. I have not met you in person. I have not had personal conversations. Whatever those boundaries are for you, everybody figures out what they are for you. Um, but like, there is going to be there's going to be a line and there's going to be a boundary and it's going to be different than the way I talk to my friends in real life. And it's going to be different than somebody I talked to that I've known for two years. It, hell, yeah. It's going to be different than the conversation I'm going to have with Celeste because like yeah. you know, we've gotten close over the yeah. years, right? And I've As never met to, her in to... real life. As opposed yeah. to you and me. Uh, right. uh, M, I, I watch Absolutely. your streams all the time. I think this is probably the first time you and I are interacting personally, yeah, right? There you go. There I you think go. you're a lovely human, but I don't consider you an in real life friend, right? Right, right. But it's and that's, like, that's okay. But that's the thing is it should be okay. It shouldn't yeah. be expected. Yeah. I don't want so, our communities to expect to, to, to be put off by not being friends with us. I want, I want them to be okay with participating in the community not yeah. needing that personal friendship with the with the the top streamer or the top so i have like an an interesting perspective to this which is like so um m actually knows this but like the reason that i kind of started streaming was because there was a streamer who helped me um quite a bit and and they weren't necessarily a streamer on twitch but they were streaming like the artwork that they were making but it was when i was in college and i was like trying to figure out how to come out and I was freaking out because I was raised like aggressively religious and I was really not supposed to be gay and it was one of those things where like on one hand I was like oh man it might be nice to just kind of disappear from the world not good um and also like I had no idea what a future for me could look like I didn't know that I could find a wife and find love and find friends that would accept me and find happiness. Like none of that seemed realistic. So there was this artist that did this comic I like, and it was this like day-to-day -day comic of like her and her wife. And I loved watching them um, or reading them. And then she started doing streams of her just drawing the comics and she would talk and we comic. would chat. Um, what? What comic is this? Chaos Life. Oh, yes. Yeah. And Friends. so, yes. Um, so I would, I would like watch her like drawing these comics and she would talk about her and her wife and she'd cover like a myriad of topics like from like sex education to like mental health to like everything and it would just be like me and like five other people like talking to her and it felt very intimate and I think that was the first time that I had to learn that that kind of boundary existed because to me this woman had completely changed my life right? right? This person had come in and given me an example, had given me a future that I wanted, had given yeah. me an idea of like what it might look like to really live. And because of that example, I decided to continue living, to work on getting better, to work on finding a future. And to me, that was a huge deal. But I'm not her friend. <laughs> right? <laughs> And so at that time, to me, she yeah. was this incredibly important person. And, and I think, like, one time I, like, wrote her this really long, like, letter. And, like, I, I had to, like, learn, like, this person doesn't know anything about me. This person has no idea, like, what they've done to help my life. Right. But, like, to me, they're, they're someone who's incredibly important. And learning that boundary from the perspective of, of a fan, so to speak was like really hard, but yeah. very important. But like now I can apply that in my community, especially when I'm dealing with community members who aren't necessarily that clear on that boundary. Um, just because I can at least treat them with compassion, right? Because I know what it's like right. to be in a position where you see this person, you interact with this person, you have intimate conversations with this person, and you have a love for this person, but they don't necessarily share that same relationship with you. Right. And that's that's got to be okay. But also, like, 
talking to that person, dealing with them like with compassion and understanding like where they're coming from can be really important. And at least for me, because of that example that this streamer set, like that's part of why I stream, right? I want to be able to be that example for someone else because it was so important to me. But at the same time, I need to make sure that like I've set those boundaries well. Um, and sometimes I have to rely on other people to help me set those boundaries. My my partner like will sometimes be like, no, you need to stop. You need to walk away. Um, and my mods, like, when it comes to trolls in my channel, like, I, I like to say that I like to play with my food. Um, or, like, I'll, like, engage with trolls in, like, a playful manner. But, like, sometimes my mods will be like, no, that was too much. They're out. And it's <laughs> like, unhealthy. well, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. I think um, you bring up. Oh, go ahead. No, no, no. Please no. go ahead. You haven't talked to a while. You bring up. You bring up a couple of really good points, right? Like sometimes it can be really helpful for us to to have other trusted humans help us figure out where our boundaries are. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Having someone have your back. Having mods who are like, "Hey, remember how you said these are the behaviors you aren't going to tolerate? You're this is one of those behaviors. We're not tolerating it." it can be mm -hmm. really helpful because I think. Um, depending on how uh, effective your troll is, uh, or just you, maybe you have a community member who really, really cares, but isn't getting those boundaries very well. And they're communicating with you in a way that is pushing those manipulative buttons for you. And maybe it's not on purpose. Maybe, maybe they're trying their best to communicate, uh, or maybe it is on purpose. And maybe they are trying to manipulate you. I think it can feel, uh, you often will feel like you have a responsibility to your community. You have a responsibility to share. You have a responsibility to be there. You have a responsibility to be present. You have a responsibility to be genuine. And you you do have those responsibilities, but you also are allowed to set the boundaries that make you feel safe. Mm -hmm. And if you are struggling to do that, right, it can be helpful to have a person in your corner. It can also be helpful to remember that setting your boundaries is also another responsibility you have for your community. It's a responsibility you have to the people who are going to come after you, who are going to learn how to stream from you. So sometimes if you're having a hard time saying no or placing a boundary for yourself, don't place it for you. Place it for the person who's going to come after you. Yeah. Okay. So I depend on rules. When somebody puts me on their Discord server and they're like, have fun, and there are no rules <laughs> channels, I leave almost immediately. <laughs> It makes me so anxious. I have no idea what's allowed. Can I use at here? My emojis are cute. Can I use them? Like, are we allowed to swear here? Like, who? who uh, kid, do people hate kittens? I don't know. You got to set those rules for everybody. Um, at least I know that a lot of the community is, is going to have the same kind of anxieties or the same kind of needs. You know, that comes from a couple of different places for me. And I, I think it's important. I think it also uh, makes your, your areas more welcoming. If you've got a rule that we're not going to put up with bigotry, fill in the blank. Um, I feel more comfortable there. If you put in a rule that's like, this is a safe space specifically for these communities, I feel more comfortable there. If I jump into a Discord and they're like, we hate X, I leave. And that's that's good. You go, you know, go do your thing. I'm going to go do my thing over here. Those rules are important, I think. And it's 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 a good way to start off a relationship and it's it's very sad to me that i can't walk up to a human and be like hi my name is shauna i require these things if you don't like <laughs> them go away and and them to be like excellent thank you so much these are my things and i'm like oh i don't like them and then i can walk away you can't do that in real life <laughs> it's a point to me every day well, it, it is your channel, though, and boundaries and rules are something that came up quite a bit, especially rules of kind of communicating with chat. And I know we're kind of coming close on uh, time, so I just wanted to ask, just kind of as a quick thing for everybody here, uh, one of the other findings we had was stre streamers that talk to us that are like, when I started, I was woefully unprepared for everything that we were doing. I, I had no idea what was going to come out of this. This was extremely important. And I think it's something that I'm like, new streamers need to be thinking about this because uh, anxiety, as you and I mentioned uh, on your stream, how many people started up a new stream starting in COVID? COVID, yep. Yeah, it's a lot. And so the big thing I want to ask everybody is, what are... The things that you that need to be said or not be said on public forum needs to be talked about. 
Um, what is it that your advice is for new streamers about things that you can say versus you can't say when it comes to this uh, advocation of mental health? I know we talked about it a little bit, but I just wanted to get some uh, some thoughts here. Can I, uh, my God, I'm so passionate about this because I, it, it, it kills me because people burn themselves out so hard. You mm -hmm. cannot save the world. I understand that you're going into mental health advocacy because you feel, and I'm projecting, and this might not be the case for everybody, but I'm using <laughs> the term you, but because you feel like nobody helped me, I want to be sure to be there to help other people. Absolutely. And there are two issues with that. One, you will burn yourself out. You cannot be there for everybody, no matter how hard you try. There's 7 billion people, 5 million people are streaming on Twitch. Lord knows how many more viewers there are. It's not <laughs> possible. And that's why the good news is there's a ton of mental health advocates and all of us have our own spice and all of us will help in different ways. So it's not like you're abandoning the world because you're not the one saving it. That's number one. And number two, it has this implication that nobody else can handle anything unless you come in to save them. And that is its own, that's, that's its own thing to like look into. Why do I, why do I feel like I'm the only one who can, who can help other people? Um, and I find that it, this is common with streamers, not just mental health advocates. And just if you're going in because you're like, I want to help other people, awesome that is a noble noble reason whatever you're helping them with if you're helping them with uh you know uh physical physical issues like uh gamer doc does if you're helping them with mental health issues like uh you know uh, we do if you're trying to just bring awareness whatever it is you're trying to help the world i totally get it but you gotta check your scope and you gotta check the reason why you're doing it and those two things will you know, that motivation and that understanding of yourself will just help you get closer and, and closer to a healthier balance faster, I hope. Yeah, that's it. I have, uh, <laughs> I have three things, I think, that are incredibly important to me um, that, like, I guess might be worth sharing. Um, one is create a crisis document have information on like or use someone else's. what to call or use someone, someone else's. Yeah. Yeah. Take, yeah, take this good. has yeah. an amazing one. Yeah. Um, but basically have resources, have like suggestions on where to go, have different like hotlines, depending on countries, all of that stuff, have it yeah. somewhere so you can Don't reference figure that it out when you're yeah. having a crisis. That's a terrible time to figure that out. <laughs> that is a terrible, exactly. That's a terrible time. Best command yeah. ever to set that up goes to a PDF, goes to a website, goes to a link mm -hmm. off to take this. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, it's fine. I'm very excited. And then the, the, the second thing is set your boundaries early. Make sure that your viewers know what your boundaries are. I will say this, and my community makes fun of me for saying this, but I will always say, like, it is not my place. I am not a doctor. I'm not a therapist. But I'm coming at it from this perspective, right? Mm -hmm. And, like, make sure that those boundaries are clear at all times. Not only because it's a liability for you, but because they need to know as much as you need to know and remind yourself, wait, this isn't my place. And I guess the, the third thing is never tell people what to do. There are a lot of times when you see someone in a situation that is oh so familiar and you just want to be like, just do this. No, <laughs> it doesn't work do that it. way. Yeah. No. Don't, no. Nobody listens, um, you can suggest, you can say, I think you should do, I feel like those kinds of statements, great statements. Telling people do this doesn't work, won't help them. They're not you. Get over it. Um, so those are, those are my kind of three things. Yeah. How about, for me, and a really easy one is um, don't stream under the mental health hashtag or tag unless you are going to be talking about mental health and you're prepared because there yeah. are people who will look for that hashtag and look for streamers who are streaming under that tag and go to your stream to talk about these issues. So unless you're actually prepared to talk about that, don't stream under that tag. Yeah, I think it's probably been sort of uh, it's come at a, a little more obliquely, but. I don't think it's legal to dispense medical advice on a Twitch channel. 
Um, it's so really don't, scary because there are people doing it, but you're, yeah. ethically you're not supposed to. And don't, Dr. Kilmer could probably speak to this more, right? Yeah, yeah. don't yeah. So don't if do I'm that. talking on a channel, like we're not in a therapeutic relationship. Right. Yeah. I can give general advice, but I'm yeah. not giving advice directly to you. We don't yeah. have that kind of relationship. Either mental health or or um, physical health. I mean, people will come to me all the time and be like, okay, exactly what should I do for my condition? And I'm like, hell, they can't even tell me exactly what my condition don't is. I don't know. <laughs> like, my chair's cool, though. It has neat wheels. I don't. Yeah. So be careful about that. And um, be careful about what you do share. You would not believe the stuff that people have dug up from my past because it's stuck in a video somewhere. There are things that people know about me that I don't remember. <laughs> so please be careful about that. And if you're going to be inclusive, be inclusive. Um, you might not be seeing web captions for this video. And I can't tell you how sorry I am about that. My community is going to be very disappointed if they're not up. Um, and I highly recommend things like web captions or audio descriptions if you're putting up a video or any of the resources y'all have mentioned about about those those mental health things. Those are, if you're going to be inclusive, go all the way. So. I just want to echo what everyone said. Do all of those things. <laughs> uh, and the two things I'm going to add on top of that is better late than never, right? Like it is yeah. okay to realize like, oh, I'm not okay with that. I didn't realize that before. Or I didn't feel comfortable saying that I wasn't okay with that before. You can say that now. If your yeah. community pushes back, you're still allowed to say that. Uh, yeah. If trolls on the internet push back, they should go away. Yes. Um, and the other piece is if you start to feel uncomfortable even if you don't start to feel uncomfortable, it can be really helpful to have people that check in. So those people that you do consider friends, those people that you are willing to be really honest with, it is okay. And you absolutely should say, hey, this made me kind of uncomfortable. Did did that make you uncomfortable too? Hey, will you read this chain? Will you, will you, will you give me the, some feedback? Especially if you're finding that you're having a hard time setting boundary, um, having someone else step in and look at that or even thinking, oh man, if this was Shona, would I let someone treat her that way? Right. That can be really, really helpful um, because you Agreed. deserve to be taken care of, too. Yeah. Aww. That's sweet. We can turn it on a good <laughs> note, everybody. <Yeah. laughs> um, mm -hmm. No, I can't. I can't thank y'all enough for being a part of this. As part of kind of my privacy recency effect, can everybody just real quick mention where everybody can reach you, uh, and um, if there's any more advice to be had out there because I know an hour, we could probably go three hours to talk about this, but um, I, I, yeah. I want to make sure that everybody can be contacted. So, yeah. So feel free to find me at like seven spoon. Seven is spelled out. You can find me on Twitch or uh, Twitter that way. That's the easiest way to get a hold of me. I stream a lot of DD and occasionally I knit and, and play Overwatch, and I'm a little more uh, available to have conversations around the knitting and Overwatch, but I'm always going to, I'm, I'm going to do my very best to reply. I was going to say always reply, but this might get big. So I'm going to do my very best to reply to everybody, and I will certainly point you in the direction of some kind of resource. Awesome. awesome. You can find me at, at Drs. Kilmer. Uh, I don't stream unless I'm like on other people's streams. She's on um, one of my I'm, streams. I'm on. Yes, that is true. I am. Uh, and then I I work with Game to Grow, so you can find us online. Oh, I I do too. Yes, you can. Yes, what she said. Game to Grow. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, gamerdoc underscore, uh, and then I stream Mondays and Wednesdays on Twitch. Celeste. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't sure. Um, I am Celeste Meh, C-E-L-E-S-M-E-H on all social media, Instagram, Twitter, and twitch.tv. Um, you can find me streaming games Mondays and Wednesdays, 6 p.m. Eastern Time, and on Saturdays at around 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we do self-care Saturdays. And my name is M. Uh, M X. I am dyslexic. Uh, it's anxiety without the A-N with an M instead. Uh, so you can find me on, I'm on Twitter all the time. Uh, anxiety.com is a great resource. This It's funny. You can laugh. It's okay. Everybody can laugh. No, uh, you were just, it was funny the way you said it. It's I funny. laugh because that's my life. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I, as you were trying to spell it, I was like, yeah, I, yeah. So yeah. anxiety with an M instead of an A-N. Uh, but yeah, so find me on Twitter. Anxiety.com has resources. Um, 
and as well as all of my writing, which I call uh, research biography. Uh, so you can check all that out. I also stream three times a week. The current schedule uh, is Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 6 p.m. Eastern. Uh, come on in. We're either talking to a mental health professional, talking to people who live with mental health conditions, uh, doing positive news. That's something we just started. Uh, or uh, just having an open discussion on mental health. So you're welcome. Thank you. And I am Fusro Doc, F-U-S-R-O-D-O-C. Uh, I run a small lore stream called Lore Du Jour. We're doing Skyrim now, and we will be doing that for quite a so while. Good. It's every Tuesdays at 8.30, so uh, 8.30 Eastern. Please stop by, and um, thank you all for joining. Uh, thank you all for doing this. I, I, I hope that this has been a tremendous help, and for anybody watching, anybody that's new to streaming, I hope these resources are very help for, helpful for you. And uh, again, please reach out. Thank y'all. Bye, stream stream. Bye. So, why can't I come with you? I've told you already, Cape Cuckoo isn't safe here. Henry Moss and the Wormhole Conspiracy is a coming-of-age adventure set in a goofy galaxy of oddball characters, ridiculous conundrums and cosmic evil. Wander, ponder and laugh your way through a heartfelt exploration of independence, family and growing up. Teen Earthling Henry Moss helps his mother, Saren, operate Moss Family Supplies an interstellar delivery business servicing the outer worlds. Henry longs to break free of his domestic duties to seek his fortune and fame amongst the far stars. Together, the Mosses uncover a cosmic conspiracy overseen by the sinister Benedict Wormhole. This sets the Mosses on an interplanetary journey of compassion, exploration and self-discovery, together fulfilling a secret legacy founded a generation ago really try to capture that classic point and click adventure experience that so many people love but bring to it a modern twist. Multiple solutions to problems, a dynamic soundtrack, unique mechanics, and with the family audience in mind the whole way through. It's a story about coming of age and a family relationship and a modern family at that. This is a game that will really appeal to people that grew up with these games and if they've got kids of their own then can hopefully share that joy with them too.
Hi, everybody. I'm Rafael Bocamazzo, better known as Dr. B. I'm the clinical director of Take This, the first mental health nonprofit to serve the game community. Make sure to follow us on Twitter and Facebook at Take This Org. Well, our mission is to educate people on mental health topics, and that's what we're here to do today. We're going to talk about burnout, especially in creative professions. Now, we hear the term burnout all the time, but what is it? We hear about people working too hard, and it leads to burnout, so they're exhausted, right? Well, burnout is more than that. If burnout was just about overwork, we could take a vacation and fix it. Yes, exhaustion from overwork is a big part of burnout, but the second part is a sense of ineffectiveness. You're not just overworked. You don't feel like you can do anything about it. You don't feel like you can hit your goals. You don't feel like you can, you know, do really anything right in your job. More than that, there's a sense of cynicism that goes along with burnout. You just don't care anymore. You're not, you're not just overworked and don't think you can do anything about it. You don't care about your goals. You don't care about your fans. You don't care about even maybe why you started doing what you do in the first place. Nothing matters anymore. These three things together combine to create a chronic psychological condition that we know as burnout. But what do we do about it? Well, some common strategies are to one, yeah, take breaks. We have this myth, especially in creative fields, that if you're not constantly working, you're not going to make it or you're you know, going to lose your position. But the truth is, taking breaks actually makes your work better. The research is pretty clear on this one that taking breaks allows you to work more effectively. Another one, especially for those of us who are working at home, creating a sense of work-home separation. And there's a lot of ways to do that. Maybe it's only working during certain set hours. Maybe it's not answering emails outside those hours. Maybe it's having a separate workspace. I don't know. Try it out. Get creative for you. Figure out what works for you. A third thing, especially if you are doing what you love for a job, is having new things to do outside of work that have nothing to do with your job. For me, that's cooking. I love to cook and it has nothing to do with video games, tabletop games, or mental health. I love it. Creating measurable goals can be an effective way of fighting that sense of inefficacy. Uh, maybe you pick three things to do that day and if you can hit those three things, everything else is just gravy. Maybe you create weekly goals. I don't know. Again, figure out what works for you. But finally, aligning your goals and your job with your values can fight, help fight that sense of cynicism. If you're doing something that you, you know, you're morally not aligned with, that can be a really hard thing to do. Um, so, change your content to meet what's important to you. If you enjoyed this, please make sure to check out TakeThis.org for more mental health information, and please enjoy the rest of Pax, everybody.
challenge you to a swap at showdown. Hi everyone, this is Parkasaurus, and it is one of the Indie Showcase winners for PAX, which we are very happy to be part of. Uh, Wash Bear is made by a two-person team called Wash Bear Studio, and one of those people is me. I'm Chris. Hi. The game itself is a uh, dinosaur tycoon simulation, where you obviously take care of your dinos and expand your park. So let me give you a quick look into the game. Uh, we could do a customized game, but let's go to the world map instead. And I'm going to do one of the missions, which is Toronto, and let's start that up. I have a quick look. And the first quest pops up, I know appeal. And this is our park. This is the one we're starting with. So this is where we're going to have to do the quest. So the first thing... Uh, we need to get 500 dino appeal, have four dinosaurs, and unlock two science. Okay, so various ways we can do all this. The first thing I'm going to do is see what the quest gave me. So I have a hat, and hats can go in your dinos, or your employees, uh, and I have an ankylosaurus. So I'm going to hire some people to help me first. I'm going to go to the office, and go to resumes, I'm going to get a vet. I'm going to hire a janitor, looks pretty good, and a scientist, because I will want some science, and a security. And 
I'm going to, you know what, I'm going to move this over here. Because I want to build my exhibit where this all is. Let's build an exhibit. Um, I'm going to use some concrete walls first. So these are cheaper, they're pretty strong. Uh, the only catch is guests can't see through them to see the dinos, which is okay. I guess we'll add some other fences. And I'm going to make it just this big for now. And why don't I add some wood fence. And these will allow the guests to see in. So I'll just add some path here. And you know what? Let's drop our egg while we're at it. And if I fill this up with grass, most of this is already grass, so let me fill the rest with grass. Uh, there. So this exhibit now I can click anywhere on the wall or on the ground and it'll pull up the exhibit pane. And there's a lot of interesting information here. And we're trying to get the taiga biome. So you can see we have to add some ruggedness and some wetness. So let's go ahead and add water. And you can see it's transforming, and there we go. We just got over to the rainforest. But we need to get up to taiga, so we wanna, wanna add some, some ruggedness. I'm gonna do that with the train tool, add a mountain here. There we go. Now, let's hatch our dino. No, let's make a perfect exhibit. So now you can see here we need some bushes, uh, some trees and some rocks. So I'm going to go ahead and add those. Okay, you can see the meters filling up. I want some bushes that are meant for grass tiles. And you can see biodiversity is filling up. And I want to finish it off with some rocks. So granite. Perfect. Biome looks pretty good. Let's hatch our dino. There we go. This is Olive, our first dino. And people are going to start watching Olive. Pretty cool. And got to get some donation boxes for them to give money. Uh, there's a lot more to do. We have to get food and door on the exhibit so the vets can inspect the dino. And yeah, there's lots, lots, lots to do. So. But I just wanted to give you a sneak peek into how this game works, and there you go. Uh, yeah, so I hope you enjoyed this, and if you have a chance, check out Parksaurus. You can get it on Steam currently. Um, yeah. Alright, thanks. Hello everyone, and welcome to the joy of coding. We're going to start today by answering just a few simple questions. Why are you here? And who the heck is this guy? 
So the first one's pretty easy to answer. You're a nerd. Got a bunch of board games, and that sweet, sweet combination of board games and data is simply irresistible. But who am I? The most important answer is not a professional coder. So let that be a huge caveat for everything you're about to hear. But I promise it will be interesting and informative. Uh, but as far as the tabletop space goes, I've been bouncing around that industry for a little more than a decade, but you probably most recently recognize me as the event coordinator for PAX Unplugged. And, you know, I'll say while PAX Online is a PAX West, PAX Australia, EGX event, you know, I couldn't let them have all the fun. So I did not just sit back here. I spent all of my unexpected summer free time picking up an old hobby of mine, coding. So it'd been about 10 years since I wrote some serious code, so I thank you for attending this clickbait title of a panel, where we'll be focusing mostly on the first half of this equation, building up a robust data set for categorizing just about any board game collection. Uh, this is to say we're going to talk about that more so than the actual performing of data analytics, but you know, towards the end here we will get into talking about some of the tools you could use for you know, visualizations and statistical analysis and, and actually do show some of the initial outputs from those those efforts. So if you're ready to head down this road with me, uh, maybe you're an experienced programmer, in which case you can gloss over some of this or laugh at my amateur code. Uh, but if you are not an experienced programmer and you're interested in picking up an interesting hobby, I highly recommend picking up the book Automate the Boring Stuff with Python. Uh, I'm not being paid to say this. In fact, I didn't even pay to read the book. I just checked it out of my library. But it is a very powerful book. It will teach you how to be a wizard. A wizard who, you know, knows how to do things with computers, or at least script them and automate them and use them in a slightly more advanced fashion than, you know, your average computer user. So the book is great. I mean, the first half is a great, hey, you haven't ridden this bike in 10 years kind of coding 101 refresher but it gets into the nitty gritty of how to use Python, which if you haven't programmed in a while, is just fantastic. I can't say enough great things about how you know, clean and elegant of a solution Python presents to most coding challenges. Uh, but then the book in the second half really dives into all sorts of purpose-built Python libraries for doing the automation side of things, you know, web scraping, Excel spreadsheet creation, things of that nature. So you too, can teach yourself to be a modern software developer who just sort of, you know, glues together a bunch of libraries and asks Stack Overflow why it didn't work. But if you want to skip all of this, I highly recommend this as one of the many off-ramps I will present you here. Uh, this is called the BG Stats app. It's available on iOS and Android, but, you know, no, seriously, just download this and use it and get all sorts of fun visualizations about your cardboard habit. You can track what games you played, who you played them with, who won, where you played it, many other little details, and it does tie into Board Game Geek collections, which we're going to talk about in some serious detail here in a bit. But you, you don't necessarily need to read a book and create your own convoluted Python script. That just seems to be a lifestyle choice that some of us embarked on. But, you know, this isn't going to be the last time I offer you an, an off ramp from this journey, but know that what I'm showing here, the code we're going to go through and, and what it does and why, it's all sort of hard mode on purpose. One, because it's fun to learn how some of this stuff works and it's done as a learning project, but, you know, this is also a project, a rather unique set of requirements, one you might be familiar with. This, this is a very large convention library, thousands of games with an amazing crew called the PAX Enforcers, who maintain it, staff it, operate it, make it so it is there for you to play and enjoy. Can't say enough great things about everyone I work with there. But the other great thing you don't often hear about is that the enforcers actually developed their own open source board game library software. You know, it started with PAX and, and were the code base maintainers for it. But, you know, Shucks uses it. A lot of Comic Cons use it. Uh, PAX Australia, our cousins across the world, actually going to start using it this next time we have a physical packs where those are uh so some of the data you see here is all sort of north america pack specific or that you will see here 
But this is all to say in very short that I'm using my own project here with some rather unique requirements of convention library management to characterize the games in that library. But a lot of the lessons learned here are applicable to your own, you know, management of your own personal game collection if you choose to go down this road. So let's take a look a bit further at, at that. If you want to get a peek at the library software here, you know, hey, welcome to PAX East 2020, the convention where we somehow didn't die and you know this is an example hey we had 1917 games in that library uh there's a lot we could do if we had links to the boardgamegeek.com database that characterizes those, ga those games in many different ways you know add an unplugged we probably add at least an additional thousand games to supplement that library size uh and one of the other unique things about this is you know we're we're operating a board game collection out of what's essentially a glorified airplane hangar you know with tens of thousands of people inside not always going to have reliable internet a lot of design choices had to be made here to make this a system that operated offline disconnected There's gonna be a lot of easier methods here if you're doing this at home and you can assume persistent connection you know to a website like bgg so if you are not familiar with BGG, let's give you another off ramp here. Maybe you don't have your own unique convention software. Maybe you're not managing your board game collection in your own custom spreadsheet. Those are the case. Great, simple way to do this. Track your own inventory is to log into BGG, hit your profile drop down, click collection, it takes you to a collection page. You can one at a time add all the games that you own. And once they're in there, go to the download board games and click the owned link. And that will generate a CSV file that they will send you through the geek mail system. You download that and it's actually going to come with right out of the box. 99% of the sort of the metadata associated with these games that we're going to work on pulling down today. That's things like player count, suggested age range, uh, number of minutes it takes to play the game, average rating for the game, all great stuff. So you can be off to the races already. If you want to get more into the data science aspect of this, pump that into the data science tool of your choice and really get running with you know, what sort of you know, observations you can make about the games you chose to own. So looking also at BoardGameGeek.com. Here's an example game page, and I honestly randomly chose a game out of the PAX library. This is a game called Bloom and Blizzard that I believe was imported in 2018 for the first look section at Unplugged. And I mentioned some of that metadata here. This is just to show that it's all available right on the front page. You know, the designer, the artist, the publisher, some of the big key factors here. Uh, just as a process of learning some aspects of coding, I, I had an earlier implementation that just scraped this right off the website. Usually that is not what you want to do, but it's just something I wanted to learn how to do. So it, it shows that the information is there accessible at your fingertips, both for your eyeballs and you know a script if you so chose to write one. If you click the stats tab here, you get all sorts of extra detailed information. And the good news is that everything you see here plus the stats tab is all available through what we call an API. So if you want to read the docs, go right to this URL, read about the API. Uh, I'm going to have some call outs to certain API sections in this page, uh, ones that we're not using today, but that you might prefer to use if you're not, say, doing the offline system that I'm describing here. But the, if you're actually going to use the API, here is the URL you would type into your browser. Uh, you can do this yourself just to see what the API call result looks like, but I'll get there in a second. The key aspect here is this string of numbers. I highlight in red just to call out the attention. That is the BGG unique ID number for Bloom and Blizzard. But, you know, you type in ID equals one, you get Demacher, the uh, German politics game. That is the first game ever added to Board Game Geek, and you know it's it's fun to see you know what were the first hundred games added. You can go around and tinker with that in your browser. The other thing we appended stats equals one. We set the stats value to true, so that we get sort of the extra detailed 
version of the results that are returned and whoa here we go here's a look you know this is in xml which is meant to be a easier human readable form of organizing data but it's also super great and easily machine readable so it's a bit, bit of best of both worlds you can very easily tell you know min players value equals two max players value equals six you know what it's saying there but it's also really easy to programmatically develop something to read in those values and you know do something with them so let's look at sort of the key things we want to extract here at least initially uh, when developing a conventional library management script so we want to extract the overarching item tag that describes the type as a board game and gives us our id number for bloom and blizzard the name the primary name is Ta-da, Bloom and Blizzard, along with the, you know, the native kanji and the translation. Uh, we'll talk about, you know, special characters and such later. But also we're concerned about the year published tag here. So the value for year published is also of some import for us because it also helps us, you know, resolve duplicate name situations where, you know, a bunch of board game publishers have put out the same name for different games and again we'll get more into that in just a little bit so to go over the four goals of this project in its entirety first thing we want to do is create that offline directory the next thing we want to do is link all of the games in our existing collection to the unique bgg id number values so the next thing we do after that is we can you, we can pull the real BGG data using the ID number compared to what we've got and correct the spelling of game titles. That, that helps us out immensely. You know, no duplicate entries. It makes the stats reporting cleaner. Uh, it's less embarrassing when you're not you know sending out to the public world and you've accidentally typoed the name of a very popular game. Just generally, good thing to do. The last thing we want to do is collect a whole bunch of metadata associated with those games. I described some of it before, you know, player counts, age range, time, weight. We'll get into it more but later, but there's all sorts of amazing things we could add, both as future uses for a convention library software and past uses, chewing through, you know, a decade plus of old checkout data and seeing what sort of observations and, and trends we can gleam or how people's gaming habits have changed both as our convention has grown and the popularity of board games and the board game industry in general, you know, has really taken off like a rocket in that stretch of time. So it's coding time. We're going to use Python, which I already sung the praises about, but also if you are the new coder type who is looking to pick up this hobby, you know, as a result of watching this amazing PAX online panel, I I'm not going to, take the rest of the presentation and just walk you through getting up started i'm going to give you these four things to google and they will teach you everything you need to know in conjunction with reading that book automate the boring stuff with python uh, how to really just get your legs under you and start writing some code you want to install visual studio code as your development environment that's just my recommendation tons of options out there it is free you're gonna you know, just save a, a file with a .py extension, that's a Python file, and Visual Studio will just sort of step in there and say, hey, we kind of see what you're trying to do here. You're, you're probably developing in Python. You want us to install Python for you, and it'll do it for you. But then you also want to, you know, Google how to install pip. That is a package manager that lets you pull in all these other segments of pre-written code with these, you know, purpose-built functions that I described before for doing all the automation bits. Uh, but then you also want to add Python and probably pip as well to your, your system path variable. So that just allows you to type in commands to your, your command line or terminal window, and your operating system will know to look in that location as well as others, you know, to look for those particular you know, executables associated with the commands you're typing in. It just makes everything work in the end. But if you do this, you're good to go. Read the book. Come on back, watch the rest of the presentation. It'll make a whole lot more sense, but I will be presenting it in, in easy mode here. So hopefully it sets off some more curiosity. Let's get right into the code. So I said the first goal was to create an offline index of all the games on BoardGameGeek. 
I'm going to describe how we do that by stepping through some of the modules and packages that we chose to install and sort of use the functions uh, that they provided us. And I'll caveat here again. This is really only necessary for offline usage. Uh, if you go back and read the docs on the BGG API page, uh, it has a search API. You can use the BGG search bar right there and not have to create your own sort of offline mirror of you know a few key fields for their entire database of 300,000 something games. Uh, that's a little, a little bit over. It's a little extra, as the kids say. So, assuming we are going to go go forward with this uh, hard mode plan here and create the offline database, we use the requests library. The requests library just helps you reach out to the internet to pull content into your script. So within requests, there is a function called get. So I say requests.get, and I put the variable for a URL. That's just a string where I've stashed a web address, and I happen to write this big honking URL here. You remember thing ID equals one is democker. We're actually going to take it a hundred games at a time and get a, a rather large XML file and chew through it in a hundred game increments. And I just broke it up here to show it goes all the way out to a hundred. But we start by importing some of these libraries and we have to define three key variables. So the first one is our base URL thing ID equals, we don't know yet. First item is the first item in the BGG database. And the last item is the result of a custom function I won't be diving into, it's called BGG max item. It's something I wrote, and this does use web scraping. Uh, BGG has a page called the geek feed, which is kind of like, you know, looking at the matrix and seeing all the new things that get added to BGG over time. So it just pulls up that page, finds the most recent timestamp, jumps over to the ID number for whatever was just added and sets it and said, this is the highest ID number value you're ever going to find in the BGG database as of right this second. Let's put the brakes on once we hit that item. So we go right into a for loop here. And we're going to take, like I said, a hundred numbers at a time and go through it. So the for loop will increment from one, then 101, then 201, then 301, because we said we're going to go from first item to last item and we're going to jump 100 numbers at a time. And the if else here you can kind of ignore. That's really just to check if your x value is within 100 digits of your max item. That is the put the brakes on and set the range to be something less than 100. But one way or another, we're setting the id range variable to be a range of numbers. 99% of the time it's going to be 100 numbers long. Then the URL arguments is how we get this extra string of most likely 100 numbers tacked on to the end of that URL. We map a string conversion function to every integer in that range, then we stick that group of strings into a list, and then we join the list together using commas. So it makes a huge comma separated string stored in the value URL args. And our final URL is that original base URL plus the URL args. URL equals this. It's great, Python. You can just do math with letters. And we call the get function from requests on the URL. And tucked into this response is the full content of that web page. That huge mess. I'll go back a couple slides here. All this scrolling down. 100 games long, all that is going to be stashed in this response object or variable. Going on to beautiful soup, this is actually going to help us read, a computer read, what we just stashed in response. So remember how response is that raw XML output? We're going to feed into the beautiful soup function the text version, we call a, a text method by appending dot text to the end of the response object. And then we tell beautiful soup in the second parameter to use the LXML parser. There's a whole bunch of different parsers you can tell beautiful soup to use sort of a stock list. LXML just happens to be the one 
to tell it, hey, expect XML output. So we can take a quick detour here if you're curious about this, you know, just tagging dot text on here. If this is truly audience of complete amateur programmer, uh, you may be curious about, you know, you've always heard the term object oriented programming. Uh, this is a, a great example here. So object oriented programming is really sort of just in time defining new classes of variables and we call them objects. So for a beautiful soup, I'm reading in the XML, parsing it as XML and storing it in a, a soup object. And that's just a variable of some unique type that we just created by using the beautiful soup class. Uh, same thing happened with requests. We read a web page in and stored it as a request object. In the definition for those classes or variable types, uh, there are other functions, which we'll just call methods here. And it makes it really easy to write because instead of having to apply functions to it, you can just say the variable name, variable name dot whatever. And it applies that method and it just changes what you stored there in some way. A really easy way to think about this is say with the string class, if you have a variable that is just a string of letters, you can say dot upper or dot lower, and it changes the string to just say be all uppercase or all lowercase. In this case, we're changing the XML to just be the raw letters on the page and allow beautiful soup to read it. Put all that to the side by now. I, I digress with the diversion. Uh, there is another one of those methods uh, for the beautiful soup package called find all. So if we take our soup object dot find all method and then have it find all items, those 100 items that we sort of bucketed in the uh, response object are gonna come up one at a time I just pasted in the XML output here as, as a reminder. The item showed, you know, board game type and ID number. So for every game, there's a temporary variable called game. In the soup items, you know, list of 100 buckets, it's going to take the attribute from the ID tag. So ID equals this string of six numbers and set it to be game ID num. Same thing for category. I'm going to look for the type value here, and then I'm going to take the attribute for it and set it to be category. It's a board game. Year published is a little odd. You know, it's, it's not within the master item tag in XML. It's nested down in there somewhere. So we've got to do another soup method, find, instead of find all, because there's only going to be one for every of the individual 100 games, we're going to look for the year published tag. And then we're just going to take its value, boop, set it into year published. The rest of this here deals with a little bit of weirdness in databases, particularly BGG. You can't expect every game is going to have the year published. You know, they might have chess in the library, and who the hell knows when chess was published? So. A lot of games just don't have that value. There's also, I, I said it so, as long as it's not none, you know, it, it's none if it could not find the year published tag, it's also the chance that the value is just an empty string. You know, it says year published value equals, I don't know. And like in theory, that shouldn't exist, but, you know, BGG has been around for like 15 years and it's an exhaustive database of every game ever made. So I think one game I came across, just they had a, val a year published at some point. I guess maybe just someone deleted it. Maybe it was wrong and they didn't figure out the fix. Who knows the trivia behind that one? Uh, but that crashes your code. So these are little edge cases we work around, the choices we make. Uh, but otherwise, as long as it's not none and it's not blank, we set it to the true value in the year published tag. One of these things did happen, else it becomes year published, the year zero. So it's like, like Jesus. Moving on, slide 18. This is the third package we consider using, which is OpenPyXL. I'm just gonna sing the praises of it here, but not go into the detail. This allows you to write Excel spreadsheets, you know, save all your output as .xls files. It just works so damn well. 
but it's completely optional because if you're going to be writing this and then passing this into other data processing scripts, you know, any situation where a spreadsheet is not your final output, probably is better off going with a, a CSV file for now. Uh, if you've dabbled with Python in the past, the CSV writing features, the built-in functions of Python got so, so much better when Python 3 came out. Uh, a lot of the help you will Google for invariably uh, relates to people's struggles in writing CSVs in Python 2 or earlier and requiring all sorts of extra packages and libraries you won't have to deal with. So make sure you're getting the right advice if you're using a fresh install of Python. Uh, and make sure you get that fresh install if you've got you know some past experience but are just coming back to it after a little while. So before we wrap up goal number one here, just to talk about some of the other considerations. Uh, one is file encoding and title formatting. I mentioned I just kind of randomly chose Bloom and Blizzard. It happens to be a, an Asian import game with some kanji in the title. You're going to come across all sorts of special characters, symbols, uh, letters with diacritics and different types of accents on them. And I don't know what you intend to do with this data for next steps, but I mean, you could get yourself into Unicode hell here and you want to understand how you're encoding these characters, um, the systems that you're going to pass it on to, what their expectations are, what, you know, UTF format they expect you to export your CSV in. Hopefully it's all just clean, leave everything as default, try not to worry about it. But if you get weird errors in your text, uh, welcome to this set of problems. And, you know, now you know what to start Googling for your fix. The other thing is rate limiting. Uh, I just described taking a 15 year old gold standard database for all games ever invented and making your own personal copy of it. Uh, be very respectful of other people's bandwidth and like don't do this willy nilly uh, and use lots of, you know, timely sleep statements in your API calls. I spaced it out here that it takes well over a day, close to two days actually implement all these hundred games at a time chugging through 300,000 something games in the BGG database. This, if this does not give you like nostalgic feelings of pirating things over 56 K and like you're not doing it right and you're being too aggressive and, and you might actually wind up getting rate limited and your API calls will just start failing and you know, returning nothing in a perfect world. Uh, we'd be using something here called a, like a bulk fetch endpoint where we just send the one magic huge API call we intend to make and it, it chops it up and slowly gets it done over a stretch of time. But ideally, this is a run it once, never have to run it again because we've got our offline copy now, uh, you know, for use in the disconnected convention airplane hangar. Uh, so didn't want to get too fancy with it and, and learn all sorts of extra new stuff that we weren't going to be using again over time. Uh, the other thing is maybe error logging. Uh, I described a script that takes almost 48 hours to run. Maybe you want to make sure your internet didn't hiccup or that you, you know, didn't get rate limited at some point. So you can set your program uh, such that if it has no results within one of those 100 game batches, you know, spit out a text file log that just tells you, hey, these ranges were curiously empty. Very unlikely that an entire 100 game run of the BGG database is gonna be completely blank. Uh, and I can tell you from experience now that that certainly is not the case. Sometimes there's only, you know, 80 or 90 games in a 100 ID value run, but you're always gonna get at least that much. So you could check your log later. And then on our last thing, existing an index update, uh, an existing index update, you could manually set those first item, last item values and have it run over the parts where maybe it was experiencing some hiccups, or maybe it's the next year of your convention and you just want to set the first item to be the final result from your last index file search and just have it update that little delta. Maybe it'll take an hour just to get whatever has been added to BDG in the past, you know, X number of weeks, months, or, or year. So again, just use the search API. It's a whole lot easier than this, but uh, if you want the convenience of having an offline copy and not having to constantly hit BGG's API, uh, this is something you could do. Or I'll have my GitHub link at the end of this. You could just take my file so that you don't have to go, you know, slamming that API for a day uh, just to get your own offline copy. You can have mine. 
and moving on to goals two and three, which we will merge for convenience here. Uh, this is linking the BGG ID number to each of your games, and this is like the master key for everything, and then using it for one single purpose right now up front, which is to fix the spelling of all your game names. So everything's nice, clean, and accurate. But there's one major key consideration before we go and do all this, and I hinted at it before. Sometimes publishers use the same game as same name as a game that already exists. So in this case, we're just going to use the great 2019 Tim Fowers game Sabotage here and realize that there's other games named Sabotage too. And if we're trying to differentiate, we're trying to link our copy of Sabotage to a BGG ID number, we better get it right. Or if we do any sort of fancy metrics or, you know, trending of data using any of the, the metadata fields, it's going to be off. It's going to be linking to games with other play times and player counts and who knows what. So we're going to use a tool in Python called a dictionary. And think of this sort of like SAT analogies. Uh, you're going to have a long list of values, but every value is a matched pair of a, of, called a key, key value pair. Uh, the keys are unique. There can only be one of any key. Uh, and in this case, the key is the game name. So in this dictionary, there is one key after another, and that's all the unique names that a game might have. Catan, Sabotage, Ticket to Ride, Monopoly, and so on and so forth. But the associated value, you know, after the colon here, it happens to be another dictionary. And so associated with sabotage is a dictionary of BGG ID number and year published pairs. So this tells me there are three other games named sabotage. They have these pairs of ID number to year published, ID number to year published, so on and so forth. No offense to Robert Abbott, who is like a really cool old dude who makes great games uh some of the gems of you know early decades of board gaming but you know odds are if i'm managing a library of games probably the one from tim that just came out a year ago so this little segment of code here just does exactly that uh the bgg games value here that is just a, a string that has the system path, you know, C colon slash whatever, all the way out to the CSV file I generated from goal number one. It's my offline BGG database. I use the CSV re dot reader function, reader from the CSV library, stash that, that red CSV file into BGG reader, open up an empty dictionary, and then for every row in the BGG reader, I'm gonna say, Hey, does that first value, the game title, does it already exist in the master list of dictionary keys? If it does, just update that second dictionary with a new ID year published pair. Keep growing that sub list. If not, we're just going to create a new entry in the database. Here's my game name. Here's my the one unique pair that exists so far. Just keep on chugging through all 350,000 whatever games from our BGG index. Now moving on to how we actually smack those two lists together. The offline BGG index and our list, our personal collection, our, our game library collection, whatever you're managing here. Smack those two lists together. Sometimes it's real easy. You know, the game has no typo in it. The name cleanly exists in BGG. There's no duplicates for it. We just know immediately what the BGG ID number is. So we skip right to the title writing function, which is something I created. We're not going to go through the code for that because it's stupid simple. It's just the CSV writer all with a little bit of extra fanciness for my unique application here. Uh, but we'll just write down, hey, here's our database's ID number for it. Here's the BGG ID number for it. And oh, oh by the way, here is the definitive text for what the title should be and those three things can be stashed in a corrections table uh, for your own database or tab in your spreadsheet whatever you happen to be using but 
if we said, say, for PAX names, I use that as my array of all the game names in the PAX tabletop library. Uh, if that game is not in the list of BGG keys, then I need to attempt to match it uh, using some sort of string matching, because that, that means I've got a game. Uh, it's probably it's not likely that I've got a game in the PAX library that does not exist in BGG's database. Honestly, I think it was like three games that that was the case for, you know, brand new stuff or, you know, low print run indie things where the publishers necessarily haven't put their games on BGG yet. Uh, I have to use attempt match, which we are going to get to. We're going to look at the code for how we actually attempt to match two strings and find the spelling corrected version of a game title in the BGG index. But before we do that, or, or after we do that, remember, we always take a time out here and say, are there duplicate titles? Use that uh, dupes checker function, uh, which I won't get into that one either because it's embarrassingly, embarrassingly long structure of if-then statements that I didn't spend too much time refining. Uh, that will tell you if you've got uh, potential duplicates that'll alert you to and, and ask the user for a little bit of intervention there. So getting into this, it's all downhill from here. Let's look at the attempt match function. You'll notice we have another library that we're adding in here, diffLib. We're only importing one function from it called get close matches. Uh, and we're really going to lean on that get close matches function here, which is fun. You, you can kind of tune it to your liking. It's a very rudimentary, you know, text ma matching function. And this does have it, some of its own advantages because uh, while I mentioned you just want to use BGG search live if you can depend on a persistent internet connection, and BGG search is it's just not always the greatest. Uh, it's it's very particular. If you you make a typo, it's not going to really try to help you fix it, like say a, a Google search would. So you can tune the parameters, you know, the n and cutoff parameters of a get close matches function to your liking, and you know, fiddle with it, learn a little bit about it, and you know, see how tolerant you want it to be of wildly typoed titles here. The only thing it's really not going to help with is games that have huge subtitles. It's like Clank, uh, a fantasy deck building adventure, using cards, whatever, yada, yada, yada. Uh, you know, sometimes publishers do or do not use the massive subtitles they put on their game boxes. So that can kind of throw you off. Uh, but if we have time, we'll, we'll talk about how to work around that using a, a extra corrector function. But any case, uh, ignore the manual name portion of this attempt match function for now. And let's just say that we're going to create a variable called case match and apply the get close matches function to the game we're searching for within the dictionary keys of BGG names. Here's a little bit of code that makes it easy on the user and doesn't have to have them keep clicking confirm buttons. If the length of this case match array, that's all the potential spelling corrected matches, as long as it's not zero, unless it didn't completely bust and, and fail to find any close matches, uh, we are going to look at the dot lower version of our game title string and the first result from case match, you know, array value zero. That's the most likely match. We're going to lowercase them both and compare them. And if they are identical at that, that point, that means I've just got a case error where you know someone put a random capital letter or, or lowercase letter when it should have been capital in the title. We shouldn't ask the user to correct that. We just know that that was a common mistake. Let's just keep the script chugging and correcting and storing proper BGG values. Uh, if not, if it's not just a simple case matching error, we are going to use the match selector function, which I think I mentioned before, you know, so if the length of matches is more than zero, we are going to store the selected value in our match selector function. So I send the whole list of matches plus the original game name and without diving into the actual code for it, I'm going to use a enumerate function in Python, which just takes an array of values and displays them to the user as a, a numbered list. And we can actually spec we can take user input there to say, hey, which one of these numbers uh, was your game? Uh, we could even also include one 
if you get fancy with it, that says it was none of these. And that's where it, it comes to the point of, hey, maybe you have an option baked in there that says, I'd like the chance to manually type in a corrected title and have it spin back through the attempt match function. Uh, that's where you would set this optional parameter of manual name. Uh, it would get called with the second argument specified, which would override the default assignment of a empty string. So if it comes in and says, whoa, whoa, manual name is not empty, it's going to skip to some other code that treats it slightly differently. Uh, there's going to be a slightly different tune, get close matches function. And when it actually goes to do the title writer function, it might even you know, write some different values to note that this was a problematic game name that required some manual intervention um, for other uses that I won't get into here. But in any case, uh, the user gets, you know, they, they went to do sabotage and it gave them a whole bunch of results. They typed in, you know, option number four. Four comes back as the, it gets set. If it's returned by the match selector function, it gets set as the selected variable. And then in the title writing function, we can go and say, pull me the game name and the BGG ID number for, you know, enumerated value four from that last match we attempted and just write it to the CSV and moving on, moving on with life to our next game. So I have been talking for quite a long time and showing you a lot of code, uh, trying to tailor this to varying levels of experience. So we're not going to go through the code for collecting metadata only because it's pretty simple having just showed you the code for goal number one, which digested the entire BGG database. Uh, it's a very similar script, but instead of using all 355,000 whatever values from one to the max value, we're just going to use the BGG ID numbers of games we know we own. So this should execute pretty quickly, maybe an hour or two. Uh, with the you know the rate limiting I mentioned before, and instead of doing just a few key beautiful soup find all or find methods, uh, we're gonna do a whole bunch of them, and we're gonna go after all sorts of metadata. And this is kind of tip of the iceberg for what you can get. These are the uh, obvious fields: your your maximum players, minimum players, rating, weight. Where it gets interesting, and we'll show some of this later are the families, mechanics, and categories. Those really help you to categorize the types of games you own and what people are playing and using and for how long. Uh, it can be really great description narrative, you know, a big old paragraph of text that tells you about this game. I bet you can think of some uses Convention Library can make of that. Uh, you could even get the thumbnail image, uh, the JPEGs for some of these games, which could be super helpful. Um, I have time later I'll talk about you know some of what could be you know truly done with this but for now let's look at the final package here uh, this is what it looks like when the script is fully compiled and sent off and if, if you notice up top I put one line of code in here this is you know my love affair with sort of rediscovering coding and learning Python pi installer is a single line command you know, provided you pip installed the pi installer package, you can use this, create one single file uh, of your script and have it spit out as an execu executable that is portable and used on any system. So if I'm using, you know, loner laptops in a convention center airplane hangar and I want to be able to run this script on the fly, can be super helpful. So I created a master script called mainmenu.py and you know imported all of the other scripts for the four goals I listed before. And you know, we have a old school text menu here. You know, what are you trying to do? Update that master index, do some game title correction, pull down a fresh copy of the metadata, and so on and so forth. If you go to data input, you know, what's the source of your data? Are you, you know, rerunning some corrections that you just did. Maybe you missed a couple games. You want to take a second go at it. Or if you press number one, it's just the stock expected export, uh, the Excel file format that our library generates that I've sort of defined as the standard. I should say the CSV output. So if you hit that, boom, it pulls up the table of BGG ID values as well as your game library inventory. Starts chugging through them here. 
we can see that 1920 Wall Street was good. We got an ID number for it. USS Yorktown was good. Boom, we got an ID number for it. But back to Sabotage. I lied. There's actually six games named Sabotage. And it turns out that it was number five. So there was a clear match here. There was no user intervention required until we did that timeout. Let's do a dupes check. Duplicates were detected. Six of them. Is it one of these six or was it do we have to start from scratch and have you rewrite the title and loop back through the whole whole script? Luckily, it's right there. We gave you some context in the form of year published, likely the 2019 one. Let's go. Uh, the most straightforward usage of this script is, hey, we got this game called Copper Island. No one's ever heard of it. Well, it's called, it's called Cooper Island. Here we go. Is it Cooper Island, Clover Island, Coney Island? <laughs> Or do we need to, uh, you know, say no match and either give up or do a manual correction? And this is what happens when there's no when there's no duplicate and it's a clear, obvious match. So that was all well and good. We got a little bit of time left. Let's actually look at what the data looks like and what sort of visualizations we can make. Uh, we've got two other people working on the software uh, that are working on visualizations. The first one is all going to be Altair. So this is our, our data science guy and enforcer handle Waterbeards. Give you a big shout out there. He's been super helpful with this. Uh, he informs me that this has a much better usage than uh, Matplotlib, which, you know, I've not attempted to use either of these as I wasn't the one handling this. Uh, but noted, Altair much better. Uh, Altair, I will tell you, is a... This declarative statistical visualization library for Python. Yes, I just read that mouthful. Uh, the other enforcer, Frisky, uh, is playing around in Splunk, which I have only heard of because they keep advertising in all my favorite public radio podcasts. Uh, she's still working on some cool trending and observations. Uh, this is pre-recorded, so I'll be in the chat, as you know, and if we've got anything cool extra to show here, I'll absolutely throw in sort of an image gallery link here that you can check out as well, uh, as well as a copy of these slides for anyone that wants to look at them at their own speed. So if we actually want to look at what this visualization shows, you know, it's, it's a growth chart here going out to like, the last column here should be labeled 2019, uh, showing all of the tabletop checkouts for the PAX libraries minus PAX Australia, which I mentioned is coming as they're they're adopting this software package for their own use. Uh, and we do have 2020 data, which continues fantastic growth, but it's a little too depressing to think about, you know, a chart that only shows half the conventions for a year. So we chose to end it in 2019 here. And this is the favorite chart of mine, just because it shows that my baby, Pax Unplugged, came along, burst onto the scene in 2017, and damn near eclipsed every other Pax combined uh, as far as board game checkouts are concerned. Well, let's look at uh, one of our other big conventions, PAX East. Looking at PAX East 2020 and doing the daily checkout. The four lines here go from light to dark. Uh, the lightest line is the earliest and they get darker as time progresses. So this is a super dark one that sort of drops off like a cliff, cliff uh, when we kick everybody out is Sunday. And Thursday is the slow starter because everyone's at work. But it's really interesting to watch Friday and Saturday. So Friday, Friday and Saturday just sort of come up together almost in lockstep. You know, they get to the same point at around the same time. What is it? Is it Saturday? Yeah, Saturday gets going a little bit later than Friday does. but. Saturday remains an even higher traffic day, but they diverge right here at four o'clock before they have the same standard like dinner activity and the going to sleep that I assume is what happens when you leave PAX. Uh, why is this? We can think about this and contemplate data. Uh, my own personal theory is that if you're here at a PAX on a Friday and it's four o'clock, the expo hall closes in two hours. Uh, maybe you are a person of many interests and like all that PAX has to offer. So you might say, ah, damn, expo halls closing in two hours. 
I don't get over there now, I am going to have to fight the Saturday Sunday traffic, which, as we all know, is a much busier time. So people might choose to put aside the cardboard for just a bit and go see their lap of the expo hall before it gets too crowded during the weekend and then get back to it in the same fashion that we do on just about every day that we have dinner hour gaming. Um, Let's put this aside for now and then look at PAX Unplugged 2019. And we'll go through just our top titles here. This isn't normalized for how many existed in the collection that is coming. And you can look at our Twitter, uh, TT underscore HQ, at TT underscore HQ is the Tabletop Headquarters Twitter account. We do publish top 20 stats, uh, both non and normalized for copies per checkout. Uh, So this is just a, a raw look at the three most popular games, which is sort of dominated here uh if you're not familiar with obscurio uh this is the follow-up to mysterium and it had just come out prior to unplug 2019 funny enough mysterium is down here at number nine but number nine is number 10 <laughs> i swear i didn't rig this data for dumb dad jokes uh but them's is the breaks uh so hey now you know what got checked out a lot but it can get a little bit more interesting if we look at the mechanics. So I mentioned that these are large families of descriptors, but there are actually 169 different mechanics in the PGG database. And, you know, they're not, you know, mutually exclusive. They could be many assigned, multiple assignment to a particular game. So you could have a both card drafting and tile placement assignment and to one game because it happens to have both of those mechanics in them. Uh, irregardless of how many may have existed in the library, we don't know right now, unless we do a more detailed cut, uh, but hand management games were sort of blew it out of the water. We had like basically 3,000 checkouts of hand management games, which is nothing to sneeze at, especially when you consider how big the drop-off is before we even get into the top 10 out of, what did I say, 169 different mechanics. So looking at our final view here, uh, these are the popular categories. Now, there's only 79 of these categories, but it, it certainly checks that card game as a generic descriptor. Uh, again, it's just this massive domination of the category field. But if you want to settle any sort of like nerd rage debates here, it's fantasy much more popular than science fiction. Animal, just animals are more popular than sci-fi. So I don't know, are you going to take that sitting down? Uh, in any case, uh, I mentioned, hopefully I got a couple more fun views to show you in the chat. If not, you can do this yourself using what I just taught you and that book I kept referencing. Uh, I'll post the link to the slides in here as well as the link to the GitHub. So this is where all the tabletop library software is maintained. Ignore that and just look at the uh, BGG API scripts folder here, which is what I've been working on with all that summer free time for fun. So remember not a professional coder when you pour through this and and laugh at all the non-pythonic statements uh this was maybe not done in the most elegant way always but there are many points that i'm proud of at least proud enough to come here and take an hour of your time thank you for giving that hour of your time you know hopefully you're having a good time at pax online and hopefully you can get right back to it so thanks again for watching hopefully hopefully see you at a future pax event quite soon
Hi, I'm Gareth Damian Martin, the solo developer behind In Other Waters. In Other Waters is a narrative exploration game that casts you as the AI assistant to a xenobiologist as they explore and study an alien ocean. Played through a unique interface that offers a distinct perspective on the water world of Glias 667cc, In Other Waters paints the picture of a unique and complex ecology through an immersive array of signals, descriptions and sounds as well as offering a compelling mystery as you help Ellery Vass track missing scientist Dr. Mene Namora and uncover the complex history of this planet. In Other Waters also rewards free exploration and scientific study. With detailed taxonomy entries complete with biological sketches to be unlocked for each creature. Imagined as an alternative to the militaristic and colonial focus of most science fiction, In Other Waters is a game about humanity's relationship to the ecologies that surround us, and our insatiable curiosity about the natural world. In a time of climate crisis and ecological destruction, can we imagine a different future, or are we doomed to repeat the mistakes of our species past? Find out in this unique and beautiful dive into another world. Available now on PC, Mac, and Nintendo Switch. My name is Eve Crevache, and I'm the executive director of Take This, a mental health nonprofit that serves the game industry. You may know Take This as a PAX attendee in the past uh, from our AFK rooms, which are a feature of in-person conventions. And here we are at uh, PAX Online with AFK Online. And one of the reasons that's so important is because just like in a regular con in-person convention, a space that you can go to to relax and quiet your mind and take a, a break from the intensity of the convention is important here too. And the reason we care about this and the reason this is something even to talk about is because of online convention, not only is it new, but it's also a pretty intense experience in ways that we're not used to. And so I'm here to help you identify some ways to take care of yourself, stay calm, and feel like you have your um, tools for self-care. So I encourage you to remember, even though PAX Online is a 24-7 convention for nine days, that it's okay to miss things. You will, in fact, miss many things. It's okay to feel like you're not finding your friends. You will, in fact, not always find your friends online. It's okay to feel like this is strange. It's okay to feel distracted. And 
it's probably going to happen. Manage your expectations and understand that this is a strange experience and a strange new way of working. It's fine. It's okay. And take breaks. Walk away. Give yourself the opportunity to rest and recharge. Just like at a regular convention, the same basic self-care principles apply. Get enough sleep, eat proper meals, drink plenty of water, and walk away from your screen. In fact, that's what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to take this lovely mug of tea, which I drink every morning, and I'm going to turn off my camera, step away from my computer, and sip it. I hope you have a great time at PAX Online, and I hope you visit AFK Online, which you can find through the PAX website. There's an AFK page, and there's a link to AFK Online right there. And come visit if you need it. Thanks, and have a great day.
Do you love indies? Then you may want to stick around for the next hour as we attempt to rank the top 10 indies of all time. My name is Brennan Groom, and I'm the host of the Pass Controller Podcast. And joining me on this indie field journey is an illustrious cast from around the country. Let's meet the panel. Joining us from Indie Obscura, the editor-in-chief, Morgan Shaver. Morgan, how are you doing tonight? Uh, not bad. Not bad at all. Keeping this train going, we have Cameron Hawkins, writer at Dual Shockers, and the current Kind of Funny Intersight champion. Cameron, how are you doing tonight? Great. I'm ready to talk games. Ready to talk indies? I'm, yeah. I'm very curious to see what you go to bat for tonight. It's going to be it's going to be a good time. We'll see. Also joining us is Jenny Wyndham, developer at Rose City Games, the queen of cozy games, and recently featured <laughs> in Nintendo Indie Direct. That's pretty, <laughs> pretty remarkable. Jenny, how are you doing tonight? Uh, very, very good. I'm excited to talk indie games. Yeah, indies need more love, and that's what we're here to do today. Mm -hmm. Keeping this going, we have Alex Van Aking, editor, video producer, podcaster, pretty much does everything you can think at OK Beast. Alex, how are you doing tonight? Hey, I'm doing good. Thanks so much for, for having me on the panel. I'm excited. Yeah, this is a great group. I'm very excited. And rounding us out is one of my co-hosts, the former Overwatch fiend, Todd Gary. Todd, how are you doing tonight? I'm good. I'm doing well. I'm excited to, to dive in. Yeah, I mean, you're wearing a Cuphead shirt, so I feel like I already have some, <laughs> I, I, someone on my side fighting for, for a game I'm interested in. So yeah, right. I'm, I'm very excited. So a little bit of the nitty gritty of how we're going to run things tonight. We each picked three games ahead of time. We're going to get to us in a, a list of 18 games. And between that 18, we're going to all come together and figure out how we can narrow this impossible task of making a top 10 list of the best indie games of all time. So to kick things off, we're going to start with Alex. Alex, if you want to take a moment to fight for your first three indie games. Sure. Um, well, my first pick um, is going to be Celeste. Uh, by Matt Makes Games. Uh, it's a for those who aren't aware, it's a 2D platformer um, that is really fun. It came out in I think 2018. Uh, features a character named Madeline, um, and you are kind of uh, platforming through this like dream-like, dream-esque mountaintop that's full of you know different environments and different buildings, and you're kind of platforming, making your way to the top of the summit. And along the way, um, the the game surprisingly, when I first played it. I didn't, I wasn't really expecting this, but it kind of dives pretty deep into some, you know, mental health discussions. And, and uh, I just found that when I played this game, I was going through, you know, some hardships and it just came at the right time uh, and kind of spoke to me and, and was a touching story and honestly, just a, a really fun gameplay experience. Um, and so Celeste, uh, it's also got an incredible soundtrack um, by Lena Rain. It's phenomenal. Um, there's also a great remix soundtrack. So all in all, just a really fun game, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to include it on this list. Uh, my second pick is one that I'm sure many people are familiar with, Undertale, uh, developed by Toby Fox and Friends. Uh, it's, a RP it's the RPG that, that got famous for you know, uh, allowing you to not kill enemies and to progress through the entire game uh, via a pacifist run, and it's full of really fun characters and i i'm actually like not one of those people that like sometimes like video game stories kind of just bounce off of me unfortunately i i think it's you know just like a um you know when you're just reading text on screen sometimes it doesn't always land but for me undertale was one of those games that just you know it was so relatable it was so funny um the characters you really the characters were are honestly all over the place and are are written in a very um I don't know whether or like a meme format. Like there's a lot of like internet culture in this game. And so I'm mm. curious how that'll age like 10 years down the line. But um, having played it, I played it in 2017, I think uh, a few years after it released and it quickly became one of my favorite games. Also banger soundtrack as well. Uh, and then lastly, my third pick um, is a walking simulator. It was actually, uh, it's my favorite walking sim. It's Firewatch developed by Campo Santo. Um, I just, I love the story between uh, the main characters, Henry and Delilah. Uh, Henry kind of goes out into the wilderness and becomes a, you know, joins the Firewatch and, and is on the lookout for fires and develops a relationship with this other character named Delilah along the way. And um, yeah, it's just a very cinematic uh, story that was presented gorgeously with um, beautiful artwork. And, and yeah, so Firewatch is easily one of my favorite games 
uh, and one of my favorite indies of all time. So uh, that's why I included it on this list. And those are my three picks. It's definitely a trend of banger music in your picks. Yeah, exactly. I know. Yeah. Firewatch too, man. Banger music. Acoustic guitars. Oof. So good. <laughs> you, got, you gotta have it. So, Cam, what are your three picks to add to this list of 18? So my first pick is uh, Limbo. Limbo is one of my favorite games of all time. Um, the ending made me cry, and it literally has no dialogue throughout the entire game, and it's a very gloomy game as you as you can tell by the title um and i think that achieving that for me was just a huge uh speaks volumes and um i think that it is masterful in the sound design like there are little secrets in the game where you have to rely on the sound design to pass certain levels or certain sections of the game uh because it's literally just completely dark so you can't see your character uh, which I think is really, really cool level design and sound design. Um, I think just artistically, it is beautiful with it being all in whites, blacks, and uh, grays. Um, I think it's just, I, I, like, I just can't think of any flaws with this game. I think I think, I think it's uh, as perfect to a video game as it can be. Um, and mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's great. Uh, my second game is Castle Crashers. Uh, I yes. Think, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> on the 360, that was like... I put so many hours into Castle Crashers. I, I replayed that game countless times. It's so replayable. It's it's endlessly fun. There's so much content in that game. Um, it's it, it's just a great it, one. In my opinion, probably the best like multiplayer indie there is. Um, bringing back that arcade feel that you like, you know, from like the TMNT, like th that those type of experiences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't think really any any other game like it has surpassed that since its release um and then the third game um i don't it, it's honestly like not one of my favorite games but i think it should be in the discussion which is why i brought it to the table um and that's the binding of isaac um i think that you know uh since indies have become more popular again we've seen a lot of uh roguelike uh roguelike titles like dead cells which is personally my favorite uh, but I think that the Binding of Isaac is just the best. I think that it's just it's just brutally hard, but it's never like I never feel like it's it's my like I I always know it's something that I got to learn and get better at and like it doesn't it it it, it doesn't hold your hand at all. And I mm -hmm. think that as someone who likes to be challenged in video games, I think that that is the most um, attractive thing with roguelikes is when they're just incredibly hard and you just got to figure it out and just adapt and learn and and it's just such a unique game and uh again just tons of content uh i think it's great um so those are my three all, all great picks castle crashers is, is definitely one of my favorite games of all time for yeah. sure uh jenny it's your turn what are your three? Oh my goodness i just have to say it was like i would think i was telling you it was like picking kids like it's the <laughs> hardest decision i think i've had to make in a long time is picking my top three um so my first one was Florence, and this is a really like hopeful and heartfelt game by developer Mountains and Anna Perna Interactive published it. Um, and the premise of this game is about a woman named Florencio who just feels stuck in this mundane loop of everyday life, going to work, coming home, going on social media and like sleeping, rinse and repeat. <laughs> um, but one day she meets this cello player named Krish and sparks ensue. And this game is just this beautiful love story. But throughout it, it's not a love story, perhaps in the most the way that you think by the end. And I, I really appreciated that. Um, this game packs so many emotions into a very short time span. I think it was only about 30 minutes to play. Um, and so I found that the shorter time frame actually felt really great because time-wise it was accessible to consume. Um, it's a game that you can pick up and just really immerse yourself in and feel feel good about. Um, and I picked this because like the story is so human and poignant and the art uses color in an incredibly just intelligent way. The soundtrack uh, is just beautiful. Um, and I think it's also really neat that this is an indie that was on mobile first and the way that the mechanics work and the way that they use touch screen to convey the repetitive, repetitive nature of some of these daily actions, it just 
it's something that only games can do and only games mm-hmm. can immerse you with. And I thought that was really, really beautiful. Um, I also thought it was cool because the team actually intentionally created something that did not involve violence within a game. And I always appreciate when games try to look at different ways that we can engage in a loop and play um, that's not traditional. So that's why I picked Florence. Uh, my second game was one that I didn't initially think of, but the more that I thought about it, the more I was like, ah, I think this this should be at least mentioned on the list, and that's the Stanley Parable. Uh, mm. Oh gosh, where to start with this? So it's <laughs> developed and published by Galactic Cafe, and it's another short game, so I guess I'm also just digging indie games that I can actually finish. Um, and so this is another one where it's about a person named Stanley who's stuck in these sort of daily... He's an office worker. He's probably not happy at his job, which is very relatable. And things take a strange turn at the start of the game because all of the coworkers in the office building that Stanley works has disappeared. And so you begin exploring. And as you, as Stanley, explore this office, the narrator starts to really cheekily and snarkily explain and narrate what's happening. And then starts to narrate your decisions and sort of tell you what to do. And as a player, you can choose whether or not to follow those traditional steps that the narrator is telling you or break the mold. And this game is genuinely one of the funniest games I've ever played. Like, I was laughing out loud. um, And I personally find that humor can be kind of difficult for a lot of games. Um, Very few games, I think, really get funny in the way that the Stanley Parable does. And what I loved is there's just some really thoughtful themes presented about the nature of playing games and what it means to consume and engage with a narrative uh, and whether or not we choose to break the rules. Like, what does that mean when the game designer has allowed you to break the rules? It's just it gets really meta and really cool. (laughs) Um, And I think only you only really get to see that in indies like indies have the freedom to explore that kind of a discussion. And then my last selection, uh, which this is personally my favorite game of all time, and that's Journey, um, co-developed by that game company and Santa Monica Studio. And I think it's published now on PC and PS4, thanks to Annapurna. Um, And it's a really straightforward game. In Journey, you just play a robed figure who is compelled to move forward toward this mountain and this beam of light. And... uh, there's no text, there's just music, and you just kind of intrinsically know that that's your goal. And the way that the game takes you through these ruins and through all of these sort of environments without text, but just through music and and imagery is it's impeccable. It's like probably the greatest work, one of the greatest works of art um, in games for sure, and maybe even outside of games. Um, in its simplicity and clarity, it just I love how when you play Journey, because it is so almost simple or bare as a game, every time you play, you can kind of go into it and engage with it in a different way. Um, The soundtrack was like Grammy nominated, so another just great soundtrack. Um, And for those of you who haven't played, I don't want to go into it too much, but it uh, changed the way I thought about online and co-op play. Uh, Throughout the game, there are other robed figures that you can interact with. And by the end, like I have never played it and not cried. (laughs) So, um, yeah, those are my three. Awesome. Definitely, definitely like so far already, this list is so diverse. And I think just in general, anyone that made their own top 10 is probably going to be nothing like the rest of our lists. (laughs) Um, but I'm excited because like everyone's speaking so passionately about these games and, uh, I'm I'm just I'm really excited right now. I love talking about indie games. So Morgan, that brings us to you. What are your three picks? Uh so my first pick was uh Don't Starve. Um it's mm. a indie survival game. Um and it kind of changes the way survival games work in a few different ways. Um the art style I think is probably one of the most memorable aspects of it. It's got this like Tim Burton-esque kind of gothic art style. Um the way the characters interact like this with musical instruments. And I thought that that was really cool when they speak. It's like the sounds of musical instruments. Um, And yeah, it's just a really addicting game to play. It's different every single time, um, but it's easy to jump in because you just start and you just start collecting things. Um, And it just, it doesn't feel 
as difficult in some ways as some of the other survival games at first. And then it's like, as you play, you're like, oh, everything can kill you, um, which I think is also really fun and funny because there's a lot of unexpected elements to it. And as you play and go along, um, it just gets harder and harder and harder. I haven't made it past winter. <laughs> I haven't I haven't gotten that far. So it's very difficult. And I put quite a bit of time into it. So I don't know if I just suck at the game or if it's really hard. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then they also added the multiplayer element, which I think is fun as well, because you can play with your friends and you can choose either to like help each other or burn everything to the ground. <laughs> I have some friends who are just like, yeah, let's just let's torch it. So <laughs> I think that's kind of fun. Um, <clears throat> and then I guess my next pick is kind of a personal one for me, but I think that it's really good and worth mentioning. It's Chivalry Medieval Warfare. Mm -hmm. um, I've put an obscene amount of time into that game. And it was it started as a mod, which I think is really cool because a lot of indie games kind of start that way in some aspects. They like start as a mod, and it has a really great modding community to it as well, where people can do anything. There's like a mod that has like no gravity, and you're just flying through the air screaming, and it's just <laughs> really out there. Um, the multiplayer element to it is kind of interesting as well because the game doesn't encourage you to be chivalrous to other players, but I've noticed that that's something that just naturally happens where sometimes you'll be going around in like a team deathmatch or just a free for all. And you'll just make a friend that you just won't kill for whatever reason. Like you can't really communicate with them other than the voice prompts. Like you can scream at them or say no over and over and over again. And the voice acting at the game is really funny. So it's just, <laughs> it's hard to play it sometimes and not laugh because you'll just see somebody and you'll just run away screaming and it just becomes like a thing. Um, another great element to it as well is the intricacy of the sword play a little bit. Um, when I would play, I it was really difficult and everyone has their different favorite weapon and it's just really hard to master. And I love the fact that there's like clans and people you can make friends with. And there were like servers where they'll teach you, you know, it's not like a, a thing that's built into the game game. The players just made that. Um, and I just think that's really great. I, I haven't seen that kind of element to multiplayer games too much where it's just the players have expanded it on their own. So I think that that's kind of cool. And then my last pick is Life is Strange. Uh, that one I really liked the narrative of. I think it took um, kind of an understandable concept of like high school and friendship and it kind of uh, elevated it and made it very interesting and different with the time travel mechanic and the rewind and the, mm -hmm. the characters were just so well written. I found myself really relating to Chloe. I could see a lot of myself when I was in high school in Chloe and I thought that that was kind of, it was nice and refreshing to see that kind of dynamic um, between also between Max and Chloe and their friendship. And it's not perfect. There's a lot of things in that game that aren't perfect in the way that they overcome those things and how heavy some of it hits. Like there's so many heavy elements to the game that I think that it does it really well. And it's another one that's hard to play without crying for many of the different episodes in the plot. It's just, mm -hmm. I don't want to spoil anything, but it's, it's sad. It's sad, but it's good, but it's sad. So uh, I really like that game a lot. I love it. So it sounds like between all the picks so far, good music and you have to cry. And that's like right. the benchmark. <laughs> yeah, right. that's, that's where we're at. <laughs> so Todd, let's hear your three picks. All right. Well, my first pick is one of my favorite games of all time. Um, it's another play dead game. It's uh, inside. Uh, the first time I, pick this game up i just remember you just dropped into this world some the same way you are with limbo uh and, you know and you don't know what's going on you're just a boy in a red shirt the 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 tension the lighting the shading everything in this game is like so amazing and you are just it's the same kind of not to piggyback off a of cam but it's the same thing where there's no dialogue in this this game and you are you're just rooting for this boy. You want him to get to where he's going. And there's not like a single word spoken. And the whole time I'm just like, Oh, come on, we're going to do this. We're doing this together, you know? And, uh, and then you get to that without, obviously I'm not going to go to spoilers, but you get to those last 10 minutes and it is one of the most bad shit, crazy ends to a game <laughs> I've ever played. Um, mm -hmm. and I loved every, I remember watching it and just being like, what? Oh my God. Oh my God. And then replaying it and replaying it. There is certain things where it's obviously I, I don't want to go on a spoilers, but, 
you don't even notice stuff your first playthrough, and then you go through it on your second playthrough, and you're like, wait, oh, what? Uh, oh, and one of one of the reasons why I love this game so much, I love games that the second I'm done with it, I go to the ends of the internet to find people talking about it, and everyone has a different theory. Everyone has, but they all work. They all seem to work in some weird way. There's no set story. Everyone has, you know, it's it's... It's great, and I just love stuff that makes me think for days and days after playing it. And that that game was absolutely just a game that I couldn't stop thinking about. And that's it's probably why it's one of my favorite games of all time. Uh, number two uh, is probably the second indie I think I ever played, uh, and it was one of those games I saw released on PC. And I'm like, man, I need this game. I need this game right now. And then it finally got announced for Vita. Uh, it's Hotline Miami from Denaton. It was. Um, it's another game that just like hit me over the head with like this crazy violence. But the movie drive came out about a year before this game, I believe. Mm. And I, it's like, and that's one of my favorite movies of all time. And I love the soundtrack. Love, 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 love the soundtrack. So when I started playing hotline Miami, all of a sudden I'm like, okay, I'm down with this. And like, you got the headphones on and you're just like bopping, running around, killing people. It's so bad, but like, you're just like, you know, you're like, it, there's so many different ways to kill people. There's, you know, there's so many things they throw at you. But one of my favorite things about that game is after you kill everyone, everything stops and you're just walking through this building where you mastered everyone quietly, you know? So they kind of want you to reflect on everything you did at the end of the, at, at the end of every level, uh, which I always loved about it, but that game, I still play the soundtrack to this day. It's yeah. one of my favorite. It, it's, it's, I can put that on at any point and I'm like, yep. Anytime, you know, I'll put it on. <laughs> but, um, and then my final game is basically the first indie I ever played. And it goes back to my Vita again. My Vita was like my indie machine back in the day. Um, and it was Spelunky and I'd never played a roguelike before. Uh, uh, and this game for me, I, I, I didn't know what I was doing at first. I was like, wait, okay, it's different this time around. What's going on here? And I'm like, oh, I can't do that. Oh, what's this? Oh, and I kept on just like having to learn the game more and more and more. And it was kind of unlike anything I'd ever played before. And it's kind of funny because I just, I've been going back to it recently. And this just shows you how like this game can surprise you at any point. I bought an ax from a shop, was picking at something. Next thing I know, this thing above it just dropped down and smushed me. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, okay. I was like, so it's one of those games where like something new, it feels like it's new every time you play it. And uh, yeah. I really appreciate that. And that was like the first, like I said, style of rogue type game that I was like, oh, okay, I'm down with this. But yeah, that's my career. I will say, uh, I won't go off on too big of a tangent, but Todd and I have had many discussions where he says the Vita is better than the 3DS. And I, I like hard disagree <laughs> with that. I think but everyone he, disagrees with me. He, Yeah. He, well, he always brings up that it's the indie machine for him and Spelunky and Hotline Miami and all these other things. And I'm like, my indie heart has a hard time fighting against him on that. Um, but the 3DS is a better library. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> anyways, so I will now add my three picks to this list of 18. And all three of these games are something that are ve like very, very special to me. I'll start with Shovel Knight, which... I personally think that it's probably the best indie game ever made for a lot of reasons. Um, but for me, Shovel Knight came at a time where there wasn't like there are so many games like Shovel Knight now, whether it's the art style or it's, you know, traditional platformer that harkens back to like the 8 bit era, 16 bit era. But there was a time where that wasn't the thing that everyone was pumping out. And Shovel Knight was kind of you know, towards the beginning, if not the beginning of that, at least in a mainstream way. Um, and I think that, you know, over the course of that, I mean, that game technically has a bunch of DLC that's still considered like the main game. But even if you just take Shovel Knight Treasure Trove, which is the original game, I'm sorry, the Shovel of Hope, which is the original game. Um, I think that that game itself, without the expansions, which are all great in their own right, is such a benchmark for not only platformers, but just uh, indie games in general. I think that when you're looking at platforming games in particular, one of the most important things is tight controls. And if the jumping doesn't feel right, if the if it feels slippery, if the platforming doesn't feel pixel perfect, I feel like that can really make or break a platforming experience. And I feel like Shovel Knight executes both on gameplay, on art style. It has incredible music by Jake Kaufman. Um, I like, I love 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 shovel knight um 
So that is my first pick. My second pick is another game that I have a long history with, which is Cuphead. And Cuphead is one of those things that when I saw Cuphead get revealed, it was immediately like, this is something I need to play as soon as possible. And it got delayed for so, so long. And I remember it must have been like PAX East 2016, maybe, or maybe that's too early, 2017. And it was like the first demo that was available to play anywhere that I could go, that I was at. And I remember playing the game. It was at the, the Microsoft booth and playing the game over and over and over again. And just like, it was, it was actually way more difficult than it was in the final release. The the <laughs> early beta was more difficult, um, but it was just so punishing. And one, one of the developers was from studio MDHR was standing there and we were just like talking and it was just everything about that moment then to when that game finally came out, uh, myself, uh, the other people in past controller, all of us got to my house the day that it came out and we all sat down and played, took turns playing co-op together. Um, and it just, it, it had such a special place in my heart for all of those reasons. But aside from all the personal stuff, I think that again, just it's very, very impressive what they did with that art style where it's all hand-drawn. Um, and it is, I think there's like nothing else as gorgeous as that game um, that I've ever seen. It's just, it's literally, you know, a playable cartoon. It's a cartoon in motion. Uh, and if you dig deeper into the history and the story of Studio MDHR and what those people had to do where, you know, they mortgaged their house, they did all these things, which is a story that probably is not too far from other indies, um, yeah. which is why I love indies. But there's just so much love and passion into that game. And for me, it stands out. And that music is so good for like how Todd can play the hotline Miami soundtrack all the time. Like the cuphead soundtrack that that is always finding its way into into my rotation and yeah i i love cuphead and then my final game which this is like my personal pick i really hope it makes the top 10 i don't feel confident it will make the top 10 but it is the messenger so for me the messenger is i would say that shovel knight was the benchmark for indie platforming games and i still think that shovel knight is a benchmark but i feel like the messenger is the closest if not the best comparison to um an indie platformer that i think executes completely on you know a gameplay standpoint i think that it it nails what it's doing with the art style which is you know 8, 8 bit 16 bit you know uh they do a little i don't want to go into too much uh spoiling but there is a twist that happens later in the game there's a switch between 8-bit graphic style and 16-bit graphic style, and there's a story reason as to why that happens. And I, that I was not like I was expecting to love this game when I had the chance to play it with uh, uh, Thierry Bullinger, who's the creator uh, mm -hmm. at Sabotage Studio. But when I got to play it for my like at home with the with the review copy and play play the whole game at once, and knowing ahead of time that I knew there was this stuff because we had talked about it even when it happened in the game, it was still so impactful to me that I think that's like good storytelling and good, and good, uh, something that's very hard to achieve, I think, for, for things, especially if you know in advance certain plot twists or elements that are going to come about. So for me, that is just, uh, it's, it was my game of the year in 2018 when it came out. I love that game, and it, uh, it definitely is one of my favorite indie games of all time. So Awesome. Now that we have gone through our three picks each, we this are going to be hard. I just want to be very, very hard. Yeah. It's gonna be very hard. <laughs> so we have gone through our 18 picks. We have 18 delicious indie games ahead of us. Now the hard part is basically telling eight of them they're not good enough. They're not good uh, enough for the top. Before we get started, I just want to say we're talking about the top 18 indie games. Well, we're talking right. about the top 10, but these 18 are clearly incredible regardless of where they they end up on the list. Absolutely. So. For sure. And it was, I mean, I'm sure we all had, I mean, I saw some of your other lists of things that we, you know, had to leave off, oh, yeah. unfortunately, but I think like eight. Yeah. <laughs> there's, yeah. there's so many other games that, you know, could very easily given a different day, different conversation be on this list. Um, so, you know, take, take this for what it is. It's, it's our top 10 at this moment. It could change tomorrow. If we had the same <laughs> conversation, who knows? It's true. 
Mm -hmm. So who wants to do the honors of taking a game and putting it on this list first? Put it on the list? <laughs> I mean, uh, how, how do we want to how do we want to start divi how do we want to start deciding what what makes the top 10? We'll say like just from observation uh, out of all the games that were said, I think the most agreeance that we got like head nods and things like that was when I said Castle Crashers. I'm just saying. I'm not saying that to say like, hey, my game should go on the list. But I saw like everyone being like, yes, Castle Crashers is awesome. So I'm just saying that like, you know, <laughs> I would put it in the top 10. It would be um, on the list for me. A lot of people it would be on the list for me yeah, too. I would definitely put it up there. So mm -hmm. I, will put right that, there. I will put that on there for now. Where it stays on the list, who knows? It's uh, sitting at it's sitting pretty at number one for now. Okay. <laughs> and can, then can the behemoth keep it up. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna start hurting some feelings. I'm so sorry. Uh, I love take uh, the initiative. Just start just start yeah, getting no, that one. I'm gonna, start, I'm, gonna start, I'm gonna start pulling heart strings. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Oh. Um, so uh Brendan, I love you, but the oh, messenger is no. not top ten. I'm sorry. I had to it's, go to bat for my for one of my favorite games. I, I knew you were going to say it, but I was just like, I'm gonna have to let, I, I, like, I'm gonna have to let you down quickly. Uh, I wish I could chime in. I haven't played it. Because the thing is with oh, the messenger so is good. that there are games, uh, not that I wouldn't say are comparable, but I feel like there are games that have recently came out around the same span as the mess around t same time frame as the messenger, that I feel like are more talked about and more like you need to play this. You need like you need to play this game. Like you need to play Dead Cells. You need to play Hollow Knight. So, you need to play. Like so things like yes. that that in in 2018 celeste dead cells hollow knight and the messenger all came out and no one talks about the messenger which is why i have to bring it up today because <laughs> i love that game and it mm -hmm. doesn't get the praise it deserves it sold very well it did very well they're making a prequel that's also an rpg called sea of stars fantastic looking game yeah but uh yeah i i have to go to bat for one of my favorite games but I understand not, yeah. it. I, I can take that. I can take that. I'll take yeah. it. Yeah. And we're not like, and again, we, we were just like, all these are good games. Like none of these Absolutely, games are bad. Yeah. It's just like top 10. We got to, got to make some cuts here. And uh, for me, I think like the easiest cut right now that I see uh, that I've played uh, a little bit of is the messenger. So I'm that's. Are there any that we can <laughs> hold hands on and say, yes. I'm I'm with Cam on the messenger though, because I, I, I oh, thought it was Todd, all right. Go but, away. Sorry. Get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying I to change you. the topic for you. <laughs> I know. I know. It's, not it's not a bad game. It's not a bad game. Can we hold? Can we? Can at least four of us hold hands on Undertale? Yes. Right. Yes. 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 Okay. That's mm -hmm. that's on the list. There's two. Um, I would probably put Undertale above Castle Crashers as well. We're Same. not going to rank them yet. We're not I ranking them yet. Oh. We're not whoa, ranking whoa, them whoa. yet. Okay. No, we don't. We got to build the suspense. I, think, I would also uh, hold hands on Celeste. I feel like. I no. Me too. I'm sorry. Oh. I'm sorry. Oh, that, Alex that and I are holding I, hands. Anyone else come in for this? I, I recognize it's a oh. great game. It just didn't, and I think it does some important messages. It just didn't hit with like I played it in full. I played the entire game. I know the entire story. We're not gonna be friends after and this game. I think <laughs> I think it's a great game. I just our relationship is over. I just didn't. I don't think it's a top ten indie. Remember, indies are like. 10 years old at this point you know what i mean mm -hmm. like it's just for there's sure. so many games I can we keep that... it on the list for now sure 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 okay <laughs> just because you never know you know my own 20 process. minutes from I now things say, might be different one thing that i really want to point out about celeste because celeste was actually one of my top three choices and then i was so excited that alex picked celeste so that i could like free up another space for something else um so for me celeste is especially impactful because uh like for me, it changed the way that I thought about a genre um, because of all of the accessibility that it has yep. included. For and sure. so I think the fact that it allowed people to access a genre that maybe they would have never tried, I think is so powerful for any game. So I definitely want to like not knock it off the list, but definitely keep it there. Sure, sure. You know what? I, I'd like to add something to Celeste and maybe sway, maybe sway some hearts, maybe sway some people here. <laughs> you know, Celeste came out in 2018 the messenger came out in 2018 you know, if jenny and alex want to go to bat for the messenger i could you know tick that box oh. for some no, <laughs> get out of here get out don't make deals don't make deals it's uh, early. We can make deals so i'm going okay uh can i think we can all hold hands on shovel knight i mean i that's a yes for me or obviously i think yeah cuz 
No, 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 no. I got we got two uh, yeses. It's not my I, favorite. I, I mean, I, I will say that. I will say two two D platformers really? like uh well Shovel Knight in particular. I'm not gonna talk about two D platform. Shovel Knight in particular, for some reason, like I respect that game so much and I know that is beloved. And like me even just like saying like a butt in here, like everybody's hating me. <laughs> yeah, I'm like kind of shit right now. Like listen, uh, I respect Shovel Knight. I think it's an excellent game. Just didn't necessarily land for me as as uh, hard as it did for other people. Also, it got I'm just, okay. I'm just saying, also, you can it was at big him enough. at it's Van Aiken. Oh and no! Was, how very wrong was, he is. I'm, I'm Shovel Knight was <laughs> Shovel Knight was big enough that it got amiibos, y'all. It got amiibos. That's true. That's a good point. Yeah, so, it, is, it is the only indie game, indie indie uh, representative that is a assist trophy in Super Smash Brothers. Yeah, like Shovel Knight was the one character that I like legitimately thought could have been could be a Smash character when should have been in Smash. Like, been Smash. like that one, the one indie character that I can think of. Like this makes I sense. I agree for with Smash. you. I think Shovel Knight is a gear. Like I, I don't, I don't know. But like, we I'm not on, saying it's on. not top ten. We I'm just on. not like number we'll one. On. We'll move on. Uh, for, I think for, it's we could put it in the top. No, 10 I think we can somewhere. leave it in there for now. We can leave it in there for, for now. now. Let's do oh, it. <laughs> I'll say this, like if I'm making like the pillar of indie games, like not even the top 10, like pillars of indies, Shovel Knight is like a, a I agree. pole on that I building agree. for me. I agree. Hands down. Um, I, I do like how our, our method of, of getting to this top 10 is holding hands. Yeah. I want to acknowledge how great that is. It's just, it's just majority. Like to, can a majority of people say that this would be on top 10? Um, okay. So here's where uh, things, I, things are going to get dicey as well. Um, Let's talk about Journey for a second. Oh my um, god! <laughs> so I played, I played Get Journey, <laughs> I played Journey uh, when it was like it came out free for PS4, PlayStation Plus, and I'm not a big PlayStation guy. Like I didn't have a PS3 for most of the PS3 era, so I didn't really play Journey when it came out, and that might be the reason why it didn't really connect with me. Because um, you know, uh, Jenny was talking about like basically you can run into other players in the game while you're playing. I did not have that experience. Mm. Uh, I didn't, and I think that even though probably at the time it was an amazing experience as a game, but knowing that that is like a really attractive feature about that game that is no longer really a thing, uh, kind of, in my opinion, hurts the quality of the game over time and just the amount of replayability. I'm not saying that that's the entire journey experience. But that was like, because I remember I played through the entirety of the game and I didn't know that that was a feature when I played through it and, and until after I beat the game and someone uh, brought it up like on Twitter and I was like, wait, you can run into other people in the game? Like, I didn't even know that was a thing. Um, I, I don't know. So for me, I just feel like, even though I think the music is incredible, I think the art style is gorgeous. Um, I just think that because of that being kind of a, Journey feels very much to me like a, at the time, this was phenomenal but like if you replayed it now i don't know if it would fully be the same experience does that make sense can i make an argument for journey without other players so the first time i played journey i also did not encounter other players and for me it was more impactful for me to play alone than when i encountered other players when i played it again on pc and it kind of got a small resurgence of new players i think that the solitary journey makes it a little bit more intimate and it makes it more i don't want to say sad but you feel that kind of loneliness as you are alone and the world is kind of dead around you and i think that that still works at least for me i definitely felt it especially with the music i think the music is one of the things that really hammers at home because there's no dialogue but you still get the sense you know even without other players even when you're playing alone of what the game is about and the replayability of it i mean yeah, I think with players, without players, I think that there's a lot of great elements to Journey that I would I would go to bat for it solo or with other players. Mm -hmm. I also love its like use of color, and you know how like the, the entire you know the majority of the game isn't steeped in like these warm like reds and oranges, and then you make that final ascent, and like there's just that such a dramatic shift visually that like sparks something. Uh, yeah. I don't know. No, yeah, for sure. I I just I just think that um like I completely agree. Like I definitely finished the game. I was like that was a good game. That was a very good game. Um I just didn't like when people were, like when IGN gave a game of the year, I was like I do not I did not understand that. I was just like uh okay. Uh uh and I still don't. But um 
I just think that when I'm talking, when I'm thinking top 10, I, it just doesn't come to mind. I, I expected someone to bring it up, but I just, for me personally, so we can well, leave it's funny we can leave I, nev for now. I never hear anyone talking about Journey anymore, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but I, I feel like we, I mean, we talk about indies quite a bit. Maybe it's just because uh, it's it's been a long time, but I don't know. I never, in my circle of friends, I never hear people talking about that game. Yeah, I, I, I've, I, ne I have never played Journey, so I have to no. hold my head in shame and, and step away from this this unfortunate conversation. I do but, like that Cam is a, is like, completely owning and assuming the role of villain on this podcast. Oh, I've got <laughs> so, one coming up. <laughs> I'm used to it. I'm used to it. I have one too, right? <laughs> uh, how much time do we have left, uh, Brennan? Uh, we, we are about about 18 minutes. 18 minutes. Oh, oh, my gosh. Dang. Okay. oh my gosh. Can we, all yeah. hold, can we all hold hands? Uh, can at least four of us hold hands on Limbo? Top I think if we were going between Limbo and Inside, I would have to lean toward Inside. Me too. No. I agree with yeah. that. Yeah. 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 I love Limbo. No. They're both really good games, but I think Limbo. what Inside does is take what Limbo has set up for the studio and they have markedly improved on like gameplay aspects, on foreshadowing, on the I nuance, on, on the story. They did what they did in Limbo and then some in Inside. So I think I'd have to go with Inside for that. I Okay, okay. Here are my arguments against Inside. I love Inside. I love 18 Inside. minutes. 18 yeah, minutes. Really quick, just really quick. Just really quick. Hear me out. Like, so so people say that, like, Braid is the game that brought back indies, right? Limbo was the game that set, like, concrete. Like, and indies are back. They're important. This is what games can be at a small level. And, like, at, like I remember when Limbo came out, everyone was playing it. It came to, like, all the systems. It was on phones. It was on tablets. It was everywhere. And I would see people come out and play it. Like, people that I didn't even know, like, people that didn't even game that I saw playing Limbo. And, uh, you know, and then with Inside, my issues with Inside, I think, I don't think it's, uh, I, they're, like, I, didn't, I wasn't a big fan of the water sections. I thought that those were meh. And I did not like the ending. Uh, even though oh. it was like, oh, up to speculation oh, and stuff yeah, like that. It. it was just, it, like, I don't know, just com and I'm, compar I'm comparing the two because they're both play dead. Like, I felt an impact with Limbo's ending while Inside was just kind of like, it just kind of fell flat for me. So, for me, for the endings, like, I agree, Limbo's ending's incredible. It for is, me, yeah. Inside is, for games that rely so heavily on animation and the character's body language to tell the story, the ending of Inside takes that, that concept, for me at least, to the nth degree and it is so absurd and so unlike anything else you see in the rest of the game it just like strikes you and just like i don't know it just it, it left a lasting impression on me so, so I, I love them both too, but inside is would be my, my heart <laughs> <laughs> oh my god okay um Okay, I mean, at the very least, put inside on the list. I mean, I, it's in my top oh, personal top oh, ten of the game. Oh, it's so there. It's on the list. <laughs> I am so hurt right oh. now. Okay. Anyway, uh, I wasn't expecting that to be honest with you. Yeah, that, that hurt my soul. Um, Does anyone want to propose a hand holding on anything? Uh, um, Cuphead. Could Cuphead? Yeah, that's a good one. I, I would. Yeah, I would obviously yes. go to bat here for Cuphead. I have one that I. Uh, someone's gonna hate me, but I mean, Cuphead just snuck uh, in with no, no issues. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Put that on the list. Yeah. I can put that on the list. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Cuphead's on the list. Uh, I would. I'll oh, go ahead, Todd. You were. Yeah, I was just gonna say, um, don't kill me. Uh, Firewatch. Uh, for that, for me, that game. Just... <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it agree. wasn't the story. It was. I just felt like. Um, for me, when I played it, it was kind of it. It, the perform, it didn't perform as well. Like the game itself was very like. Uh, okay. I had issues with that, but that's not like what bothered me the most. I think like the story was really good. It started off really great, and I get it's all about like normal characters, but the ending. I don't think the ending did anything for me. And You're wanting something bigger. Not necessarily. They, they bigger. kind of Maybe they kind my, of like build it up like it's gonna be you know this yeah, huge no. conspiracy. But I get yeah. what they're doing. I get that it's not yeah. about it's 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 more realistic that it's not something mm -hmm. bigger, you know. And I and it's yeah. more about like these characters and everything. But and I was really into them at first, but I got to a halfway point and I'm just like roaming through the woods and I'm just like, where am I going right now? And I'm no one's I'm not talking on the I don't know. It just kind of lost me halfway through, but um I, I finished it, but um yeah I, I was expecting maybe a bigger payoff at the end but i don't think it's necessary but that that's like sure. one that and i can i, I can Brent. totally respect that like um i think one of the reasons like i like that game so much is henry uh and his wife are like 
uh, from a place called Boulder, Colorado, which is where I live. So I have that extra oh, emotional yeah, touch absolutely. point. I'm like, yep. they talk about like Pearl Street in the intro or whatever. I'm like, oh, yeah. I, 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 I've been there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so you, it, it gets bonus points for that. And you, you feel like more, uh, a little more, I think it's an added touch point. You know what I mean? That no, kind absolutely. Of, uh, and I did, I did, and to speak of the, to the ending, I won't like go too deep into spoilers, but I enjoyed the humanness of it. And uh, I know there's like a couple different choices, but um, they all kind of boil down to the same thing. Um, and yeah, I just like that. It wasn't, it was, um, things didn't pan out like I wanted them to. And sometimes that's how, how life works. Um, and, you know, people, people part ways, uh, even when, you know, it's sad. And that kind of was just like a poignant ending for me. Um, but I, I, I'm looking at the, the rest of this list. I'm happy to say, you know, Firewatch made it into the top 18, top 15. Well, are we, are we, did we, sw I know Todd and Cam were against Firewatch. Is there a third? Uh, I'm against Firewatch. Against Firewatch making the top 10? Yeah. Jenny yeah. Morgan? I'll be I against any. it. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. I love Firewatch, but I'm going to say, let's, let's not get it. out. <laughs> and just to speed through to you, okay. Even though you guys are saying like, oh, inside over limbo, that's fine. Who <laughs> can have both games on there? Who said this? I don't Who's... disagree. I, I mean, I don't disagree with that. We They're can revisit it. Listen, we can <laughs> we can revisit it at the end when we figure out if Celeste is going to make the list or not. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, yeah, I so would like to propose a hand holding on something. Okay, and that would be Florence because I agree. of mm -hmm. all of these games that are here, Florence is probably the one that has given me the biggest emotional uh, experience. Where I played Florence. I downloaded it on a whim. I heard it was good. It was on mobile. I never play games on my phone usually. And I downloaded it in bed one night and I was... Went to bed insult. crying. Yes, I went to bed. <laughs> like I, I laid awake in bed and I just like stared at the ceiling and I was like... Mm -hmm. Hello, darkness, my old... It's so hard. It's just... It's, yeah. it, it, is, it is a fantastic representation of a relationship. Like it is... Yeah. It, it might be the best representation of relationship I've ever played in a video game. Like mm -hmm. it is so well done. And to echo some of the things that Jenny said earlier, it's just like the things that the game makes you do, like the gameplay isn't necessarily like this crazy, you know, groundbreaking gameplay, but the stuff that it makes you do and how it changes as the course of the story goes along is very, very interesting and really not done in other games that I've seen. Um, mm -hmm. So I would say Florence should be on here. I don't know. I agree. Anyone, I agree. I guess I've never, I've never played it. So, oh, you got I three, agree. so you're good. No, we need four. You need four. Oh, four. Put it on the list. Put it all on, right. Yeah, put it all on. right. Yeah. I love it. Uh, so, so we have six on the list now, right? We are. We are currently at. I, we're at seven because Celeste is on the list. What? Did we get a four? We Did put it there four? for now. We put it there for now. We said oh, we'd revisit it at the end. Okay, yes. Okay, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Sure it stays. Uh. Okay. Uh. Can we hold hands on Hotline Miami? I, I'm back in Hotline Miami. I haven't it's played close. it, so I, I can't mean, vote. I, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, that game for me, too, and I'll, I mean, that's the game I picked, but that game, I think, was a huge, huge kick in the ass for indies as well. That was one yeah, of the yeah, earlier was, games. That, sure. that was like, and I don't think that should be the reason why it gets picked, but um, it, yeah, that game's just so freaking cool. I just, and you I, go back and play it, and it's so fun. And I just feel like... Um, Hall in Miami is definitely like one of those games where it's like, you know, I feel like with indies nowadays, especially people are more attuned to like indies that have like a really good story or something like that, like story related video games just in general. But Hall in Miami, I just feel like in general is one of the titles where, where people just like when it comes to indies, like you have to play Hotline Miami. You just, you have to. And I just feel like with some of these other games, uh, that are on the list that we even some that we haven't bro uh, brought up yet. Uh, that's not the case. Uh, just through my own experience. Um, Hot Hotline gets a fringe vote for me. It, I can see it sneaking onto the bottom of the list. I do love Hotline Miami, but I'm not. Um, I'm not necessarily a hundred percent sold on it as a top ten. But I do love that game. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so the things we have left that we haven't uh, debated on are the Binding of Isaac. Spelunky, uh, Don't Starve, Chivalry, Life is Strange. Uh, and that, I, actually, I think that's everything. Those are the games we have not we deliberated Stanley on. Parable. We have not oh, Stanley Parable as well. I apologize. Yes. Uh, how much time do we have left? 
we a lot. have a vote <laughs> nine minutes. Oh my god. Okay. So uh, I'm going to say two things really quick. Uh, again, I'm not trying to attack anyone or their opinions. Uh, I've never I've I've heard of Darn Starve. I just haven't played it. And Chivalry, oh. I I have not played either. So I really just can't say much about those two games. Uh, I haven't so, played Chivalry either, but I'd love to. Um, it was awesome. Uh, this is what I'll say, this is what I'll say about <laughs> Chivalry. <laughs> Or go ahead, Morgan. Well, I'm Morgan. I was going to say that of the three that I picked, I would be fine with leaving Don't Starve and Chivalry off, but I would not be fine with leaving Life is Strange off just because of the narrative choices mm -hmm. and the legacy for Don't Nod and how they've continued to build on that, but that's just me. Okay. As someone who has not played Chivalry, I do want to say, hearing you talk about how, you know, without the game pushing players to be this way, that it has this online community that is very helpful and guides people. I feel like not only is that something that's rare in games in general, but it's even rarer if not something I've never even heard of in an online indie game. So I think that in itself speaks to not only the community, but clearly the game is such a good enough game that there are people that care that much about the game. So I, I would, again, as someone who has never played Chivalry, that tidbit to me, I think speaks volumes about the game itself and it's obviously its community. I played and, and love chivalry. I mean, the game has a dedicated yell button. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's hilarious. <laughs> it's a really good um, game. <laughs> I, it probably wouldn't be top 10 for me. Although, man, I need, I need to play chivalry after we're done with this podcast. Cause yeah, <laughs> that game is so good. Um, it's probably not top 10 for me though. Okay. I'd be um, okay with that. That's fine. Like, okay. Okay. So is Life is Strange making this list? Because Morgan is about to yeah. is about to shank some people if it doesn't. So let's talk <laughs> okay. about Life is Strange. So, oh yeah. So I'll I'll talk about Life is Strange. I'm gonna play the bad guy again. I I play I played both. I played Life is Strange. I love Life is Strange. I really do. I have issues with it. Um, but I I think it has so many incredible moments. But um, but, uh, just thinking from top ten indie games perspective. I just don't think it makes the list. Uh, I think some of the dialogue is really corny. I think that the characters are well written, but just the actual dialogue does like sometimes it's just really cringy. Um, I saw my I had my fiance play through it uh, the first time like a few weeks like a, like a few months ago, and uh, it, I, I don't I don't know. But again, I think I think there's so many incredible incredible moments in that game, both narratively and just like hitting reality in the face. Um, and I think it does that very, very well, but I just think as a game, I don't know. That's, I, again, I don't. Does anyone don't, else want to step in here? I feel terrible. For Life is Strange? I haven't played it. Oh, you should. It's great. I, well, I, I had it spoiled. <laughs> I had it spoiled. It's great. That's it's great. It's just not top 10. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> But it's a game. I think I might have to agree with Cam on this one, which I am so sorry. It feels so bad. <laughs> I feel I really enjoy Life is Strange, but I think looking at some of the other titles on the list, contextually, I don't think it would make top 10 just among this group of games <laughs> for me. That's terrible. You guys are horrible so, people. I know. Yeah. I feel so bad. <laughs> <laughs> this went from hand holding to backstabbing. Yeah, I'm so right. sorry. Oh. So. Oh Looking at the clock and looking at the fact that we have two, potentially three spots to fill, what is going to round out a 10? Did, it, did anyone play Spelunky? Did we even bring it up? <laughs> I've heard great <laughs> things about Spelunky uh, enough to be like, I would be okay with it being on the top 10. Because again, I've just heard from word of mouth alone enough good things about it um, that I would be down to backing it uh, for, for top 10. Um, but, uh, you know... I, I think I would put Spelunky over different. Binding of Isaac, I think. Same. I wouldn't do that, but... <laughs> <laughs> I would put Spelunky that, over Binding of Isaac. Uh, for me. Just give, just give me, if, you give me, if you guys give me Limbo, I'll just be like, y'all, finish the rest of the list and have a good, I'm good. Like, but what do we have on the list right now, Brendan? So, so the, the current right. list is in no specific order. Uh, Undertale, Castle Crashers, Shovel Knight, Celeste, Inside, Cuphead, Florence, Hotline Miami. That leaves two spots. I know Celeste was a was a potential fringe knockoff, but I think just based on what we've discussed already, I think Celeste is probably going to stay. Um, so that leaves us with two spots to figure out in a few minutes. And we're talking Spelunky, Binding of Isaac, based on like response. Don't mm -hmm. starve. Um, limbo, maybe not. Stanley Limbo's Parable. Yeah. 
Journey and the Messenger. But I think Ooh. we cut off the Messenger. <laughs> yes, and I will, Journey, I will, I will Journey, allow that. Like, yeah, Journey, I, I like, again, I'm just going off my experience, like, but I'm sure, like, you know, I just can't, I can't speak for anyone else on that, uh, just because my experience was different. Um, but I still think out of this list that we w went over that Limbo is the strongest contender that isn't a lock yet. I'm just I would saying. be remiss if I didn't go to bat for Stanley Parable one more time, uh, just because I was the one that brought it up. I think one thing that really is going for Stanley Parable among this list and as a top 10 all-time indie great is that um, I don't think any other, like this game could not have happened in any other space than an indie space. And I think uh, the fact that it really forces the player to think about what it even means to play a game uh, is is just, again, it's something that doesn't happen outside of indies, and the game design for that is so masterful. So I just wanted to, like, put that out there again. Um, I think I would go to bat for Stanley Parable. I mean, it it directly inspired Gone Home, Firewatch, mm -hmm. Everybody's Gone to the Rapture, like, countless games that kind of, like, help revitalize the walking, like, the narrative-based, you know, walking sim, you know, as we know it today. Um, I feel like Stanley Parable's, like, what, 2011? Was, like, mm -hmm. that first Somewhere one. Somewhere around that, there. Like, that we're going to... Just... Kickstarted that. If we're and going that, if we're going that <laughs> I know route, what you're if, gonna say, Cam. <laughs> if we're going that route, no games, no indie games would be here without Limbo. None. That Zero. That's not true. That's Get not true. <laughs> That's not true. I'm over exaggerating. <laughs> but like, you know what I mean? Like, it concreted. Like, in it did. That's what it. That's Limbo. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm no, putting I'm, the motion I'm Stanley Parable. Because I want I'm on heard board with that. some I've walking heard, stem representation. I've heard good enough I've things about it. Stanley Parable so bad, that, like, I'm I'm cool with it. Um, same, same. I actually, like, looked up, like, some top indie lists just to see if I forget, forget anything. And on, like, I think the main list that I looked at, uh, Stanley Parable was number one. It yeah, it was, was, it was on the top of a lot of lists I looked at. So, yeah, so we are yeah. at the two-minute mark, so we oh, need gosh. this 10th game. Okay, all right. Limbo. I'm, say, limbo. I'm saying Spelunky. Limbo. That's my... I'm saying Limbo. I'm saying Limbo. Spelunky. I'm saying limbo. Jenny, what are you saying? Oh, gosh, wait, what are we even saying in between? Is it uh, between Spelunky and... Whatever you want to and... say for the final one, and whatever has yeah. the most votes, I mean, we're going to lock journey. in. I mean, I want Journey, but that's, <laughs> that's me being... <laughs> it's personal. It's just like such a... I think it's such a masterful game, so... I think I still I still think it's great. I just think Limbo's better. <laughs> That's very okay. I, of of those, I would vote for Journey. So Journey has two. Limbo has uh, one. Spelunky has one. I I think it should be Spelunky or Journey. I'd be willing to do Journey. Todd. See, I do Spelunky or Limbo. So that makes me the <laughs> tying vote. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, this is oh. this is rough. I'm gonna How, I'm gonna say Life on. is Strange. <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> no so no you haven't even played it you said you haven't played it Fair uh, no, no, so after so uh, oh, so between the three games spelunky journey and limbo which two would you whittle it down to and then we'll vote you have to I cut, mean, one, have, of have have cut 40, one of them off we have 40 seconds so I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna throw my vote to spelunky so that puts spelunky on the top 10 is that, that that's go. not four that's that's uh, it was you, Alex, Alex and me, Todd. and Todd. But Journey That's has three. two. I'm okay, okay with that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I could live uh, with that. <laughs> fine, put Spelunky on the list then. Yeah, okay. So sure. the top Yay. 10 ends up being, in no specific order, Undertale, Castle Crasher, Shovel Knight, Celeste, Inside, Cuphead, Florence, Hotline Miami, Stanley Parable, and Spelunky. And that is the top 10 best indie games of all time. I like <laughs> wanted to try to leave time for everyone to quickly like plug themselves. Yeah. Um, fine. let's just run it around the same order we did the so go Alex, Cam, Jenny, Morgan, Todd, me. Uh, I'm Alex Van Aken. Uh, I do a lot of cool things over at okbeast.com uh, and youtube.com slash okbeast and check out the okbeast okay podcast. Those are all of my plugs. I'm Cameron Hawkins. I write for DualShockers.com. I've been featured on IGN, Kind of Funny Games Daily, and Inside Gaming. And uh, yeah, and I uh, stream on Twitch.tv slash The Cinephile Guy. Hi, I'm Jenny Windham. I'm the communications manager for Rose City Games. You can find us at Rose City Games. Um, and I also stream indie games at Twitch.tv slash Kimchika. 
Uh, hi, I'm Morgan Shaver. Uh, I do a little bit of everything. I'm the editor-in-chief of Inning Obscura. I work at Greenland Content, writing for sites like All Gamers and Prima. Um, and then I do the social media for Tetris. And I'm Brennan Groom. I'm the host and editor at Pass the Controller. And you can find all of our stuff at PassTheController.io on Twitter and on Instagram at PassController. In the spirit of reconciliation, PAX acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present, as it is their knowledge and experience that holds the key to the success of future generations. We extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. you already cape cuckoo isn't safe here. henry moss and the wormhole conspiracy is a coming-of-age adventure set in a goofy galaxy of oddball characters ridiculous conundrums and cosmic evil <laughs> wander ponder and laugh your way through a heartfelt exploration of independence family and growing up teen earthling henry moss helps his mother Saren operate moss family supplies an interstellar delivery business servicing the outer worlds. Henry longs to break free of his domestic duties to seek his fortune and fame amongst the far stars. Together, the Mosses uncover a cosmic conspiracy overseen by the sinister Benedict Wormhole. This sets the Mosses on an interplanetary journey of compassion, exploration and self-discovery, together fulfilling a secret legacy founded a generation ago. Really tried to capture that classic point and click adventure experience that so many people love, but bring to it a modern twist. Multiple solutions to problems, a dynamic soundtrack, unique